Kato. Fakatakate ho kite uru. Fakatakate ho kite tonga. Kia ma kina kina ki uta. Ki ma tara tara ki tai. Ihi akiana ti atakura. He tiu. He huka. He ho hu. Ti hei mauri ora. Morena everyone. And thank you for coming to the Planning, Environment and Parks Committee. We have quite a full agenda, so we will try and get through it as quickly as possible, because I know there is quite a number of people who have um, things they need to attend to this afternoon on council business, so we will need to get that sorted um, and not tie people up. So, thank you. We'll go first to the uh, apologies. Oh, we go to the acknowledgement first, apologies. Right. I just want uh, to acknowledge the sudden passing of Auckland Art Gallery Senior Curator Ron Brownson. Um, we want to acknowledge and thank him for his 45 years of service to the Auckland Art Gallery Toy or Tamaki, his service to research, curation and the arts in Tamaki Makoto, Auckland and across Al Aotearoa, New Zealand. The committee also acknowledges Ron's contribution and activism for the rainbow community, including being part of the original gay liberation movement in Aotearoa and more recently in the Auckland Pride Festival. Our thoughts go to the Auckland Art Gallery staff and his friends in Fano and everyone who knew him. He did a significant amount of work um, for our, our city and we just want to thank him and also acknowledge his sad and sudden passing a couple of days ago. I think Councillor Ferry wanted to second that. Um, anyway. Cool. D um, Deputy Mayor, did you want to say something? No, I just... Yeah, I'll just your... Sorry. I just want to share your sentiments and thank you uh, to you and Councillor Ferry. Um, great loss to Auckland, to the arts community, and I know our thoughts are all with his colleagues and family at this very sad time. Thank you. And he was recognised last night. And he was recognised last night. When the mayor, the mayor was at the art gallery last night. Thank you. Kia ora, thank you all. Any other acknowledgements? Do we have to move in second? Um, Vote through. Thank you. Right, on to the absence. There are no apologies for absence. There is apologies for lateness. We've got Councillor Newman, Councillor Sayers, who are on council business doing interviews for Tataki Auckland Unlimited. Council, oh, no. And everyone else is here. And for early departure, we have Mayor um, Brown and Deputy Mayor Simpson, um, who are leaving on council business and potentially a little bit later on, Councillor Henderson and Councillor Turner um, as well. But and Councillor Foley. Oh, and Councillor Foley, right. Cool, so that... On council business, but that is a little bit later. So we will hope that no one else leaves, because that will be a bit tricky. So right, uh, all those, could I have a mover for that? Deputy Mayor, seconder. Councillor Leone. All those in favour? Any opposed? Thank you. We have to move two um, councillors, accept their electronic attendance. We have Councillor Philippina and Councillor Fletcher. Could I have a mover? Councillor Walker. Councillor Henderson, second. First uh, hand I saw, sorry. All those in favour? Any opposed? And welcome to those two councillors online. Right. Are there any declarations? Uh, move of the minutes, Deputy Chair Dalton, would you like to move those? And a seconder, Deputy Mayor. All those in favour? Any opposed? No. Thank you. Right, so the next um, item, and sorry we were tied up around the back so I didn't get to come say hello uh, before the meeting, but we have a, a petition on the 29 concerned Auckland communities to have Plan Change 78 withdrawn. Now I just want to be quite clear on the details here. This is under currently under a quasi-judicial process. Um, we cannot have a public forum on this or a deputation, but we can have understanding orders, a petition. What that does mean is the petitioners can have their five minutes of speaking time, but understanding orders, and because it's currently under process, 
we cannot have questions or debate on this item, but we can accept the petition and we can have their presentation. So just want to make sure everyone understands that. Cool. Uh, just, um, we can't have anyone else to speak to that, but do you mean, do you mean added to the petition? Okay, cool. So you just might want to talk to the petitioners themselves and they'll ensure that your name is on there. Cool. Thank you very much. So we'll have Tony and Greg um, come to the table. Welcome to you both. And so you're um, well aware of the process here, so you'll get uh, five minutes to talk about your petition and speak to the committee. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. And thank you, Councillor Hill, for giving us this opportunity to present this petition to you. I'm Tony Skelton, and on my right is Greg uh, McEwen. We are both long-standing residents of Auckland, and our role today is simply to be the messengers. The people we are representing are really concerned about the state of this city's infrastructure and its lack of ability to cope with current and future demands. So the purpose of our attendance is to present a petition signed by 29 community groups requesting Council to withdraw Plan Chain 78. However, in saying that, we are mindful that actually withdrawing Plan Chain 78 may not be possible without legislative change. However, putting it on hold is doable by this Council. Recent weather events have demonstrated the inadequate capacity and condition of Auckland's wastewater and stormwater infrastructure for today's housing, let alone for the type of intensification being promoted by Plan Change 78. The Section 32 reports in several key aspects are seriously deficient. For example, if other matters are not considered qualifying matters in the Section 32 report, they cannot be addressed any further. This means that it, it creates a serious and undue prejudice against submitters. Developing urban transport, wastewater, stormwater and other infrastructure should be an evidence-based optimisation exercise, which takes into account characteristics which are unique to a city, the outcome sought and the funding available. The government's one-size-fits-all legislation has taken away Auckland Council's ability to enforce its needs and is particularly problematic when it comes to infrastructure. The unitary plan agreed to by Auckland in 2016 took a more focused approach to intensification, making it easier and more cost-effective to use existing infrastructure and develop new infrastructure as required. We need a transport, roading and water infrastructure audit to determine options which are fundable and practicable. Given recent events, it would be, in our opinion, to be incongruous and irresponsible for Council to proceed with a major plan change before the above audit is completed. The attached petition signed by 29 community organisations and one more to be added, that makes 30, representing thousands, and I say thousands, of ratepayers request that Council withdraws Plan Chain 78 or at the very least puts it on hold for the reasons stated above with some urgency. Today would be a good day to do that. Thank you. So we now have the petition we'd like to hand over to you. Thank 
Right, and the Mayor and Deputy Mayor would like to move um, receipt of the petition. So Mayor Brown and Deputy Mayor Simpson. All those in favour? Aye. Are there any opposed? Cool. Thank you very much. And that will be um, forwarded to the Chief of Strategy for consideration, and we'll get back to you on how... Um, the response and what, what time that's responded to you. But thank you very much um, for um, working with the community in such a short time frame as well. So thanks very much. Right, we next have public input. So we have the Auckland Yacht and Boating Association, regional assets for boat maintenance. And I lost what was up there. Um, now, apologies to, I didn't get the, so we've got the names, Andrew Barney and Richard Steele. And Blair Park. Oh, and Blair Park, sorry. Yeah, thank you, Richard. Thank you. And um, just... This is Andrew Barney and Richard Steele is on Yeah, I just see him there. Thank you very much, and apologies for the, the delay. I know you were planning to come, uh, the committee, straight after the... Uh, the floods, and so thank you for um, being delayed and sorry about that, but I'm sure you understand why. Absolutely, um, yeah. So we've got a five minute speaking turn, and then you'll have um, questions. We'll try and incorporate um, all that in there, but if you just want to go ahead with your presentation, and then we'll have questions. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. So Andrew has a presentation for you. Kia ora koutou everybody, my name's Andrew Barney, I represent the Auckland Yachting and Boating Association. Um, we have a uh, five minute presentation here. Um, our concern is a little like the last speaker's has to do with infrastructure. Um, what we want to do is to outline two problems that are facing council, look at some evidential issues and ask where do we go to from here. Um, basically, we think we've got a significant problem that has an environmental consequence. Those of you who can remember The Perfect Storm, a great movie, will know that when you have two complicated low pressure systems that collide, you get real problems. We've got two complicated systems, both of which are too complicated to discuss in depth in five minutes, but we think they're colliding, and the consequence will be for the health of the Hauraki Gulf. Um, essentially, what we've got under the surface quietly is a rapid increase in the number and uh, distribution of marine invasive species, uh, as that graph shows. There are now 11 identified highly invasive species in the Auckland Gulf. Uh, they're spreading rapidly, and this is a relatively new escalation in the threat. Uh, the primary pathways that have been identified are the hulls of boats. Essentially what happens is invasive species come into the main ports, Auckland, Tauranga, etc., on large uh, ships. Uh, then small recreational boats uh, happily distribute those invasive species out throughout the, the Gulf, right? So the main vector are small recreational boats that pick up these invasive species off ships. Uh, one case study uh, from Tauranga Harbour uh, shows invasive sea squirt. Um, both of these boats that were found with sea squirt came from Auckland and neither had prior cleaning on their hulls. Um, now, Auckland Council has responded well at one level to this response. Uh, basically, under the uh, Local Government Auckland Council Act, you have responsibilities through uh, that Act at the governing body level to make decisions under any enactments or where you have regulatory responsibilities, and you clearly do. Uh, the Biosecurity Act, the Resource Management Act, and the Auckland Unitary Plan Coastal Environment Intentions, for example, all require that the governing body address issues of invasive pest species, including marine species. Now, your response to date, in some senses, has been appropriate, right? Uh, January 2021, we've got the Regional Pest Management Plan to include marine sections. We've got the Top of the North Marine Biosecurity Partnership with three other councils. We've got the Clean Below, Good to Go policies uh, that basically uh, compel boaties to clean their boats, and if they don't, they can be up for a $100,000 fine if they don't. We've got a report from 2022 on the 
capacity and accessibility of haul-out spaces where people can clean an anti-foul boats. So far, so good. What did that report find, however? The report is really concerning for us because what it shows are two things. Firstly, Auckland Region has the most boats. If you look at the top uh, row, you can see that Auckland has around about 8,800 boats that need regular cleaning. Now, compared to any other region, that is by far the most boats. But by comparison, we have by far the least amount of cleaning facilities. Only 33% of our boats can be cleaned annually, which means to clean our entire fleet of roughly 9,000 boats would take three years with current capacity. Now, the difficulty with cleaning an anti-fouling every three years is that the recommended cleaning cycle from your own environmental services staff is probably six months. So we're going to end up with a large number of boats that are pretty much ready to carry invasive species around because they simply can't clean themselves in the Auckland region with our current capacity. So uh, effectively, we're also making the situation worse because by closing down Pier 21, which we've done, and then now by closing down the landing, according to that Ecometrics report commissioned by Council, I add, um, we've lost 36% of our anti-fouling capacity in the Auckland region in one year, right? So we are going backwards here. Um, now, so far, so good. The difficulty I see, though, is that it's not enough to pass regulations. It's not enough to threaten bodies that we're going to find the living daylights out of you if you don't clean your boat. If you do that on one hand, that's fine. But if, on the other hand, you're taking away our capacity to clean our boats, we've got a real problem. So in the last year alone, we've lost capacity in six areas. Um, Pier 21 has shut down. Little Shoal Bay has shut down. Bayswater is now under threat. AYBA is currently contesting that decision in the Environment Court. Uh, Milford has had its area reduced. The landing has now just been shut. This is in one year. So in one year, we've seen an escalation in the number of, uh, escalation in the number of uh, invasive species, and we've seen a decrease in the number of hard stands available. And we're still opening up marinas without hard stands. So we're increasing the number of boats in Auckland and decreasing our ability to clean them. Uh, now, effectively what we want you to do here is recognise there's a second complicated problem, and that is the allocation of regional amenities to local boards to make decisions. We don't have time to get into this, but we've seen repeated examples where this allocation of regional amenities to local boards has not worked well as a government structure, and that's the second problem. So what do we want you to do? Basically, what we want here is for you to accept that there is an issue that has to be addressed. If you don't, I think there's going to be a consequence in several different regards. What we want is for the, for the region to accept they have an emergent biosecurity problem, and basically what we want is for you to recommend that we look at an investigation of hard stand capacity in Auckland now. Uh, following on from that, I understand it's possible to recommend that you remove the delegation from the Iraqi local board for decisions relating to the hard stands temporarily while we investigate this issue and make an evidence-based decision. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that very quick and fulsome, um, <laughs> fulsome presentation on the complex issue. Um, yeah. I think you've given the really clear points on that. Um, with, um, I think, oh, sorry, Councillor Watson. Councillor Watson has a question, and then Councillor Walker. Yeah, thank, thanks, Mr Chair. Um, just uh, th thank you for the, the presentation. So, so we have a situation where we, we've got an increase in the number of invasive species uh, at the same time as we're, we're closing down this limited supply of hard stands that, that anti-foul the boats that are spreading them around, and some quite significant um, closure. So by my calculations, Pier 21 and the landing takes out over a third of the capacity, the hard stand capacity. Um, I guess the obvious question is, in your view, is the Auckland Council adopting a, a, a regional view, i.e. are they looking at the consequences of this across the region, or are these closures, ad hoc closures, actually being enabled by the lack of a, a cohesive approach to this really concerning issue? So regional versus local, what is that going to mean on the ground um, going forward over the next uh, three to five years? Would you like to
Okay, I think there's actually a risk that we're going to see a balkanization of responses to this threat where different wards take different approaches. For example, Iraqi local board, and that Iraqi ward has two marinas in it, but has now shut down its hard stands. Essentially, all of the boats in those two marinas are going to have to freeload off the facilities available in other wards. Now, other wards might not think that's what they want, and if they don't want people freeloading off their facilities, then they're likely to make it difficult for those boats to get in there to clean. We don't have enough resources as it is now, and if the wards respond individually, then we're going to see a fragmented response to a really complicated problem. There's evidence that this is already happening. When we look to the regions up north, you cannot get into a marina in the far north region unless you can provide evidence that you've anti-fouled in the last six months or cleaned in the last month. And if you can't provide evidence of that, they won't let you in. Now, that model is likely to spread to other marinas, including in our region. So I think the challenge for Council is, do we want to try and address this regional threat at a regional level, or are we going to let these decisions around our capacity to clean our boats be made at the local level? And if we do that, I think we're going to see a very, very disjointed response to the problem. And, Council, there's one other thing. That hard stand is your asset. You own it. Richard, have you got anything you'd like to add to that? Um, yes, I'd just like to make one comment. I think the other aspect of maintaining clean hulls and the, the guidance that's provided by Council and MPI is the proximity of those facilities to where boats are moored is of critical importance. Effectively, the movement of boats transmits marine pests. So there is a requirement that imposed by Council that if your boat is fouled with a marine pest, it should not be moved. It should actually be cleaned where it is. It should be taken out of the water where it is actually moored and then cleaned. That cannot occur if you've actually got a situation which we've now got in central Auckland where you've got the majority of boats at West Haven, Bayswater, OBC, Iraqi Marina and the only remaining facilities for hull cleaning are the, um, the floating dock and Orams. After that you have to go to West Harbour or Half Moon Bay. So there's, there's the two aspects to this. There's both the capacity, which is an issue, but also proximity to where boats are moored. And that's why I think in answer to Councillor Watson's comment, this is a regional issue and it needs regional perspective in all of the decisions that are made. Thank you for that. Now, we have quite a number of questions and we are supposed to try and keep um, this all contained to half an hour and we still have uh, another presentation and local board presentation. So um, if we could make sure the questions have not um, already been answered through the presentation and through previous answers. So right, we have Councillor Walker. I've got um, two related questions. Uh, the, the, the first question goes to the anti-fouling substances. My understanding is that many of these substances are highly toxic both to marine life but also human life, that while there are restrictions and requirements in New Zealand, boats are coming in from overseas that frankly have substances that are extremely bad. So my question is around the imperative of having facilities not only to deal with the pest, but to deal with these highly hazardous substances, because my understanding is you've got to have appropriate facilities. So I'd invite your comment around that. And that might be Richard Steele or yourself, um, ambivalent as to who answers it. All right, I think I'll very quickly point out, and Richard can add to this. Um, the facility at the landing that was shut on February 28th had $3 million of ratepayers' money invested in it in 2007 to bring it up to a standard which is known as the blue flag standard, which means that it's the highest environmentally rated hard stand in the southern hemisphere. We're going to turn that into a car park. That's the intention. Richard, any thoughts? Um, the only other comment I'd make really is that um, 
Yeah, Councillor Walker has really touched on the issue of containment, which is critical for both the application of anti-fouling and also the containment of the waste, that's the, the pests and the marine growth that's uh, scraped off boats. A lot of work in the Auckland region historically has taken place at small scale club facilities. Typically, you'll see them as careening poles or small grids. They do not have the necessary containment facilities. We are entirely reliant on modern equipment of the type that Andrew's just outlined that exists at the landing. So you're going to see more of the smaller club facilities closed simply because they will not be able to meet the containment standards required by Council. We understand that, but there has to be an alternative available to enable boaties to comply. The, the other question I've got which is um, somewhat related, is the responsibility of council. And Richard, you might be able to clarify this. My understanding is that the council has a landowner interest in most of the marinas around Auckland where the provision of hard stand facilities might be required, that we also have a regulatory role, and many of these areas are covered by uh, empowering acts that require boat harbour purposes, and you might... Uh, acknowledge that boat harbour purposes include hard stand facilities that offer this facility. So I'd invite your comment around Council's responsibility as a landowner and a regulator of a number of acts. Thank you. Christian? Yeah, um, thank you for the, uh, the question, Councillor Watson. You're quite correct that there are a number of marinas in the region um, where there are substantial council land holdings, um, Hobsonville, Gulf Harbour, uh, to uh, case in points. They do provide the opportunity to both maintain and develop facilities. Um, but we also again have conflicting provisions in the Auckland Unitary Plan. Um, and two examples that come to mind are both Pine Harbour Marina and Hobsonville. Um, at Pine Harbour, the land is in private ownership. Um, it already has planning approval or uh, planning provisions that enable residential and commercial development over the land that's occupied by the hard stand and haul out facility there. Um, at Hobsonville Council owns the land and it is leased to the marina operator. But again, the Auckland Unitary Plan provides for residential and commercial development over the area of the land that's occupied by the haul out and hard stand facilities. Could you, could you repeat so, that last statement? Yes, I can repeat that. So at Hobsonville Marina, you have Auckland, planning, Auckland plan provisions for the marina precinct, which enable residential and commercial development over the land that's occupied by the haul out and hard stand facilities. So there is no security for that facility. If you look at Hobsonville and Pine Harbour together, we understand that they account for 25% of the capacity that remains in Auckland after closure of Pier 21 and the landing. Thank you for that. The next question we've got Member Hinale from the Independent Māori Statutory Board. Kia ora. Um, thank you for that. Um, what engagement um, has uh, your organisation had with either Ngāti Whātua or um, any of the other mana whenua uh, organisations? Yeah, kia ora. Um, Ngāti Whātua submitted as part, part of the public consultation on the uh, refresh of the Pathways to the Sea plan at uh, Oraki. Uh, they wished for the hard stand to remain. There has been a long association between the hard stand and Ngāti Whātua uh, in terms of support for boats coming in and out to work on the redevelopment of the muscle beds, uh, for the removal of boats that were in um, moorings in the bay. Uh, so there's been, uh, and for storage of waka armour. So there's been a long ongoing relationship between the current management, or currently ex-management, of the hard stand and Ngāti Whātua, and they wished for that hard stand to remain. That was their public submission. Thank you. Uh, 
Oh, right. Sorry, Councillor Darby. Thank you. Thanks, gentlemen. Thanks for reminding us about that great Northland Regional Council rule for marinas. It's something that we could look at ourselves, I think. Um, I don't think it's evident in elsewhere in New Zealand to that to that extent. But uh, good reminder. Um, just in terms of a five, I don't know, 10, 12 metre sloop today, um, and I ring up one of all of those yards, is about what's six in, in Auckland at the moment. You have pointed out that maybe some of them may not be there much longer. Um, what's the lead-in time? If I ring up today, how long have I got to wait to make a booking to um, undertake an Uh I'll try and answer that. The short answer is, unless you give me the exact details of your boat, I can't answer the question. One thing that's been absent from both of the preliminary reports that have been uh, commissioned into capacity is that neither of the authors of those reports spoke very carefully to the boating community. What we can tell you is that boats come in all sizes and shapes and weights, and that particular boat yards have facilities for only some of these boats. So there's a very close relationship between the size, shape and weight of a boat and which yard it can come out at. For example, if you happen to be the owner of a large trimaran, and there are many in Auckland, you've got no options now other than to go to Fongaray to clean your boat because the landing was the last hard stand that was able to accommodate that particular shape of boat. So what we really need is a granular look at the relationship between our remaining hard stands and the boats that we have. So in short, I can't answer your question. It would depend on your boat. Andrew, can I add a comment, uh, Mr Chair? Just a, a brief comment on that. Yeah. Um, one of the key comments in the reports of the commission. One report was commissioned by our Iraqi local board and another one um, by the Top of the North Working Group. Um, both contain comments regarding the availability of some spare capacity. And that certainly exists. The, the, the phrase is some. There has been no assessment of what spare capacity actually exists. But the limited contact that we've had with the authors of the Econometric Report state quite clearly that they doubt that the spare capacity that's available in existing facilities is sufficient to meet the deficit that's occurring already in Auckland and will only be made worse by the addition of more boats, Kennedy Bay Marina, um, and the increased frequency requirements for both anti-fouling and haul-out lift, what we refer to as lift and hold and wash just basic cleaning exercises. Um, hopefully that, that, that assists Councillor Darby. Thank you. And I've just had uh, from Orake Local Board says that Ngāti Pātou Orake were supportive of the, the hard stand being moved. So I just want to, I'll make sure we clarify that for the public record, but just in case that's maybe... All right, I, I would have to say I can't speak for I can't speak for Ngāti Whātua, obviously, and I can't speak for that public consultation process. It is my understanding that their public submission was supportive of option two, which is to retain the cleaning and uh, cleaning and anti-fouling aspects of a reduced footprint. But it did, in, in short, it was supportive of a retention of some of the functions of the yard. Okay, I'll just but we'll just yes. make sure we clarify that. Yeah, we need to fact check that. Thank you very much. Uh, last question. Oh, it's two questions. Councillor Lee. Thank you, Mr Chair, and, and good morning, gentlemen. Could you um, resolve a, a, a question for us? I understand there, there are essentially two reports circulating on this matter, and you've outlined a significant reduction in capacity for the um, haul-out haul cleaning, whole clean policy that the Council has been advocating for some years. Um, but there is another report suggesting that if uh, boats were cleaned in winter, um, sequenced that way, um, there is sufficient cap capacity. Could you resolve that apparent anomaly, please? Yes, uh, thanks, Councillor Lee. Yes, there was an initial report commissioned by the Oraki Local Board, uh, and the findings of that was that there was spare capacity and that if the landing was to shut, the uh, 1,600 uh, boat movements that would be lost to Auckland could be accommodated in other hard stands in the Auckland area. Now, 
the methodology that was employed, we don't have time for this, but the methodology that was employed was spatial mapping. In other words, they estimated capacity by essentially looking at the size of each yard. Now, if you know anything about measuring throughput, you don't measure the throughput of a restaurant by measuring the floor area of the restaurant, and that was the methodology in that first report. The second report that was commissioned by the Top of the North Biosecurity Partnership concluded that there was a serious lack of capacity in Auckland. So we have two conflicting reports. The second one was far more thorough and it used a well-respected uh, well methodology for measuring throughput. The first used a very unusual method for measuring throughput. Because the first report was issued uh, earlier, it has circulated and uh, I'm aware that a number of councillors would have seen that and been reassured by that first report without necessarily thinking about the methodology that it, it, it adopted. The second report has not been circulated as widely, but it is the, the report that the Top of the North Partnership rely on. So we have an evidential issue here, which is why we are requesting that given the significance of these decisions, that we look to put a stop on the closing of the hard stand, not permanently, but until we have some certainty around the consequence of closing the landing. Our view is in line with the Ecometrics report, we already have insufficient capacity. Um, so that's why we'd like a further investigation because there's an evidential question here. And I don't think a, a decision of this magnitude should be made when there is clearly an evidential uh, problem. Just following up, if I could, Mr. Chair, briefly. Um, the previous uh, deputation made the point of a civil emergency and its consequences with the extreme, recent extreme weather events. I, I would suggest that you made the, the um, parallel um, in regard to infrastructure, but I, I suggest there's another parallel bet between um, um, the two uh, deputations this morning, or, or the public input and the deputation, and that is, um, the, if it weren't for the uh, extreme weather events, I suggest that we would be hearing a lot more about the environmental emergency out on Great Barrier and, and, and the Mercury Islands regarding a Kalupa yeah. um, infestation. Could, could you give um, some um, idea of the impacts, the practical impacts of, of this Kalupa infestation, which um, as it, as it um, impacts on outdoor boating in this region. Thanks, Councillor Lee. Uh, look, it's very difficult for many of us to understand what invasive species are actually like, particularly when they're under the water and out of sight. The easiest way I can explain the Kalerpa infestation at Great Barrier is that we have released a possum into the marine environment. Kalerpa basically kills everything. It smothers the seabed. It strangles mussel beds and any other sort of kaimoana. It makes it very difficult for fish to lay eggs. Basically, where Kalerpa goes, you get, a, you get a dead zone. Now, the difficulty with Kalerpa is it's extremely difficult to remove. DOC have been working night and day now for pretty much six months trying to eradicate these infestations in uh, Great Barrier Island and Mercury, and they're really not making any headway. Now, the consequence isn't simply environmental. Basically, Kalerpa has come into Trifina Harbour. As a consequence, a controlled area notification has been issued that prevents anyone from anchoring in Trifina. Now, for those of you who have been to Trifina, I hope you'd appreciate the economic impact on the businesses in that small local community if boats can't stop there. What we're worried about is Kalerpa getting into the inner gulf. Imagine, for example, if it took root in Waiheke Island. It could boats go backwards and forwards between Great Barrier and Waiheke Island all the time. If it was to get into Oniroa, what would happen to the town of Oniroa if there was a control area notification that you were not allowed to, not allowed to anchor in Oniroa? And then imagine if it spread further into Mission Bay, into Oraki, into Takapuna. What would be the consequence for the recreational and economic assets in those areas if that pest gets further. So the only current uh, uh, mechanism for controlling this is to stop its spread. We don't seem to be able to eradicate it. And that's the reason that we're so worried about our ability to clean our boats. Mr Chairman, could I ask your, your advice here? C can the governing body 
request the Oraki Local Board to pause any change changes to the previous arrangements regarding the hard stand for some months to enable this matter to be resolved. And thank you, Councillor. I, <clears throat> to my understanding, the the process has already taken place for closure and it would be a very significant precedent for governing body to request at this stage for local boards to stop or reverse a decision. So we don't have that um, power um, and it has been tested under the Chamberlain Park discussion as well in the past. Um, and my understanding is it did not come up under the governance framework review when we looked at delegating things either way. So um, at this stage, we don't, we wouldn't have that um, power at all to, to do that. Can, can, can I suggest, Mr Chair, given the circumstances and the potential um, consequences of the uh, invasive uh, calipari outbreak in the Gulf, um, that, that I, I suggest that is very reasonable grounds for for the governing body, and we are the governing body, we, we are in fact the regional council to request the Iraqi, Iraqi lo local board. I, I know uh, that they have terminated uh, the present arrangements, that they haven't taken any steps to make any physical changes um, to the area. I, I, I would ask that the governing body um, talks to the Iraqi local board uh, not to take any action which would preempt um, reversing the situation because this essentially is a regional matter, if not a national matter. Thank you. Um, yeah, at this, especially not at this committee, through public forum, we don't have the ability to A, debate or um, B, make a decision. And I would be quite concerned, no matter what the issue was, that we would try and a take over the decisions of a democratically elected local board um, unless we change that through the gov a future decision of the governance framework review committee. That would be our only way to do that. Uh, Councillor Fletcher. Thank you. Councillor Lee has, has rather touched on um, the question that I have that I'd like to pose to the Director of Strategy. Where we have a very respectful position on the decisions of local boards, um, I, I know that we have had other situations that bring into consideration regional matters. What if we wished to actually look at a more regional level, what are the options that would be available Megan, in terms of not necessarily at this committee today, but could you outline those remedies that um, members of this committee could give consideration to? Through the chair, thank you for the question, Councillor Fletcher. Uh, under public input, of course, our recommendation would be rather than uh, you making any particular decision here that if you did want to get some advice uh, around what the options are, what the issues are, are they as being presented, are there other elements to the issues, then you could ask us to report back, I suggest through this committee, uh, and then that would allow you to then make a decision or get more information or whatever you might want to do out of that. Thank you for that, Megan, and I note that we have legal advisers here today, but um, I just wonder in your recommendations, Chair, whether you would give consideration to a report back, and if so, I'd be happy to move or second. Um, uh, Councillor Simpson had already asked to move, but you're welcome to <laughs> second. I had had a just a brief um, to thank the speakers, but also a the only thing we were able to do through public input is ask for, and I have the writing. The sorry refer the matter to, this is all we are able to do under standing orders, refer the matter of hard stand capacity of the Chief Executive for report back. That is the end. Yeah, so thank you. And we still have um, questions. Thank you, Councillor Fletcher. Councillor Leone. Oh, kia ora. Um, I just wanted to touch on a few things there. Is I have been involved in um, some of the rahui that have taken place over on Waiheke Island, so I'm well aware of the, um, the after effects of some of this 
these issues that you've raised. I just wanted to, to get an idea um, in, in terms of the consultation process or the communication that you've already had with the, the local boards, uh, because what, I mean, in my experience, I'm aware that issues have come up around the Hauraki Golf Forum and protection of Hauraki in the past, and a majority of the local boards actually agreed um, on some of those issues and were able to implement them. So I just want to get an idea if you've already um, approached an extensive amount of the local boards in Tamaki Makoto. Thank, thank you for the question. Um, there has been interaction between the AYBA and a number of local boards, but not all. Uh, we initially felt that it was going to be possible to work with council on this issue. And today, I think, is probably the end of the road on that option. Given that the decisions seem to be uh, permanently embedded with local boards, our next step will be to go out and talk to specific local boards about their reaction to Oraki closing the landing and to the lack of any regional strategy to protect the Hauraki Golf. Uh, we are also going to be speaking to the Hauraki Golf Forum to see if they can swing into action behind us. Um, I appreciate that the allocations have been made. Uh, however, we are looking to challenge the entire process of allocations. The decision to allocate local boards without reflecting on the impact on regional amenities where you have regional amenities sitting on a local board seems to us to have been an oversight of the decision of the committee that made that decision in 2013 and we're looking to proceed with a legal challenge to that decision. So in short, um, in answer to your question, one of our strategies from here is to go out and balkanise. We don't see any other option. If we can't get the local boards, if we can't get a regional response to this problem, then we'll have to go out to the individual local boards and address the issue locally with them. What happens after that, I don't know, but it's um, seemingly to us, it's the only other option. If we can't get the governing body and council to respond to this lack of capacity, we'll have to deal with the local boards. It's more, it's more work, obviously, but that's our, our next option. Thank you. Um, last question, Councillor Turner. Thank you. Um, West Auckland people would simply say we don't want this nonsense to affect our harbour either. What is the time frame, the growth frame for this invasive species? I'm just looking at the time frame of its ability to invade while we're talking about it. If we're talking specifically about Calupa exotica, which is only one of 11 highly invasive species here, but if we talk specifically about Calupa, the infestation in Blind Bay in Great Barrier was identified when that infestation was smaller than one square metre. In the six months since they've been observing and attempting to eradicate that infestation, it's grown to cover hundreds of square metres. This thing spreads very quickly. So our real concern is, given that we don't seem to be able to eliminate it, that if we aren't able to ensure it doesn't spread further, we've got a real problem. At the moment, the only management technique that seems to be working is to issue controlled area notifications to prevent boats from anchoring in the areas where it's infested. But little by little, if it spreads, uh, we've got a really significant issue here. So that's one of 11. I can't speak to the rate at which it's, uh, other, the other species spread, I'm afraid. Thank you. So, Mr Chair, just a question to you. Can we firm that up to some sort of time frames of when the report's going to come back, boy? Uh, I'm sure we would... So, the, the next planning committee meeting is the 31st of March, just because of the... Um, uh, the, uh, the holiday, you know, the... the um, deferment of meetings yeah, over Easter um, in, in April. So I think the next, so it's 31st of March and then it must be June. May or something. Um, if we were to report back on the 31st of March, um, it, wouldn't, um, it wouldn't be in detail on it, but it would give a sense of some of the issues to consider uh, and, and matters of, of budget and prioritisation and whether this is something you would want to do. So it would be that level of reporting we could do by March. I think any level as fast as possible is a good start. Yeah. 
Um, Mr. Chairman, if I may, is it possible that we could make a request, uh, as you've said here, for the uh, matter to be referred to the Chief Executive to report back? Can that be done under urgency? So the, 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 the main issue is that anything, so we've got a massive uh, budget issue at the moment and councillors have also recently voted to stop all discretionary spending. So there isn't, um, as far as I know, Megan, there isn't actually any additional capacity to do this work, but we will try our best to get as much done as possible, but there is no extra budget or time um, for staff to be doing um, this, but we will get... We will do our best to get something back by the 31st. Um, how detailed that could be, and also keeping in mind that we do not have the, the legal power or could not change that in a small time if we wanted to on, on decision-making between local boards and governing body. We, we spent three years doing that last term, and unfortunately, this um, for those who want that change, that wasn't part of that decision-making process at that time. That's quite a fulsome and could have wide implications either way. Um, right, so oh, last question, Councillor Fletcher. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I wonder if it would give, and while I accept that it may not be as comprehensive, but on the basis of what the Director of Strategy has said, it may give some comfort uh, to members of this committee and to others for report back at the next meeting of this committee. As a seconder of, of this, I'm very happy for that qualification that there will be some report back at the next meeting. I wonder whether the mover would be willing to accept that. We could just say by the... Yeah, it doesn't... Um, Uh, Mr Chair, uh, Richard Steele, I just wonder whether, in fact, the motion that is just being amended now might also be made clearer um, that we're referring to hard stand capacity to enable compliance with Council's own yeah, so rules and regulations regarding marine biosecurity So the, um, Thank you, Richard. I think at this stage, the the... The motion had always was already sort of wider than what we can do under standing orders already. So I think we will ensure the chief executive reports back based on the information he's heard at this um, meeting. If we get to prescript, it, yeah, it's sort of not what we can do under public input, fortunately. But thank you. All right, appreciate it. Councillor Leone, Councillor did you still have a question, or you? No. Kia ora. Okay. Well, thank you very much um, for that comprehensive. Um, presentation and um, very good answers to all the questions members had. Um, so we will um, we have a mover and a seconder. All those in favour? Right. Anyone opposed? Of course, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank have you, a good thank day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. My understanding is that there's a lot of information already on the public record, so we, yeah. we, we obviously have the contacts of the submitters today. Yes to get information that is already there. We don't have to create it, it's already there. Yeah. Thank you very much, Councillor. The next up we have Pest Free Kaipatsuki. What, what do they want to do there? Annie and... We have Annie and Fiona. And we tried to hold that in 2013. Um, right. We have uh, Annie and Fiona from my hood in Kaipatiki and uh, Chris's hood. Um, just want to acknowledge all the work that you um, do and what you've been doing. And I think your presentation is going to be focused on um, what you've been doing throughout the flood and cyclone, maybe what happened in the weekend, and also. Um, oh, have they got. Uh, okay. I think Sorry. they've stolen the clicker. Yeah, is there a, um, a slide? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Got those bodies are untrustworthy. Lots. Stay to the missing clicker. <laughs> so, um, Annie, you'll have uh, five minutes with some questions, and then we will um, thank you. Thanks, Richard. Um, yeah, as, as Richard said, I'm Annie Dignan, and I'm really fortunate to be the general manager of Pestbury Kaipataki, and Fiona is my colleague, and she's the senior restoration advisor. 
For those of you who don't know, Pest Free Kaupatiki is a network of 61 reserve groups and, and clusters of neighbours. 61 is a lot, 61 reserve groups and clusters of neighbours. Um, and we've also got thousands of, of volunteers uh, throughout our area in addition to those reserve groups. Um, those individuals and our reserve groups, they're, they're working um, incredibly hard. Kaipataki is, for those of you who don't know, and I'm sure most of you do, it's incredibly diverse. Um, it's it, biodiversity, it's forested, um, and it, it effectively acts as the lungs of Auckland. Um, you know, it, it, is, it was doing the work we all need it to do. We're long-term partners with the Auckland Council, and, and we're really grateful for this. And the support... Um, has allowed us to, to offer a, a vast program, and we touch on, I'd say, the lives of most people in our ward. We bring the community together to focus in the areas of, of pest control, of uh, restoration, climate change mitigation, carry dieback, and biodiversity, to name but a few. I did say our program is vast. Um, but the purpose of being with you here today is, is to really highlight the value of volunteers and what what contribution PFK volunteers have made, as Richard said, in, in, in response to the flood and cyclone. But also, importantly, we really want to talk about what contribution and value volunteers could add to the city in the future. So I'll just hand over to Fiona. Okay. So we're a relatively um, nimble kind of organisation, being an NGO supported by um, the council and a number of other partners. Um, and our response to the recent flooding um, has been threefold. So um, the first thing we did was we started to work around the community's fears of slips and, and tree loss and that kind of area. Um, and we pulled together next the commu our extensive community network for the rather cathartic experience of sharing their experiences with the floods on their reserves, of course as reserve reps, um, on their homes uh, and their personal lives and community. Just going, I don't want to go. Uh, kia ora, Alf, you've just got your mic um, has gone off mute. Uh, kia ora. Uh, um, yeah, so that, that was an extremely valuable um, opportunity in our community, and it actually opened quite a lot of constructive dialogue with uh, our network as to how they can play a part alongside council and some collaborative you know, solutions for the damages that we're seeing in our community environment. Um, and most recently, we've worked with the council and our Kaipataki local board um, to bring together this network of highly skilled, really knowledgeable volunteers in our network to work in a task force cleaning up some of the, you know, non-technical, safe kind of damage that's happened in our parks. You know, things that, to be quite honest, the council contractors aren't going to get to for a long time. And fair enough, they've got an awful lot of other high-priority risk sort of um, things to be doing. Um, now, th things like, for example, um, block drains, fallen trees, debris, and that kind of thing. Um, now, we've just completed that approved pilot um, in the Rangatira Reserve with the Kaipataki Task Force, and it's proven to be quite um, successful, quite useful, and it shows great potential actually to assist, well, we believe, to assist the city in responding to the damages of this flood. Um, and in the future, after we've done all this work and had the cleanup, that it offers a significant number of efficiencies and savings in our eco-contract um, area of work in the community facilities. We believe our volunteers can play a really good role in this space and saving the city um, some funds that are tight. So the reason why we um, worked in all three of these spaces with the, um, the task force, etc., is that volunteers want to be part of this solution. And I'm sure that's not just in our local board area, but it'll be seen right across Auckland. Um, we wanted to bring the community together because we know that volunteering for the environment and in the environment definitely improves well-being, right? In a time where our communities are really stressed, the environment is a very um, diverse medium to uh, heal people. Um, and significantly for this audience is what we want to talk about, is that the task force and, and work with volunteers uh, represents a really large saving and efficiency um, by volunteers simply finding, reporting and getting on with work. Um, and that will hopefully be a, a cost saving at the end of the council contract program. Um, we know there are many, many tough decisions ahead of all of you when it comes to budgeting um, and you know, balancing the numbers. So we believe that drawing on people and the networks that are already established, programs ready to go, is definitely a sensible fiscal 
decision and you may very well be able to eliminate some waste. So, yep, so I'd said that the, we've had a partnership with Council for the previous seven years and, and this, this has been an investment in resources and training and time to build relationships. And the outcome of this has been this network of skilled and committed and connected volunteers. We want to make sure that this investment continues to offer you know, maximum returns for both, or well, all three, for the community, the environment, and, and obviously the budget. Um, and we, we, we know that the, the community matters to you. I'm, I'm sure that's why you stood for your roles. Um, and we also know you've got a number of commitments. You know, the Thriving Community Strategy, PFK are contributing to all four of the goals in that strategy. On today's agenda, you're discussing the, uh, the report of the three-year annual plan. And it, it notes the, um, that there needs increased progress in the areas of supporting community connection and resilience and to improve mental and physical health. Now, we're doing this work. So we're a, a, a not-for-profit environmental community organisation and we're showing leadership in this space. But what, what, the key reason we've come to you today is we know we can be doing more with increased leadership um, from this, this audience. We could have greater impact. So the three key areas that we're asking for for your leadership and input, firstly, recognise the value, and the value in every sense of the word, in, in partnering with volunteers. In some instances, I think this will be philosophical and certainly operational change in the way that volunteers are considered. Our volunteers are skilled, they're willing, and they're deeply connected with their reserves. Secondly, the second area we need your leadership is in, in advocating for council eco-contract and volunteered shared programmes. This is, this is a really big roadblock in achieving what could be done in this space. Together we can make far greater impact more quickly and significantly save efficiencies in funding. If you're not already aware, there's, there's significant frustrations in the community. Um, there's, we see time and time again waste. Uh, we, see slip, we see areas that have been planted get mowed. We see um, you know, a number of things that's just very frustrating and hard to keep, the, to keep people engaged when it's one step forward and two steps back. Um, so we see that this is an area where significant gains could be made. And we've, we've, we've got uh, the pilot of, of our, our Kaipataki Reserves Task Force, which is a really highlights a solution as to how we could operate in this place. We've got some great relationships with council staff, um, but what we're reliant on is, is those a handful of dedicated staff. We want to move beyond that. We want this way of working to become the norm where we're not at the behest of you know, a, a dedicated staff member. And finally, um, we, we need your leadership by continuing to fund collaborative environmental programs such as the natural environment targeted rate and the local wood funding. Volunteers are literally giving hundreds of thousands of dollars of dollars of effort annually, and that's, in, that's within our, our group alone. That, that's across the city, but I know that other groups are struggling with the same issues that we are. And that just the value, and that's just, when I say hundreds of thousands of dollars, that's just the value of the work. That's not the other spin-off collateral things like the health benefits, the mental health things, the connected community, which is so important to us all. So, um, yeah, so we, we want to, you to value this work and, and, and assist us to build a thriving community. And I really think that now is the hour. Thank you for your time. Thank you both. And thank you for the organisation. Um, this, you know, just to clarify, this group, um, Press Free Kaipataki, started with a, a, a few um, uh, people in our community, or well, years ago really, um, and I think about seven or eight years ago, yeah. formed properly into Press Free Kaipataki and are now in all of our reserves nearly, and neighbourhoods, and um, have hundreds and hundreds of volunteers, and save us already a lot of money as a council, and mm. um, because of all the extra work they do on top of what our contractors and staff are able to do. Right, we've got a number of questions. Councillor Sayers first. Yeah, thank, thanks, Richard. I, I look, I, I really enjoyed the presentation. I, I think it touches on a much wider concern that volunteers have right across Auckland. So uh, it's great that you pulled together and you got your group together and, and had your meetings and, and carried forward, so that was very pleasing to hear. 
um, a great role model. Um, so the question I have is just trying to get greater c clarification. It's not really trying to add about how this could be scaled, right? So it's not, for me, it's not just about the cost saving, but it's more about the roadblocks that you kind of touched on. I know the council staff have do, been doing their very best, you know, yeah. and all credit to them, but yeah. I think you're trying to uh, explain to us what those what could get out of the way in terms of the red tape for volunteers. So I didn't quite get a feel, uh, Mr Chair, what those things are. Maybe there's some examples. You, will, you may hear a very long list, but... <laughs> yeah, well, I need to know. So thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. And you're right, I would love to... You're right, there's a long list, Richard, um, of examples. Um, a, a clear, obvious example for me is we um, have got, as I said, highly skilled trained uh, volunteers out there. And, and we've got eco-contracts where uh, they might have four hours in one of our local reserves. And we've seen many, many times where, with it, where an eco-contractor has gone to that reserve and they have spent three of those four hours looking for the issue. So they've showed up there in a truck, there's three, four of them, and they wander around in the reserves looking for potential issues and they find one within three hours and they work on it for an hour. Down the road, Birkenhead War Memorial, we've got a fabulous reserve group there. They discuss amongst themselves what's the biggest issue in our reserve right now. They contact, one of them happens to have the contacts of the contractor, they pinpointed on the map, they take photos of the issue and they say, this is the biggest challenge for us in our reserve right now. And, and that, that contractor is able to go there with the right tools, the right people, and spend four hours on that job. Um, and and the, the biggest impediment to that happening across the board, so we're already adding that value, but much more on an ad hoc basis. The biggest impediment to us being able to do that is a standard work practice. And this is what we'd love to see. We'd love this to be a standard work practice where we're sharing the information. If, if one of our volunteers goes down, as they are at the moment, and chopping limbs that are crossing tracks and things like that, we need to be able to share the fact that that work's taken place. Otherwise, council are going to... They've already had 20 people complain about it on the uh, report a problem page. No one knows that 20 people have done it. They all think they're the only one. Um, so they... they they're still going to send a truck with three people to cut down that limb. The, the, standing by and seeing this waste is painful. Um, and it is also very um, disempowering for our volunteers. Uh, you know, our, our volunteers find it very frustrating. Um, so, yeah, but, uh, you know, that, that's one example. And, the, and what we could do to change that is there's a, it's about getting the right people around the table um, with, with high enough up the food chain. But the message has got to be, and that's what the message has got to come from here, that volunteers can play a vital part in this. Um, and so if, if we got the right people around the table and we had effective chip communication channels where we can share the reporter problem... Now, we can do it as an organisation. We've got a more advanced system than the reporter problem page because we can show when the problem's been fixed. And we can also show when the problem's been reported. So, but, and then we can share that with council. But what we need is for that information to come back. To, we need a similar system to come back to us. Um, so it, a lot of it is actually in that those channels of communication. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Oh, it's helpful here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Walker. So I just want to pick up on what you've just described. Um, what you're referring to on your part is an app that I think Keith Salmon, Richard hmm. Steele and the like have uh, developed at incredibly uh, little cost. This app, correct me if I'm wrong, enables you to capture the input on the part of volunteers across any number of pest activities. And what you're asking is for that app to be able to communicate with the council's app. That is correct? Yep, absolutely, and okay. it's in a compatible form. And further to that, would it be possible for your group to inform council on value, because you can take that app, you can take the work that it generates and assign a value to it, so that we as council, and particularly the mayor, because he's right on to fixing things and making savings, 
so that we can be informed around the incredible value that you are providing that is saving us hundreds of thousands and perhaps millions of dollars a year. Thank you. And you're welcome to respond. Thank you. Yeah, as an example... Is that Sorry. Um, Fiona talked about the task force in the weekend. So we had 28 volunteers out there in Rangatira Reserve. Um, and we worked for two and a half hours clearing, clearing drains, those kind of things. And when I say clearing drains, it sounds like a minor work, but actually if that, I would say a significant amount of the damage that was caused in our reserves, and Kaupatiki reserves have been very affected by the floods and cyclones, a significant amount of that was because of of poorly maintained drains and, and culverts. So we were in there, 28 people in there for two and a half hours doing a power of work. People worked like Trojans. I had to stop them at the end of the day. Um, I've still got sore muscles. Um, you know, that, that alone, and as Fiona said, we don't know when contractors would, would have got into that reserve to open up those tracks. I suspect it'll be a wee way away. Um, so in terms of being able to say that 28 hours times two and a half hours, simple things like that, you know, yes, we can, we can easily do those numbers, yeah. May I add something to that just really quickly? We, we're really not about creating more work. We're very, very conscious about doing that. Everyone's under pressure. So, you know, utilising systems that are already in place, you know, things are absolutely ready to go. It's just we need those communication channels to be sound. I think there's a, a willingness, but at the end of the day, there's just a few roadblocks in that actually happening. So um, getting around the table with the right people and having a mandate to, to share information quickly and effectively, I think it can save um, our environment and our city uh, a great deal in this time of stress. Thank you. Thank you. And to, and to just clarify, for, and I know you did mention at the beginning, the Auckland Council staff um, and local board staff supported what happened in the weekend and supported that work. So they have been, um, we just need to have that on an everyday um, sense. So, so we are seeing good change driven by you all, but, but we need that. Yeah, and we, but it's it's the it's the systems beside Behind it, it you know, well. that yeah. we're sharing that information. That's yeah. what needs to happen. Yeah, thanks, Councillor Darby. Thank you both. Wonderful presentation. Just running out of time, so just I'll, I'll just be brief with my question. Um, can you just give us a sense of um, how does the community see and own the outcomes and um, delivered when there is a community? Um, involvement and real participation in the, the projects and programs compared to when council does it to a community. Mm. And the second question, and I'll be quick, is what can you identify any risks in developing this program up and formalising it, e.g. health and safety? Um, if I, I'll answer the first part of that, because um, it's very dear to my heart, that whole community. Um, as I said, we're a community environmental organisation. So the, the bringing people together, um, whether it's for environmental action or whatever, we know that the, I think seven, the research shows that 79% of the people that engage in volunteer activity come to meet their neighbours and meet their community. We're seeing we cannot meet the demand as an organisation of the people who want to be engaged with their community. And I think particularly now, I would say in, as a response to the flood, you know, we can't sit by and expect that someone in a helmet and a high-vis vest and overalls is going to come knocking on our door and see how we are. In my experience, in my neighbourhood, it was my neighbours. It was my neighbours who ran over and saw that we were flooding and took my kids away. It was another neighbour that ran up the street with her spa pump, you know, to see whether she could stop the, the thing coming through. And that's because they know my name and they know the name of my children. So uh, we are hugely about bringing the community together. A, a lovely example I had on the weekend, sorry, um, is, is I had a woman, a very know, well known, internationally known botanist who was volunteering for us. And she thanked us at the end of the day. She said, thank you for organising this event. You have given me the opportunity to do something that I feel proud of. And that sense of pride will stay with me all week. And I thought, isn't that amazing that we can provide an opportunity for her to feel proud? And I felt proud of that. And I could, the reason I love my job is I could give you so many examples of where we bring the people together to work on a, on a common problem. Um, yeah, so that, that's a huge part. I'll let Fiona answer the health and safety aspect. Um, yeah, 100% agree with you. We, are, we value our volunteers and our community's health and safety 
extraordinarily high. Um, the, this, this, this work is, admittedly at the moment, the task force is relatively non-technical. They're well assessed in advance. They're all approved by the council. You know, we provide the information, it's reviewed, bingo, we're ready to go. It's all logged in the system. Um, it can be followed up on, no, absolutely, really high. Health and safety is a major in this case. There is a, a level of, of um, mid-range sort of activities and tasks that we believe volunteers could do that needs further discussion with the council because, after all, the council uh, facilities program does need to be up to a certain standard and that kind of thing. But, we, you know, our network is, is of thousands of people, including retired engineers, builders. So there's a great deal of skill out there and a willingness to help. It's the matter of meeting together and getting a work program and, and getting on with it. Yeah. And, and just to add one point to that, the, the, the council's investment in us as an organisation has already allowed us to, to do things like make sure they are trained and they've got appropriate PPE. So we, you've already made that investment. Thank you. Um, we've got a number of questions, so please try and keep them to stuff that we have not heard yet. Um, Deputy Chair, Councillor Dalton. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Annie and Fiona, for your presentation. I've really, really enjoyed it. You've spoken a lot to community resilience and social cohesion based on all the work that you're doing and with your volunteers. And the return of investment by council must be, I don't know if you've been able to quantify it, but if you could um, let us know what the impact of the proposed budget cuts will have for you in, in the space of all of the work that you're doing. And if you can quantify it in terms of the return on investment, that would be really helpful. Thank you. All right. Thanks very much. Um, good, excellent question. The return on investment, um, of course, we're rather biased, but it really is a hundred. It, it's so far, it's a small input to the community organisations like us, and we're only one. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds thousands of volunteer hours, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And that is only what we're measuring. Um, we know that, that everything we report back to on our programs is an underrepresentation by far, because getting information back is sometimes difficult. So it's actually a far, far higher figure. And that doesn't take into account the social well-being. I do not know how to put a dollar value on that, but it's huge. Um, and, oh, in terms of the budget, uh, the proposed uh, changes to, you know, the discretionary uh, local board funding um, and the targeted rates, uh, environmental targeted rates that impact on RENH uh, and the CCFG funds, the Community um, Coordination Fund, will significantly have an effect on, on organisations like ours. Um, for us, 72.5% of our um, funding is provided through the local board of Auckland Council grants, um, depending on the programs and support and that kind of thing. The rest is through others um, like Foundation North, the Lotteries Department, that kind of thing. Um, so it will have a really large impact. And so, and again, Annie's mentioned, you know, the investment. We, we're a, we've got a partnership with the council now for seven years, and our program is one of the, the widest, um, I think, in this area of community facilities. Um, so a huge amount of investment's already gone in, and like I mentioned, the per dollar that you put in, uh, volunteers are just giving so much back. So it doesn't make sense, I don't think, uh, ethically, morally, uh, strategically for the environment, community wellbeing or the budget to to cut that. So we're in opposition of the, the proposed reductions to those funds. And just to give you an idea of some specific numbers, um, Fiona said we underestimate because it's very hard to get volunteer hours, but I think we're around the uh, 16,500 volunteer hours a year. And if you were to do the maths on that at, at kind of minimum wage, you know, you're, you're looking at like half a million dollars of volunteer effort. So, but that, as I said, that's not the other, you know, that's not the social health or any of those things. Um, so, you know, it's, it's really hard to equate. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deputy Chair. Um, Councillor Turner, question. Thank you. Most of the question has been answered. Very informative. Um, I do strongly support the fact that Council does not leverage the best result out of a practical result out of its volunteers. Does your organisation have uh, paid staff that are facilitating um, organising, you know, and Sure. We, um, we do have a number of paid staff. Um, so we've got like, senior restoration advisors, we've got an educator uh, who's working with schools. Um, so that, they're out there galvanising the community and, and making sure that... So our, our um, 
our vision is, is one, I mean, not our vision, our, our mission is one where we inspire, educate and resource the community. So we've got staff to do that. So are you happy that there's not a duplication of those activities between yourself and council? Um, I, I would say there are some similar roles, um, but we, luckily we are able to work closely with those people to make sure that there isn't the duplication. We're also sometimes in the advantageous situation where we can get places because of our network um, and deliver some of the information that those um, council staff may want taken into spaces that they may not necessarily have access to. Thank you. That's the only area of concern I hold with the, sort of that sort of funding. Yep. Thank you. Um, Member Ashby. Kia ora. Thank you for the presentation. Um, and yeah, first, just quickly acknowledge all the good mahi you do. Very familiar with um, with your crew. Uh, just a quick question from me is um, uh, totally supporting the efficiencies and, and understanding, um, for my own part, the issue and what you're asking for. It's just a quick question in terms of um, the uh, comms alignment and program that you're talking about, where uh, iwi fit into that. Um, kia ora. Um, thanks very much for that. Um, we are really lucky that for the first time this year we've got support through the CCFG fund um, for a, a a small amount of funding to bring on a Te Tao, uh, coordinator, an activator. Um, we've actually shared the role with another local board, uh, another organisation like ours, because it wasn't quite enough to bring on someone. Now we've got enough for a, a part-time um, staff member, and they are building. They're, they're building uh, relationships with Mana Whenua, um, helping to develop iwi-led restoration act activity in both our local boards, um, as well as capacity building, because that was something that was identified as definitely um, lacking in our, our organisation. Something that we've put a big focus on in our strategic and operational plans. So we're early days, but there's some amazing amount of growth and potential there, particularly in our local board uh, in the areas of, you know, Beach Haven uh, and Birkdale, which have really, you know, strong um, uh, uh, demographics of, of uh, mana whenua. Mm. So thank you. Uh, Mayor Wayne Brown, sorry, you've got a... Thanks for that. I'm quite happy to be a champion for uh, volunteers and their enthusiasm. Uh, I'm a champion for um, sea cleaners, and we clean up of endless bloody messes in the creeks around here. And it's been kids. We we educate children about not bestowing stuff in there, but every time we go back, it's still full of the same stuff. Um, what I thought you were, were as a cry for some form of council coordinator because there is a fair bit of um, people doing the same thing in the same areas. And uh, it's a, it's a, I don't understand quite how council coordinate that, so I'm just going to ask that it's a, as a result of this, we support that, but someone could explain in the future, not necessarily now, just how we can coordinate all this to get the best result out of it. That's all. Thank you, Mayor. And we do have a... Um additional wording to the motion up there that we will ask for a bit more information and get um, not potentially not a report but just how we can get um, more information and bring that together for through the um, executive lead team um, at council right uh, councillor Ferry all right councillor Bartley Oh, thank you, and thank you for your presentation. Um, I just wanted to confirm, you just operate in the Kaipataki area, right? Yeah, we do. Um, but we are pretty confident, and we, we hear it repeatedly from our friends at council, that we are you know, probably the largest and, and the role model for other organisations. So we are really open and sharing of our resources and information with others, so try and... Uh, share our expertise as widely as we can. But but our operating area is, is strictly within Kaipataki, yeah. So we would still need our council teams that work in this space to um, 
service the rest of Auckland then? Oh, no, we could, we could, uh, we could expand. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. I, um, but, just but, mindful that we're in the middle of, you know, annual budget discussions yeah, and yeah. teams are being proposed to be cut, work is proposed to be cut from the council, and I don't want people to think that we'll just cut the teams doing environmental work in council and rely on volunteers. Yeah, absolutely not. And, and as Fiona said, we... we uh, we're largely funded by council. Um, you are investing in us, so absolutely we don't want to see cuts to those services, um, you know, and to the budgets that we talked about. Because um, we will, you know, I've, we've just moved into new premises, the old Glenfield Bowls Club, and it's fabulous. But I'm I'm concerned that I'm going to be looking around the table at a much reduced staff group. And actually, to be honest, I'm the general manager and I'm part time. And the hardest money to find out there is for me as the general manager and our finance person. Um, so the team of restoration advisors and ecologists that I've got, um, they might still be there, but they're going to have to learn how to do zero and payroll and everything else because there's, there's not a lot of money to fund the general manager and the, um, the finance person. So, the, you know, that's our reality. So I'm, I'm concerned that we're going to be looking at a much smaller organisation. So this is, we've showed you what we deliver now, but I don't know what we'll be looking at delivering under the proposed budget. Same as us. Kia ora. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Councillor Foley. Uh, kia ora. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm just mindful that we have groups out in my ward, in the Manuko ward, who are doing very similar work, and they also rely heavily on the local board funding. Um, the Otara Lakes and Waterway Trust, they mm -hmm. do our Adopt-a-Spot and Neat Streets programs um, and do the restoration of the waterways around there. Um, and they've had similar issues where they've organised a big planting day with our local schools. The so schools go along, do all of that um, work, and then our council contractors come along and mow it down. We've so, had one done three times. <laughs> yes. So I, I certainly total call um, those issues that you raise around that, and I look forward to us being able to coordinate better, communicate better, and get that um, issue solved. Mm -hmm. um, can I just encourage you, though, to reach out to those groups in out south, we've got the Manukau Beautification mm -hmm. Trust, Otara Lakes and Waterway Trust, and in Māngere, I believe Amarai does a lot of work mm -hmm. um, around their waterways with mm -hmm. Iron Māngere and ME services. Mm -hmm. I think some coordinating and some advice um, would be really much appreciated by those mm -hmm. groups. Mm -hmm. Kia ora. Thank well, you. Thank, thank you. you, Chair. Cool. Thank you. Sorry. Um, Thank you very much for the presentation. The, um, we, I, I just want to acknowledge the, the governing body here, I mean, the, so the, the committee here. Um, we approved, and you might not remember last term, a base for, for this organisation on the proviso that they wouldn't come to council for any money to upgrade, to um, set it up, to fit it out um, of a, of a, Old bowl, the old bowls club that was falling apart. Um, how much did you come to council for, for that complete fit out upgrade and to make it livable? Oh, was it thir uh, to come to council? I, I don't know that I we came. 13,000 13, by the local board? Yeah, I think the local board it, it gave us an additional 13, but I don't think we, we didn't come back to council for. Yeah, so we were talking. Council was told at the time it would cost us three hundred thousand. Was it no six hundred thousand? I think it was, I think the estimated cost was something like seven hundred and thirty thousand to restore. Yeah. Yeah. So we were told at the time that it would cost seven hundred and thirty thousand council dollars to restore, and this group managed to restore based on volunteering hours and thirteen thousand from the local board. Mm. Um, so we do need to look at how we can build on what um, groups like this do. So I just want to acknowledge you. We do have the. Um, a resolution up there just about getting a bit more information so we can see how we can um, further improve. I know you've passed this on through many channels over the over the years, but um, and I do want to acknowledge through the questions of Councillor Dalton that this may be difficult after the budget if it stays as it is because you're going to lose that quite a significant chunk of your funding, which helps us reduce our costs. So it's about how we find that balance definitely through the budget. Um, I've moved this in Councillor Darby's second. And thank you very much. All those in favour? Aye. Any opposed? No. Cool. We'll see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you.
Right, now I think we, oh, there he is. Um, kia ora, Damien, who's the not so new anymore, you're six months in almost, um, chairperson of the Howick Local Board. You're coming to talk about marine biosecurity. You would have been told you have the normal five minutes with some questions, so you can, we'll just check that we've got your volume. Can we hear you? Uh, yeah, just, yeah. can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear yes. you. Cool. There you go. Thank you, Damien. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, Tēnā koutou, katoa, everyone. Um, thank you very much. My name is Damien Light. I'm the chair of the Howard Political Board. Um, here to talk about marine biosecurity, which I know has already been a uh, topic of discussion this morning. Uh, so, look, I, I won't uh, take too much of your time up. Um, looks like there was, a, there was a very good, robust and uh, detailed discussion earlier. I suppose, um, sorry, can we just look to the next slide? Um, yeah, so the, the Health Local Board is quite concerned um, specifically about the marine biosecurity risk to the Tamaki Estuary, uh, which is in our Rohi. Um, and this artwork you might be able to see behind me is um, an artwork that belongs to the, the local board office. Um, and it was presented to us and it shows some of the, um, the wildlife that lives in and around the Tamaki Estuary. Uh, so let's introduce some of it as native. And, uh, and so it is uh, just a reflection of the importance that the Tamaki Estuary is to the Health Local Board. Uh, and so that's why we're here today uh, to talk to you to kind of add to a little bit of the, um, the conversation around marine biosecurity. The concern in particular is around the increased number of boats um, that will be that may be required to enter the Tamaki Estuary for hull cleaning and maintenance. And one of the earlier presenters mentioned um, the the um, facility at Half Moon Bay, um, which is obviously you know it's a, it's a great facility that does good work. Um, but um, what we're concerned about is that the biosecurity risks that exist in the Haraka Gulf uh, might uh, in fact come to um, Tamaki Estuary as well. If I could just grab the next slide, please. All right, so yeah, so as mentioned earlier on, there's a whole lot of non-native species in uh, the Haraki Gulf, uh, and, and, and some of those are marine pests. Uh, there is the Haraki Gulf Controlled Area Notice. Um, and we know from MPI, Biosecurity New Zealand, that 69% of marine species that get introduced, exotic species that get introduced, come in on vessel hulls. Uh, and so controlling and making sure that vessel hulls are cleaned and looked after is very important. Um, and so what we want to make sure is that we're not spreading the risk uh, into other places, and I'll see our particular concern is for the Tamaki. Um, can I just get the next slide, please? And so, as we mentioned earlier on, there is an outbreak of very real live risk uh, to the Haraki Gulf at the moment, um, which is the um, Kalapera, which is up at Antia Great Barrier. Um, and Aru would be um, Mercury Island. And what we really don't want, of course, is that spreading. And obviously, as we notice, there's controlled area notices in place, which stops uh, vessels being able to move um, in and out of those places. The risk is that it can spread very, very quickly. And once it's established, it's extremely difficult um, to get rid of. And as was noted earlier on, Doc's been working really hard with MPI to try and contain and uh, remove it, but it is extremely challenging. And what we really, really don't want happening is it, it's spreading into other parts of um, the Haraki Gulf. And obviously, again, our concern is that uh, we don't want it coming down into the Tamaki Estuary. And so the concern is that not just this uh, particular risks, but all biosecurity risks, we don't want them to come into the Tamaki Estuary. Um, and so, could we flip to the next slide, sir, please? Yep, and so as we mentioned, there's a regional pest plan, which is again a really good document, um, requires people to keep their hulls clean, and obviously the safest way to do that is to take the vessel out of the water and clean it, so that it removes the pests and none of those um, potential marine biosecurity risks that are then spread. The map you'll see there comes out of the clean boating guide, and it talks about the areas where you can't clean your, uh, your boat in the water. Um, and you can see the Tamaki Estuary is all in red. It's prohibited. You can't clean the boats. So you have to take it to a fallout zone, which is really good. And that's an appropriate response and a good response. The issue is, as was noted earlier, there's a question of capacity at a regional level. And also, I guess, for our concern at the local board, we're concerned about um, us having one of our uh, a haul out facility in our area, that boats that are at risk may come into the um, Tamaki Street to use the haul out facility, and in doing so that they may spread the risk um, with them. And can I just grab that the next slide, please? 
Cool. Um, and so the key message we want to take away, which I think was, was definitely established and feels like we got to that point in that, in that presentation earlier on, is that we need a reliable network of haul-out facilities. Um, we need to make sure that we have hard stand and haul-out facilities around the region so that when someone does have an issue, there is needing requirement at a They've got an issue on their hull, they need to clean it. Um, they, they can go to somewhere that's local and close by. Uh, the further they have to travel, the more likely that they will take that risk, that biosecurity risk uh, and that pest with them and spread it. Um, so it's really important that we have not just capacity across Auckland, but capacity in local areas so that um, ships and boats can go to a, a facility that is nearby to them and it doesn't spread. Um, yeah, and next slide. And Cool. Thank you very much. Um, so look, I think I think the discussion earlier on captured a lot of the concerns. Uh, we just wanted to add our voice as, as a local board uh, that we're concerned about making sure that we look and care after the Tamaki history in our area that's, and we're very concerned about. Um, and look, we're looking forward to the outcomes of that resolution, that um, that advice that you've asked for earlier on, on what those options are available to. Um, so that's us. Thank you. Kia ora, Chair Light. Thank you very, very much. Um, very good, succinct presentation. On the issues there, um, Councillor Leone. Oh, kia ora, Damien. Um, Corinne Leone, Councillor. I just wanted to say, as, as a Ngāti Pawa Wahine, kia ora, Bruce. Um, good to see you on there. You probably can't see me. Thank you for the mahi that you've been doing in that space um, in the presentation. Absolutely um, agree with the points that you've raised. I just wanted to ask whether... Uh, you've looked at holding like a chairs forum or something like that with the other local boards um, to have a combined approach on on what your um, corridor is about today. Yeah, absolutely. That is something that is uh, is on my list. Unfortunately, we had a chairs forum recently, but obviously the priority has been focusing on the annual budget and obviously the emergency emergency response. Um, but this is definitely on my list to definitely raise it um, and see how we can coordinate. We did have a short discussion um, and I have spoken to some of the other chairs about it. Um, but yeah, we're keen to get it on the agenda so we can um, approach it at a local board level as well. But I think to the point that was made earlier on, ultimately, if it's, you want a regional response, uh, it, needs a, um, it needs a regional outlook, which I think is sits with this committee and the governing body. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Councillor Williamson. Yeah, thanks, uh, Damien. And it might be more appropriate for Bruce Kendall to answer this one, but in the previous presentation we had, and I was thinking of raising it as a question, but it really didn't get a chance. The, the problem with the, the haul out and the cleaning of the boats can be quite seasonal. And the problem is that if you just say we've got this much capacity and this many boats so it can be done, would be like saying to farmers, we've got this many hay balers and 365 days that you can make your hay. But in fact, boats have to come out at certain times in certain parts of the season and therefore a much more rigorous uh, standard of what are the days when boats are required to be using it uh, would give us a better measure of the load factors in there rather than just a global, this is how much and this is how many. Can I get you to comment and maybe Bruce knows more yeah. about that than I do? Yeah, can I just say yeah, absolutely and yes, I think that point was made earlier as well that the there's a couple of different ways of looking at capacity and I think that's and that's why we wanted to add our voice because it's not just a regional capacity as well it's thinking about where whether if there's an issue and where someone needs to haul out where they're going to go and what we don't want is boats traveling all across Auckland or in some cases all the way to Northland uh to be able to do a haul to be able to haul out and um, be um clean and check their boat and that's in a proactive sense if there's a reactive if, there, if there's um a marine pest or a biosecurity issue on a specific boat they're required to haul out meet uh, basically within 20 48 hours so it means they've got to do it immediately so capacity all of a sudden becomes a, a, an urgent need um and what we don't want again is those boats traveling all over auckland uh, to be spreading that, that and, risk. i'm just more keen um, about that was, spike at the time of the year like when the boats are all getting ready for the summer peak yeah, or whatever yeah that, that's correct. I mean, the Northland Council have got a um, regulation um, that you can't go into a marina um, without having um, proof of yeah, having a new anti-fouling within six months or um, a haul out and clean within one month. And so any boats going north all needed at about the same time. 
And also another thing that hasn't been factored in that sometimes when boats get hauled out, some of them may have to do it fast. Like for instance, a general haul out and clean, uh, and just to clean, can take a matter of hours. Um, as soon as you have to, to apply anti-fouling paint, of course you have to wait for nice weather. You can't you can't do anti-fouling paint when it's raining. And um, frequently you have to pull out the boat, you have to get the propeller done and the propeller shaft with a different application and you have to wait for um, somebody to come along and apply it. The general public don't have the the, the material or the, the tools to be able to do that. And also there might be other issues, like they might have to remove the rudder out of the boat that suddenly takes an extra week. And so sometimes boats might have to be hauled out in the hard stand for a few months because a lot of these people are doing a DIY and they can only do their work on the weekend. And so um, this is something that I don't think that either of the reports on capacity captured. And um, so I'm very concerned about the, the, the information that's being, um, the quality of the information that's being given to um, local boards and council. Um, and I don't think we can make really good solid decisions uh, on this, uh, especially considering if we, we've got Calipera, but I know that there's other um, uh, invasive species that are in the Auckland Harbour, close to the ports of Auckland, in fact the silo port where the classic yachts are, that we don't have those pest species in the Tamaki estuary at this stage, and we don't want them. And if these boats are coming into the Tamaki estuary because they can't get into Orems, um, and they can come into Half Moon Bay because they have capacity, we're increasing the risk of spreading the stuff to the Tamaki Estuary right now. Yeah. And this is the invasive species we've got right now might not actually be the worst invasive species in the world as far as the effect on our environment. Um, this is a very serious problem, and I'm 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 a little bit surprised that we've we happen to be here today to speak about this. Um, we've got the biosecurity rules uh, for hull clean, cleaning. They're, they're really good rules, um, but we don't have the ability to be able to comply. And there's big penalties to boat owners right now if they can't comply. So this is a big problem. I think we need to solve it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Sayers, you have a question? Thanks, Chair. I, th I think uh, Bruce might have answered the questions in terms of his comment. So I'll, ju I'll just probably, look, I was, help I was encouraged to hear that you might be bringing those um, kind of facilitating uh, bring those chairs together to have the chat, and obviously if they can get input from those haulage firms, that would be helpful as well. I'm just aware of an example. Um, this, when you come back to us with anything, is this a little bit wider in terms of maybe overlapping into the regulatory committees and other committees? Uh, for example, in my patch up in Wellsford, I know that they're trying to open you know, haulage facilities and so they're running into difficulties to able to do that through the council. So any any input as uh, and advice and recommendations from you is warmly welcome. So thank you for your efforts. Thank you. Um, one thing I might like to add as well is it's going to be much easier to retain and upgrade the existing haul out facilities than it will be to build new ones. And it's not a question of just looking at oh, where can you do it on the land. It's also what are the tides doing? How deep's the water? Um, is there an ability for the boats to be able to stop somewhere before they they're able to be be hauled out? Um, what are the weather conditions um, in that location? What about the waves? All the rest of it. So it, it's a very very complex matter. So you might be booked to haul out at a particular location on a particular day, but suddenly you've got incumbent weather weather and you have to wait for another week. So these are the sorts of things that also aren't captured in either of the two reports so far. So um, this is a big problem. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Bartley. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm starting to hear that, that it's a, a big problem. I wanted to test the, the comments that this is a regional issue to be solved regionally. How do people on the, in other parts of, of Auckland that have boats clean them? when they're going out into the, the harbour. Do they have these um, stations there or? There's a number of ways that traditionally boats have been um, cleaned. And um, at one stage, the uh, and quite recently, I'm talking within the last probably 20 years, there were just piles sticking out of the water uh, with a concrete pad next to them where the boats would just tie up alongside and wait for the tide to drop out. And then they clean the bottom of the boat. 
Um, they've all been taken away now because of um, concerns about the toxicity of the bio, uh, the uh, anti fouling paint going into the water area. And, and fair enough. Um, so now there's been a move, of course, to restrict people from also cleaning their boats when they're in the water on the mooring. And, and of course, I've done that myself. And um, when it's just barnacles and a slime layer, you're actually allowed to do that. But it doesn't take long. If you leave a boat in the water for six months, you're going to have significant amount of uh, growth on your hull that will require you to haul the thing out of the water. And that's quite expensive. And um, there's a waiting list. And I know of boat owners that have asked to book into more uh, into Orem's um, leading up to summer because they want to cruise up to go up to Northland. And Orem's have said, sorry, we can't haul you up for two months. So um, it, it is a problem. Um, and also, traditionally, a lot of boats a lot of boat owners, they'll, they'll buy a boat, they get all excited about the boat and they don't understand it's a little bit like owning a horse. And a horse needs regular looking after, um, so does a boat. I believe there should be a society for the protection of crawly to boats. <laughs> There's so many neglected boats around Auckland that have got um, their own ecosystem growing on them. And some of those um, those things are fine, like mussels are great, and mussels on moorings that filters the water, all the rest of it. But there's also bad things um, that are growing on these boats. And if they spread these, they shift these boats around, like they're going to have to now because of the new regulations, um, we, we've we've got a problem that we haven't really seen yet. It's 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 coming at us pretty fast because of the new bioregulations. Okay, thank you. I just, I hadn't heard anything from my local board or my communities about this issue, so I, I wanted to find out if this was regional or not. I suppose it's because a lot of people in my ward don't own boats. That's Councillor. right. Um, <coughs> yes, thank sure. you. Uh, Councillor Lee, there's uh, four more questions and we are running uh, well behind, um, so we'll go to Councillor Lee and we'll try and keep the... Uh, we'll cut off questions now. Th thank, you. Thank, you, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, this is really a, a question to the, the director. Um, in terms of the Resource Management Act, there is a clause um, that stipulates councils must comply with their own policy statements and plans. Mm -hmm. And um, if we're not dealing with RMA in regard to the a matter discussed by the, by the um, presentation regarding the Oraiki hard stand. Um, we certainly are um, dealing with it under the Biosecurity Act, and I just wonder, in terms of our regional pest management strategy and plans, whether there is a similar obligation for the Council to comply with, with its own rules in this situation, because I think that would be helpful. There's a, Clearly, we have a situation where an element of, of the council, the um, local board, uh, seems not to be um, complying with at least the spirit and the purpose of our biosecurity and our regional pest management strategy. Thank you. Through, through the chair, um, of course, you're right, uh, Councillor Lee, about uh, councils needing to comply with their own policies. Just a couple of elements of this, and of course, we will be reporting back to you uh, at the end of the month as, as requested in the previous uh, resolution. Um, one question is whether this is a service that council should provide only, or whether this is a service that the market can, can uh, provide. There is nothing legislation that requires council to, to provide this. And obviously council in and of itself as an organisation, if we were talking about us complying, if we had boats, etc., cetera, then and, and we do use boats, we would clearly need to do the right thing and, and comply with our own regulation. But um, in my mind, the first question is, uh, is the provision of hard stand or, or, or the enablement of that, is that a council only, uh, council partly, um, or market only kind of provision? And so... Um, I don't see at the moment that there is any um, direct uh, uh, misalignment or, or non-compliance of, of council in terms of our statutory and regulatory obligations, um, but this really goes to the heart of the matter, I think, that the uh, local board uh, and others have raised today. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Director. I, I, I would venture to say that the market 
is not so much interested in clean holes, but in property development um, in our marina sites. That's, that's a problem. We are the regulator, um, and we have a responsibility over and above that of the marketplace. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Fully. Kia ora. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Damien and Bruce, um, for your input. Um, two questions. Firstly, whether you've raised this issue at TIF at the Tamaki Estuary um, Forum, because I've been a member in the past of that uh, when I was on the local board, and I, I don't recall this ever coming up. So just wondering whether you've had a chance to raise this as an issue with the Tamaki Estuary Forum and the local boards and the community groups involved there. And secondly, if this does require a local response um, and upgrading the existing haul-out facilities and things like that, would your local board support a targeted rate? I'm from my, you know, I used to be the chair of the Otara Paptoi local board, and we do have a targeted rate um, for our swimming pools because that's something that our community thinks and feels is very important, being able to provide that facility. So would your local board consider or support or um, have that in mind if this is a facility that's important to you? Kia ora. Thank you, Chair. Um, first question, um, um, I brought this up with the Tamaki Estuary Pr Protection Society um, uh, executive meeting last week. Um, we have not brought this up at the Tamaki Estuary Environmental Forum um, as a fish, an official discussion document, um, but I think we really do need to. It's um, very important, and um, I think that uh, a number of um, other factors have been happening that have prevented us from doing that. And, and the problem, I guess, for a targeted rate, um, if you were targeting boat owners, you could potentially do that, I guess, through the Auckland Harbour Board um, for moored boats. I don't know how you do it uh, for marinas. Um, and I, I don't know if the general community outside of the boating community would um, um, appreciate having a targeted rate for them, but they may because it is a part of the uh, looking after the general environment. Thank you, Councillor. And I think just for the targeted rate, I think that's probably part, that will be a conversation that we will have with our community um, at the moment while we're consulting on our local board plan. And I think that's a conversation around, um, you know, if we want to take more environmental action and, and do more to protect the town of in our area, maybe we need to think about a targeted rate. Um, but yes, that's something we would consider um, based on community feedback. Kia ora, thank, thank you. you. Kia ora, thank you. Uh, Councillor Ferry. Thank you. Um, just a really quick question, and, and I know what I kind of heard from, from Megan's response there is um, councillors this might fall into the area of discretionary spending. So um, just bring that to your attention. Uh, so my question is in relation to the Manukau Harbour Forum and also the Hauraki Gulf Forum. Um, Councillor Fully just asked about the Tamaki Estuary one, um, but have you had any engagement with those two bodies? Um, I guess we've heard quite a bit about um, the impacts on the Waitamata side, but I, you know, we have Kaipara as well, um, and I'm quite keen that there is a sort of joined up approach which looks at um, those other bodies of water as well. Thank you. Good, Councillor. Uh, no, we haven't had any direct contact with the Manukau or um, Kaipara Harbour um, forums, but as, as noted earlier, uh, part of the plan is to have a conversation with the other local board chairs. Uh, and, and, and see if there is an appetite to have a slightly more regional approach. Um, but one of the reasons for bringing this conversation to the committee today was to um, raise it at a, at a regional level that we, the, our local board believes that it needs a regional response. Um, so, and, and hopefully some of that, uh, some of that will be answered um, through that re uh, report or that review that you've got coming back to your next meeting. Thank Good. you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Fletcher. Oh, thank you. To a degree, my question has already been asked, so um, please indulge me while we have the opportunity with Bruce before us. Um, today would have been my late father's Ted Lee's 100th birthday, 2nd of March, and I was reflecting on him because he came back from the Second World War and set up Lee's Marine, and Lee's Marine has subsequently been sold to Andrews and Bevan, but he did so because 
he wanted to make harbours accessible to everybody and that they not just be elitist. Mm -hmm. Would you like, Bruce, with your experience, to comment on the importance so that voting doesn't become too elitist, whether yes. this would have an impact? Yes, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm very concerned about the direction that this is going because as soon as we start reducing hard stand capacity, um, it's going to increase the um, the need for um, boats to move through the facilities faster. And so that's going to increase the, um, the probability that all work on boats is going to be only carried out by professionals in a professional um, manner. And so it can be faster. And of course, that escalates the cost of owning a boat significantly. Um, this has happened in Sydney and uh, in the west coast of America. And so it has become um, almost impossible for young families to be able to um, own and maintain a moored boat um, because they just they just can't keep up with the costs and it's already expensive to maintain a boat. Um, and I believe it's very important for families to be able to cruise around um, the Hauraki Gulf and North and South um, so that young families and children can engage with the marine environment and understand what it is to see these offshore seabirds and what it, and, and what, what is the health of the Hauraki Gulf, etc. And um, what is it to see a whale in the natural environment or dolphins? And um, I have to say that, you know, I've been brought up cruising on the Hauraki Gulf from um, before I was born pretty much. And um, this summer I'm very depressed about what I've seen in the outer Hauraki Gulf and that's galvanised me to work even harder to try and protect the Hauraki Gulf and advocate for um, protecting the environment, trying to restore it. And, um, and, and I guess that's part of the thing that's triggered my, um, uh, us being here today. Thank you, Bruce. Very appropriate for the City of Sales. Kia thank you, Councillor. Yeah. And I was going to cut it off, but it is your local board, Councillor Stewart, so you um, are able to ask some questions or a question. Oh, thank you, thank you. I won't take too much um, time. Just, just on the targeted rate, um, we were talking about the targeted rate. Um, I don't know whether it would be appropriate for it to be just for the Howick Local Board to have the targeted rate because most of the people that actually use, use it come from all over Auckland. And even 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 from further. So, what what's absolutely. your response? Yeah, I, I absolutely agree, Sharon. And I think that's the um, that's the conversation we need to have with the community and whether or not I suppose uh, the community would be willing to fund a targeted rate to protect the Tamaki Estuary, uh, or whether or not that would be more appropriately done um, as a user pays, um, you know, through the voting users or something like that. But I think it's a, that's a conversation we need to have because obviously cost is a, is always a factor with these things, um, and we're very aware. At the moment, in particular, the council's got some financial challenges, um, and we don't want to add to that. Um, but I suppose there is a, a looming biosec, well, a very real biosecurity risk um, to our area and, and to all of Auckland. Um, and so we're going to have to do something. And unfortunately, most of these things cost money. So it's definitely a conversation that we'll have uh, with our community over the next couple of months, and and I'll just try to understand their appetite. Um, yeah, thank ha you. Happy to move the motion, Mr. Chair. I was going to ask if Councillor Williamson and Councillor Stewart would like to move in second, if that... Yeah. Cool. So, um, thank you, uh, Chair Light, and thank you, Bruce, um, Member Kendall. Um, we appreciate you coming. That was a very fulsome and, uh, presentation and good answers. So, right, we have a mover and a seconder, Councillor Williamson and Councillor Stewart. All those in favour? Aye. Any opposed? No. Right, we have no extraordinary items, and we're just going to move, uh, for everyone's sake, uh, to a quick, say, five or six minute break. We'll be back at five or six minutes past 12 um, for a bathroom break or a tea break. Cool, thank you.
table. Right, I think we've got, um, yeah, we have numbers at the table. Who's coming forward on this one? Um, Sorry. We're just going to do that. Ah, right. So we're just doing um, Kia ora. Um, could I please have order in the court? Um, right, we have uh, Councillor Says has had to leave and he's asked for us to accept his electronic attendance. I have specifically asked if he is driving, he cannot be on the um, attend, but he's on the bus. So while at the period he's on the bus, he can be in the meeting, but driving is not a um, appropriate to be on the meeting and concentrating at the same time. Um, so uh, can I have a, I've got a mover and a seconder, myself and Councillor Dalton. All those in favour? Any opposed? Cool, thank you. Right, we are going now to item eight reporting back on the scope of work, the recent flooding impacts, implications and improvements. Do you want to know how it's up now? Yeah. And so also added some chairs rec as this morning, um, about 45 minutes before, half an hour before the meeting, um, Mayor and some others contacted me about some concerns that we'd already been discussing around plan change 28. So I'll move in. What did I say? Oh, I said 70, maybe I just need to not, um, I need to <laughs> enunciate um, plan change 78. Um, so I'll move in the mayor is going to second and we can talk about that after the, are we going, is Katarina, John and Jacques coming? Megan, is there? Sorry. Is it just Katarina? And John. Did. And John. Thank you. Sorry, Mr Chair, our um, timing is slightly off. <laughs> so Katarina and John are just here. So this is, um, uh, as you said, uh, the approval was provided uh, in between the last uh, committee meeting and today. We've reported this back as we've promised to do. So uh, Katarina and John uh, will do it. Just a quick intro. Um, and answer any questions, um, but it's not a decision as such on the scope that's been done, uh, and um, the chair has, uh, has has put some additional recommendations as well for your consideration. Go yes. Kat. So, yeah, so there isn't a, a presentation as such, um, but the officers are here to answer questions on the scope. Myself, Councillor Dalton, uh, Member Ashby and the Mayor um, have approved the scope, as was um, suggested Last meeting, um, this is to try and get it uh, moving quickly. Um, obviously, it's really important that we get this work underway. Plan Change 78 is a part of um, the our work on this, but we wanted to define and make sure that we were clear about the parts of that that were going to be considered and looked at. So if there are questions um, on this, I, uh, Councillor Darby. Um, so can we just uh, pose a question on the D? Is it appropriate now? Yes. Yeah. Can, can um, Chief of Staff or GM Planning just um, explain to us, are there any implications with that? I'm just cognizant of the back end of the process and the, the pressure that's going to be on the back end of the process. And there is a drop, drop dead date. Um, so just want to have, be confident that we can do that work and meet that drop dead date. Kia ora through Chair, happy to uh, answer that. So that is the drop dead date that we're talking about. So <clears throat> at the moment, um, the Minister requires the uh, independent hearings panel to notify their recommendations by March 2024. That's, that's the timeline that we are, uh, that is suggested in D to request an extension for. So that is that, that deadline that you're talking about, Councillor Darby. That's clear. It's that date. Have we made any soundings of the Minister's office on this to date? Through the Chair, I haven't, but 
the mayor possibly? I talk regularly with the minister, and I'm quite happy to take this and twist his arm. The, the, um, speaking from chair point of view, I do have you know concerns about what this could mean. We have to realise that you know there has been calls to delay or cancel the whole thing. We do not have the ability to do that. Um, we do run the risk if we do not get um, some of this. Uh, approved that we actually won't have enough um, evidence in time to defend our qualifying matters, which are actually very good on floodplains, hazards, coastal erosion. So it's a balance to make sure that we are ensuring that our, our officers have enough information quickly. And so we're hoping that through the hearings panel, they will consider the natural hazards, stormwater management, floodplains at the later stages of the hearings, and that would help us and help staff um, have had that robust information post floods. Um, Councillor Walker. I've got a couple of questions. The first one goes to prioritisation. There's a, a scope of works, the scope of works are quite expansive. Having said that, we know that we need to act now in terms of providing information to this process informing the commissioners about the recent impacts of the floods. So my question goes to prioritisation. Can we apply as much resource to that as we can? And the background to that that you might want to comment on is if we do not do that and Plan Change 78 goes through in its current form, the risk to council the financial effects, the impact on the community in terms of private property and our property will be catastrophic over time. And I'm assuming that we're factoring that in in respect of prioritisation. So my first question is around prioritisation and the need for speed, because obviously we're working the deadlines. Thank you. Uh, Chair, I'll um, respond to that. Um, so paragraph 53 does uh, talk about reviewing our approach to Plan Change 78, um, and that's obviously picked up in the amend amendments here. Um, it's, it's critical that we do um, factor in the recent events and all of the information that we can obtain uh, before we get into mediation and hearings on um, matters relating to hazards under Plan Change 78. Uh, in terms of resource, uh, the the report um, you know, does uh, note that there may be resource implications, but we will certainly be prioritising as, as best we possibly can within our resources to make sure we gather the information and, and make sure we have a really sound approach to Plan Change 78. I think that's the best I can say there. The, the second question I've got goes to the nature of the um, information that we uh, provide to um, inform the hearings panel. My question is, is it possible for us to inform them about the direct effects that people have suffered? To illustrate by way of specific examples within specific catchments, to provide video evidence that is graphic, to actually provide some information that will enable them to comprehend as realistically as they can the nature of what has happened which is one of the worst events that Auckland has experienced. So can we provide that sort of information? Is that allowed within the process? Thank you. Uh, through the chair, um, all, all evidence is um, permissible and um, you know, we will be putting forward the best evidence we possibly can into the hearings. Um, and prior to hearings, there will be uh, inevitably some mediation um, and certainly reporting back to this committee on, um, on what approach uh, officers will be recommending. So, but absolutely, um, all the evidence we can possibly gather will be, th will be thrown at this one and put before the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Newman. Um, good morning. Uh, as it stands today, how confident are you that we are close enough on the, on, the, on the level of information with respect to 
um, hydrological neutrality within uh, to inform the the technical evidence to defend the firstly the qualifying matters as it relates to stormwater, and secondly, are there flood prone areas um, that are not currently identified um, as you know subject to a qualifying matter? Those are the first two questions. Uh, through the chair, it really is um, too early to say. Um, we will obviously be working very closely with staff and healthy waters, uh, the stormwater modelling work that they do, the analysis of the impacts of the flooding that's underway, working with all those involved in the um, response and recovery to make sure we've got as much information as possible. Um, to try and sort of keep it as simple as I can, the, the plan change at the moment looks to roll over all of the protections that are in the unitary plan that would otherwise disappear under the Enabling Housing Supply Act, medium density residential standards and so on. The default would be that there will be no, um, none of those protections in place, but we use the technique of qualifying matters uh, to identify um, flood hazard areas, um, areas of coastal instability, um, coastal erosion areas, uh, coastal inundation areas, other geotechnically unstable areas are all identified in the plan change as being um, qualifying matters and reasons not to necessarily allow the intensification to take place. Um, but whether that's, that goes far enough to address all of the issues out of the recent storm events, that's the bit that's a bit too early to say. And I think your question, um, Councillor Newman, is around, you know, are there some areas that we perhaps haven't identified in the past or, or limitations that don't currently sit in the inventory plan that may need to sit in the inventory plan? And that's, that's a tricky issue as to whether they can come into plan change 78 or not. But certainly the approach in 78 is to roll over all of the natural hazard provisions that we have in the military plan and have them as clear qualifying reasons not to enable the intensification. And so I guess it's, it's one further from my chair. So, I mean, I'm probably delving into hypothetical here. So are you suggesting that um, there is a mechanism for the introduction of variation within the plan change 78, or is this a situation whereby this might need to be as best we can get it on plan change 78 and the subsequent plan change immediately thereafter. Uh, thanks. Um, through the Chair, I addressed to some extent in the report, can't recall the exact um, paragraphs, but th there are um, statutory or legal limitations uh, in terms of what, what you can do under plan change 78, and that would apply to even doing a, a variation or an amendment to plan change 78. The um, intensification approach under the RMA is, uh, is somewhat constrained. It is, as you'd expect, about enabling more housing and using qualifying matters to temper that. It's not about necessarily introducing new restrictions that, uh, that didn't apply pre-Plan 78. So it may be the case that through this uh, work discussed in the report that there is a phase, a subsequent phase of amending the entry plan through an entirely separate plan change not under the intensification provisions in the RMA, but a standalone plan change. And it may be that even that runs into some difficulties that we would need to discuss with the government around other some legislative statutory reforms that may be necessary. So um, it, it's, there are limitations to what you can do in 78 to address hazards. The baseline is to try and roll over what we have in the unitary plan, to start introducing a wide range of new controls, to start becoming quite problematic, and even a variation to plan change 78, as I've said, would likely come unstuck from a legal point of view, and it would have to be a separate plan change. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I'll go to the Mayor Brown now. Okay, thanks for this. The, um, I, th I think the work that we're going to do will identify that the um, natural hazards and stormwater management impacted areas are rather larger than what we thought they were. We do have absolute information about where um, stormwater um, inundation occurred. I'm working quite well closely with the Insurance Council and they're giving me information about where the, the number of houses, where the claims are, and that information will be added to what you're going to present um, because it's irrefutable um, and it, it has some impact on costs and sizes and it's lists uh, suburb by suburb the non-habitable homes uh, we, know, we know where they are on both and we will be um, 
land stability runs beyond stormwater management. In some ways, it's just a little bit of pity that the um, process has got ahead of itself slightly, but this is in time for us to actually offer excellent um, information. I think BC and D allow that to happen. I have no problem in ringing and uh, contacting the Minister about an extension of time at the moment, and if, if this doesn't grant an extension of time, then um, that will show to be rather an obstinate behaviour, and who knows, that they might not get an extension of time and then their jobs later in the year if they don't follow this one up, but that's another issue. Um, so I, I support the additional parts of this, and just as I supported very much the work of the Planning Commission into um, doing a full examination of the impacts of what's happened in the last month. It does change things for Auckland, uh, and it would be, uh, um, I think it would be a foolish um, group to oppose that we go through this carefully, fully, and I do support BC and D added on to A. Thank you very much. Kia ora, thank you, Mayor. I'll take that as comments. Um, Councillor Fletcher, questions? Thank you. Um, I, I'm going to ask some questions, and I don't want to compromise my ability to speak, but could I ask them in the context of the gratitude that I feel to you and to the Mayor for entertaining these amendments that we're looking at today? Because for the average person in the street, they don't know what Section 32 means, they don't know what Plan Change 78 means, and in the ward that Julie Ferry and I represent, where we have a large number of stickered properties, they are disinterested in that level of detail. They just want to know that we are pausing to stop and reflect whilst Hawke's Bay is quite properly taking media attention. Um, the lives of people are still being dramatically affected. The world changed for us on anniversary weekend. So the questions that I'm wanting to pose are not meant to be in any way vexatious. They're just simply for me to be able to understand and the gratitude I feel that there has been a maturity to understand the importance of actually these amendments. So a, th a few things um, spring to mind for me and that comes into this issue of qualifying matters. So if I'm to read the amendments that we're looking at here. So when we look at natural hazards, stormwater, infrastructure provision, including transport, what we saw because of the floods, we, we did have some good work undertaken on qualifying matters, but what we saw with the floods is really these were region-wide. So to what extent um, are we going to be able to brief the Plan Change 78 Independent Hearings Panel on our ability or the desire to, to fund new infrastructure requirements and how they should interpret qualifying matters in light of the anniversary weekend floods. Through the chair, shall I give that one a crack, John? Um, that's a great question, Councillor Fletcher. Uh, what these recommendations say is that we will be bringing that work back to you to understand exactly what happened and where, and then whether we f um, you feel that these the policy settings, you know, the, the margins around these things and where things are built and how, whether that needs to change. That would feed into Plan Change 78 when we get to that part of the hearing, and of course um, recommendation C is is asking for, for whatever, whenever that matter comes that it's later on so that we're able to do this work first and you're able to provide a position on it. John has also mentioned that the restrictions on Plan Change 78 that the government has put into its to the provisions means that you can't uh, make areas any more restrictive than they already are in the unitary plan. So, for example, if there is an area where right now in the unitary plan, um, let's say it says there's flooding, but for whatever reason, um, uh, the, the committee wants to make that more restrictive, so perhaps try and prohibit building there or, or something like that, then that's not going to be able to be done as part of Plan Change 78, and that was to John's point about, so it might be that we need to do another whole plan change process yeah. to change the unitary plan. 
So it gets really tricky. So I'm sorry, it it's not an easy answer. I, I but really, you know what I mean? I, I know really you, appreciate yeah. that, Megan, because I suppose in life ideal, if we are a creature of statute, we are required to do certain things. We delegated to the independent hearing panel, so all we can do is request of them now, we would like them to consider these things. It's costly to have independent hearings panel, and what we now know is with the floods, um, some of the information that they will have been working for is no longer accurate. It disadvantages submitters, and, and one of the Next questions I had for you, do you think that this is going to prejudice submitters because it's really costly to participate in these processes? What is it that we can expect from the public and community groups in their participation? Look, absolutely through the chair, and I guess that's, uh, and that's what the chair is uh, raising, I guess particularly with, well, B and C, is that can we just, can we discuss this? Because council, as you say, is only one party to this. There's, there's community out there as well. So can we discuss all of this together under the auspices of the Independent Hearings Panel at a time uh, once we have, have provided you more advice and, and there's a better understanding? And we can, of course, pass that on um, to the community and specific applicants at the same time. So that's really what, you know, as a result of B, that's what kind of C is saying. Can we push that out to make sure that there is a more... Uh, a, co a conversation or a discussion that happens that everybody's got the same level of information on now, particularly if council's going to change its position or change something in that. I would like to do more of a deep dive into that, but I don't want to monopolise time um, today and let others have an opportunity. And at one level, you want to have an emotional response to this, but at another level, I appreciate that we're working through a process and, and through legislation. Um, but might I know when we could know the cost to Council and Water Care of repairing the damage to infrastructure mm. arising from the recent storm damage? Mm. I don't think that's an unreasonable question. Through the Chair, it's not unreasonable at all. I'm just not sure if I've got an answer. Do we know? I, I, look, I know we are working that through still, but Katerina might know. I know that Mark Izzard has some high-level preliminary figures after this meeting. We will get in touch with them to talk about when they may become before the committee. They have had some very high level discussions about um, what it would cost to reinstate and what would it cost to build back better, but I think they'd prefer to be able to come directly to you and talk that through. So we I can... think the public have a right to know on that, so it would be really important for me um, that we can, when it's appropriate, have that information publicly available because I don't know, and maybe the Mayor can tell me what provision is proposed for either in the current draft budget. In terms of trying to estimate the cost, um, we've, we've got our staff working on what the cost of our things is as best that they can. I'm closely working with the Insurance Council. I have a formal meeting with them again on Tuesday next week because they're actually a pretty good clearinghouse of where the first chunks of money are going to come in and they also give us a very good idea about where things are which will also inform one of the things that worries me is that we're going to find that the stormwater management um, cutouts in the uh, current one don't cover everywhere which has suddenly become a stormwater issue and I think um, Megan's laid out that that has some implications which may um, mean that lead to a, a a complete plan change, which is why another string to the bow of what I'm going to ring the Minister and suggest that he grants an extension of time, because rushed decisions in the midst of complicated issues never give good results. And so um, I think this gives us as much grunt as we need at this stage it's just unfortunate that the plan change 78 process has got itself underway, not because of anything the council's done, that's the legislation which has been foisted upon us. Legislation which I'm not at all keen or happy on, I might say. But that's what governments do when you let them sit in rooms in Wellington. Thank you for your intervention and your leadership 
on this, therefore, to enable us to potentially pivot, if we can, at some point. Megan, just before I conclude, because I, I'll take more questions, if I'm allowed, after everyone else has had a go, but prior to the anniversary weekend floods, what was the additional cost of providing the necessary infrastructure to service the new living zoning proposed in Plan Change 78 before the world change? Through the chair, I'm not sure we've got an answer for that either, but I'm going <laughs> to flip to John because that's what I can do. Yeah. Thanks. Um, okay. <laughs> well, um, plan change is an enable development, and I guess this particular plan change is looking at enabling development over a 20 to 30 year plus period. That's the government um, policy, really. It's a long term enablement. Um, so the assessment of the costs of um, providing all the infrastructure for all of that development is, um, is not a figure that we really have. It's, um, it's just something that's very difficult, if not impossible, to um, calculate. So it's an iterative um, exercise of providing inf infrastructure in line with where the development's occurring, committed projects, but uh, no, we don't have a, an answer to that, unfortunately, Council. We don't, know. No, that's really helpful. And finally, to the Mayor, um, could you bring um, to your negotiations with the Minister and also the Minister of Finance what the urgency is of deciding Plan Change 78 when the Auckland Unitary Plan addresses demand for the next 30 years? Well, I'm doing my best to highlight that not only the issues that you raise, but in fact I think that the growth figures are heroic. Um, uh, where they're, where the, they're wanting to do it is not necessarily where it will occur or where we even want it. Uh, I think we'll also be highlighting the point that um, the Environment Court has overruled the district plan in a number of cases to the detriment of the city. Uh, there are people in red two houses at Mirawai at the moment in an area which the Rodney Council attempted to prevent to be developed and so that the Environment Court itself has sticky fingers on these things. The, this uh, whole issue is going to require much more thinking than what it's been given. And I would be very, very surprised if the government aren't on both sides, because it's a cross-party issue, this one, you must remember. Um, oh, and thank you for your leadership in remaining for this item today, because I know you were meant to be out west in Karikari, but speaking personally, I really appreciate your presence and your leadership here today. Thank you. That's good. I thought it's important I'll sit this one out, then I'm going to go and look at wrecked houses for the afternoon. Sure. Sure, Councillor. Thank you for your questions. And um, yeah, I think it, uh, it's important to reinforce, um, and this is what these uh, additional resolutions are about, to reinforcing what's in the agenda. Uh, uh, we are specific around having to review and increase um, the focus on Plan Change 78, but because of what Megan has said, we c Plan Change 78 is sort of the red herring for trying to improve areas or reduce um, stuff from the unitary plan side of things. So that's what the broader set of um, options we've got and work commissioned in this, because it could mean quick plan changes. We're in discussion, I've been in discussion with various ministers around potential for emergency powers or potential for managed retreat, all those sort of things that could happen hopefully quicker than a normal plan change if we're truly wanting to give people options quickly. But all of that work has to be done with the data that we can find. Um, thank thank you very much, possible. Mr Chair, for your explanation on that, because for some of us, we would have liked to have seen staging with the Auckland Unitary Plan, and certainly it seems incredible to me that we're not thinking about staging in terms of moving forward, but I really appreciate um, the opportunity to speak on this. Thank you. And to, I think, um, cost, I asked Barry for some figures around even just healthy waters. I think it was 3,500 requests for service in the first three weeks since the the floods, which is pretty phenomenal, and about 3,700 tonnes of waste that's been picked up, um, as well as obviously the houses that we've got there. Next question, we've got Councillor Henderson. Thank you. I've got a couple of questions here. Um, 
there's been, a, I think, quite a bit of misunderstanding around what Plan Change 78 does in relation to natural hazards and floodplains. So could I just ask you firstly to remind the committee what the status quo is for us regarding the qualifying matter relating to building on floodplains? What did we go to the IHP with? Uh, through the Chair, um, the plan change identifies the floodplain rules that sit in the injury plan that require a resource consent to be applied for to develop in a floodplain. Uh, the plan change identifies that as a qualifying matter. So that particular rule that sits in the injury plan that says you cannot develop as of right in the 1% AEP, a 100 year floodplain, um, it is tagged as a qualifying matter. So that, that's the first one. Um, similarly, with um, uh, areas uh, near coastal cliffs, there is a rule that sits in the injury plan and that is tagged in Plan Change 78 as a qualifying matter so that someone would still require resource consent when building in proximity to uh, cliff, cliffs uh, uh, for uh, Coastal inundation, taking into account sea level rise, there are rules that sit in the energy plan and Plan Change 78 has identified those rules as a qualifying matter so that someone cannot develop in those areas as of right without a resource consent. And there are um, a couple of others, um, perhaps a bit more obscure around just general land stability and, and steep slopes that are also tagged as qualifying matters. So those natural hazard rules, that whole package that's uh, sitting in the energy plan is essentially rolled over into Plan Change 78 and tagged as a qualifying matter so that anyone building in that area would need the resource consent. Thanks, that's very useful. Um, so if the, all of these matters are already qualifying matters that we're planning to essentially roll over, what do we expect to achieve, to achieve with more time? I'm asking staff. <laughs> um, so, um, when it comes, so I've talked about the natural hazard rules that sit in the entry plan and, and that they have been rolled over. Zoning is a key part of the entry plan, as, as I think we all know. And we have attempted to apply a low density zoning to many of the areas that we know are subject to natural hazards, such as flooding. It may be that um, we could apply that low density zone more widely, and there are submissions. Uh, seeking that that low density zoning is applied more widely for hazard reasons. So that, that is an issue that we need to explore. So that, that's probably the key one. Yes, we've tagged the correct rules. There are limitations, as you've heard from Megan and I, about sort of applying new rules through 78 for natural hazards. But have we got the right approach to zoning is probably the fundamental thing that as planners we're thinking through now. Um, there are submissions saying that there should be no low density residential zone at all and that the hazard rules are sufficient. Uh, for example, Kanga Ora submission takes that approach that low density zoning shouldn't be used. The hazard rules are sufficient. We've got a hybrid approach in 78, a bit of both, but um, you know, potentially there may be an argument for using that low density zone more widely in hazard areas. Okay, look, I could ask several more on that point, but I think I might leave it. Um, just probably one question, Chair. So if we're looking at a review here, housing demand doesn't change, whatever, we, whatever zone we put on these things. So will this review be focused on further restriction of housing, or are we going to consider allowing more housing to be enabled than is currently in place in areas that are not risk of flooding? Well, that's a really broad question. So um, submissions on the plan change 78 are uh, are seeking more intensification, so that's that's an issue that the council will, will have to uh, consider as we go through the hearings. Uh, and then we have the submissions that I mentioned saying we're not doing enough for natural hazards. So it'll be about um, striking the right balance there. But I guess the focus of this report um, is really um, on the agenda today is about have we got the right approach to natural hazards broadly, and 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 in terms of 78, have we got the right approach? Um, no, we're not, we're not suggesting a focus of um, restricting um, opportunities for housing through this piece of work here. Okay, thank, thank you. Just one follow-up, and thank you, Chair, for this. Um, so through this approach, we might be looking at either downzoning or indeed red zoning areas that might be flood-prone and uh, hazard-prone, and it wouldn't be responsible for us to build there. Um, I guess I'm just wondering if we're looking to do that and essentially restrict supply, wouldn't it be responsible to then look at the other areas where we might want to increase supply because they're safe and, and they're okay and we want to encourage development in safe areas? 
th through the chair and, and to the committee. Um, you may recall presentations in the past about the, um, the baseline unitary plan already enables 20 to 30 years worth of housing. If you add in plan gen 78, we're taking it well beyond that. So if through the um, work around natural hazards, there are some additional constraints uh, that council puts forward to the hearings panel or potentially through a plan change, it would have to be a widespread significant constraint to really have any big impact on the overall capacity for housing that sits in the unitary plan already as operative and augmented by plan change 78. So I wouldn't at this point in time suggest that there, there will be a need to look at um, <coughs> enabling considerably more intensification purely off the back of natural hazards. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you for clarifying. And I think a further clarification for me and for the public is that what, what this review is about is ensuring we have more evidence, or I guess more backed up evidence for our current qualifying matters through what we've seen. Staff need that because there are large submitters, um, won't name them, who don't want any qualifying matters or low density zones. So we will need to have that more um, you know, we can say these are our floodplains, but now we have a lot of evidence that will back up why. But it's very, to be very clear, the Plan Change 78 piece of the review of the overall list of things we're commissioning cannot downzone from the unitary plan. We cannot go, that would have to be another tool or, or working with government or another plan change. We can't go, we can't downzone any areas from the unitary plan rules through Plan Change 78, but it has to be part of it. This is why Councillor Dalton and I through consultation with the Mayor a month ago, put Plan Change 78 in as part of the, the number of items because it need, we need to make sure we have that clear evidence and have the tools for our officers who will be presenting on why we have those qualifying matters in there. And we can prove by pictures, uh, essentially, in some cases, or, yeah. So, um, Councillor Ferry. Thank you. A uh, couple of questions from me. Um, a couple of my colleagues have mentioned um, the importance of people being able to have their say in the in the um, plan change process. Obviously, that now sits with the hearings panel and not with us. Um, yeah, that, that work has been passed over to them. But I did wonder if, um, particularly in regard to the groups that uh, have signed the petition, um, I would imagine that most, if not all of them, are currently submitters. Do we have any sort of idea on that? Because that will be a, a, um, a mechanism for them to make sure that these points are raised through the hearing process. Do we have any information on that? Unfortunately, Councillor, um, no, I don't. But I, I suspect you're right. The number of the groups would be submitters. So, um, but we'd have to come back to you on that to confirm oh. of those who signed the petition, how many are actually um, submitters. Yes. Yeah. I think that would be useful information for governing body members to have that might sort of give some reassurance about some of those issues of, of the information being able to be put in front of the panel. The um, other query I have is, um, I, I, I've raised this uh, in the emergency committee as well, I'm a little bit um, concerned about in the case of some of the stickering, are we relying on self-reporting from um, homeowners um, for those for those building assessments because I'm particularly worried about renters who don't necessarily, um, yeah, might, they might say to the landlord, hey, I think the house needs checking. Um, and the landlord says, yep, sure, I'll get onto it. And then for whatever reason does not. Um, and so we may not have accurate data in that space. So that's something I'd be keen to understand in this context of how we're gonna look at um, other reporting mechanisms beyond the RBAs. Um, to identify where um, the flooding was particularly acute. Through the chair, um, uh, I, I will take that. I, I, I just know, um, trying to channel in Craig Hobbs, I know that where there was, there was obviously a, <coughs> a weather event, we obviously went kind of house by house with that. Yep. But yes, we, we have asked for call out to say, if you are concerned about your house in any way, please kind of let us know. So there's a little bit of both. But if you need more information, I'll need to ask Craig to come back to you on that. Yeah, I think we might just need to look at some comms to, to renters in particular who may not otherwise be that empowered in this space. Um, my final question is um, around the, the impact of this in regard to uh, the areas um, which are primarily in uh, Councillor Fletcher and my ward um, that are actually whited out from Plan Change 78 because of the light rail corridor. 
Um, I'm aware of some significant flooding that happened under the whited out bits. Um, also some significant areas, as Councillor Henderson points to, that um, performed really well on the flooding. So how will this potentially interact with um, the fact that we've got that big whited out area through the isthmus? Thank you. Thanks, um, through the Chair. Um, so as you may recall, um, the reason for that um, whiteout area through the isthmus and out to um, South Auckland, Margaret and out to the airport is um, because we're waiting for confirmation of the um, preferred uh, route for the light rail project and the stations along that route. And until we get that information, you can't really do the intensification plan change properly. So we've made, as Council, that decision in the last um, term to exclude that area. Uh, indications are around about the middle of this year, we should have the, the route and stations confirmed. Um, once um, Auckland Light Rail lodge the notice of requirement for the route and the stations, that's the trigger for uh, Council to initiate the plan change to fill in that white area, and that will come back to this committee and issues around hazards, um, qualifying matters, and where we're at with the hearings on the rest of the region um, would factor into that, the <coughs> development of that plan change. So that, that's the process there. We wait for the notice of requirement to be lodged for Light Rail, then we come, come to you as a committee with a recommended plan change, and, and that plan change would uh, be under the same constraints as Plan Change 78. There is a limit to what we can do around natural hazards, but certainly the, the default approach of rolling over all of the existing hazard controls and having a bit of a zoning approach to hazard areas would be likely in that plan change. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Turner. No, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm lost in the technicalities of all this. It seems um, uh, I'd reserve my right just to make a comment if I can later. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, Councillor Lee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. We seem to be coming to the end of questions, but so I'd, uh, if I could, it might save time if, if I make a comment and, and, and a question all in one package. Uh, well, Try and make a question, and then, uh, but I won't, I'm not keen on you having your five minutes speaking turn right now. I support, uh, before I get to the question, I just want to say I, I support the, the recommendations, Mr Chair. It, we're, we're sensibly seeking briefing space from the government as we assess the consequences of these unprecedented extreme weather events. And I might say so, um, having... Often, having gone through um, a civil emergency, maybe maybe we can understand the wisdom of those good councillors in Christchurch who totally rejected the yeah. national policy statement at the start. But it, I think th there is concern that um, this has been imposed on Auckland, um, that Parliament, and I'm talking about the, all the major parties except for ACT, I believe, um, uh, are joined together in, in this approach currently, um, that they in effect have undertaken a district plan change somewhat, somewhat bizarre. But anyway, I think leaving aside criticisms of Parliament, I think we have to look at our own role. And it was interesting to see in the trade journal One Roof that Auckland Council approved 2,223 dwellings last year in hazard zones and floodplains, which is 9% of the consents issued. So we've been engaged with the property industry in a risky game. And the people um, who are faced with the consequences are people whose homes and savings have, some, have been ruined. And you could describe they've been red stickered. And there's some 7,000 people homeless in Auckland as a consequence. Of, of, of these weather events. Now, it's interesting, I had a call from a, a senior figure in the government about a local matter, and it's interesting to see the perspective from the government side. Um, and they're particularly, this person was particularly concerned about a development um, currently under application for 12 townhouses in an area that I saw extremely badly damaged in the recent floods. Um, and yet this is still going on. The person, the senior person in the government thought um, from her perspective that under the national policy statement, floodplains 
uh, hazard zones were a qualifying matter, so what was going on. So that's interesting. I suspect um, this approach um, long predates uh, the national policy statement. So my, my question is, uh, in, in regard to um, the, the townhouse development at 38 Sackville Street, which no doubt you'll be aware of, because that's right adjacent to where um, pensioners had to be evacuated and just downstream from a number of red stickered homes, whether that's part of the national policy statement and the operative part of Plan Change 78, or is it Auckland Council business as usual? Question, Mr Chair. It may be hard to answer the specific yeah. address, but did you want to try on that question, John? Yeah, uh, Chair and um, Councillor Lee, it's, it's, yeah, well, unfortunately we can't answer the um, question about that specific property. I'm not aware of the, the facts around that one. What may be of use is just to recap that the one aspect of Plan Change 78 that um, applied straight away at the point of public notification was uh, the medium density residential standards. So if it's a if it's in a three-storey medium density residential area and there are no qualifying matters applying to that property, then the way that the um, government um, prepared the amendment to the RMA is that they get the benefit of that medium density straight away. But it may be the Sackville property uh, is in an area that's tagged in 78 as a qualifying matter, in which case they don't get the benefit of um, plan change 78 until it gets right the way through the hearings and council decision making next year. But if it's a piece of property that is free of any qualifying matters in Plan Change 78, then uh, they do get the benefit of immediate um, benefit of the permitted three dwellings, three storeys high. So we, we'd have to look into the specifics of that case. Mr Chairman, can I, I just um, remind the meeting that um, another disaster, a natural disaster, I guess, at Fakari, White Island, the court of inquiry is just getting underway now, so the the, the, the wheel, wheels of time grow slowly, but they can, can grind slowly, but they can grind exceedingly small. And I think we have to to be prudent um, about our own role um, in this matter. Um, and I think the breathing space we that you are recommending that we seek from the government also should apply to the way. We are issuing consents, and we are allowing or not allowing public notification, and not allowing in this case, um, on on these matters because um, there's going to be repercussions, I'm sure, um, from people who are getting rates bills soon, who cannot live in their houses, um, who are homeless, but they still will be paying rates. They bought their homes on consented properties in good faith. Um, and so I think the breathing space we are seeking from the government, and quite wisely, should apply to ourselves as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. I have three more questions, uh, and then we'll move uh, to the debate. Councillor Watson. Yeah, thanks, thanks Mr Chair. Um, just a, a couple of questions on the uh, proposed scope as it um, as it applied to the paper that was uh, went to the you know delegated uh, members is is the notion that this plan change 78 considers largely or, or slightly um, slightly affected by recent events is is that identified as a risk when we go to you know risks and mitigation is, is the fact that there isn't too much response to anything we choose to put up. Is that identified as a risk? So through the chair, that is not identified as a risk within the risk section of the report. It's a, it's a requirement and a legislative aspect that John and the team have to go through when processing their reassessment. So there are legal container that your decisions, IHP decisions, are operating within. Yeah, so, so I guess, you know, just kind of speaking in pragmatic terms, and certainly from a public point of view, 
I, I would think that the public expectation would be that you know there's something a really meaningful response now and within this this kind of phase one timeline of uh, eight to twelve weeks we're told and, and I say that because because when I look at our other submissions uh, to you know the MPSUD and the medium density provisions um, in my reading of it we, we've all, we've already um, alluded to um, if not on a scale that we experience but at least the possibility that there's unintended consequences so if I look at that paper we had our submission in just March we talk about um, you know damaging the livability of the city for Aucklanders unintended consequences when we go to water care uh, we talk about um, you know, development occurring that water care is not, not hasn't planned for, doesn't have the infrastructure needs. Uh, we talk about infrastructure funding and financing, exacerbating challenges, uh, and you know, in some respects, we you know we use terms like a strong view um, that this runs contrary to core objectives, uh, work against the functioning of urban environment. Um, result in poor quality build outcomes that reduce livability for residents, a whole lot of stuff about infrastructure. So I guess for anyone looking on and, and for anyone within uh, making commentary, they haven't listened or didn't listen to that, and that was made by experts, you know, they were not just council, there was all manner of, you know, planners, infrastructure, consult, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I guess my concern in this is that... Um, that it may well proceed along lines that don't alter fundamentally. And that's politically driven. We're in a hearings process or going into a hearings process now. Um, so I guess I would really like to know, and, and particularly as it goes to this phase one, which um, outlined in that paper again, you know, has a, has a lot of briefings going on when we talk about what we're doing. No, a legal briefing on council's liability, a briefing on council's approach to consenting, a briefing on council requirements, a briefing on climate change scenarios. Uh, this is the next 12 weeks. I guess, um, you know, we're sure we're going to review the approach to proposed plan change 78, but I guess if I was sitting in the public gallery today and listening to this, I'd be wanting to know, given that in the qualifying matters I took to be entirely inadequate, certainly for my ward, entirely inadequate. So if it's just a tinkering round with the status quo of, of our submission as far as qualifying matters go, then I don't think we're really taking account of what's, what's happened just recently. So that's what I'm really seeking, John, is some sort of response to that. OK. Oh, Person. Uh, thanks, Chair. Councillor Watson. Yeah, I, really, just to reiterate, um, we're in this process with Plan Change 78. We have submissions for and against. We have some submissions on more intensification, some on restrictions on natural hazards, some for those restrictions, some against. So that's going through a process that has limitations on what we can do with a general baseline of we, we can't improve on what's in the unitary plan pre-78. We, we essentially have to rely on that and, and, and rely on uh, certain provisions in, in, in the operative unitary plan as being qualifying matters. However, um, through this broader piece of work, it may be that we identify that the operative unitary plan um, needs to be amended, and that would need to, for reasons of natural hazards, and that would need to be addressed through a separate plan change that we would have to do regardless of Plan Change 78 being going through its process. So we really need to make the best of Plan Change 78 and the submissions on that. Um, this isn't going to Parliament unless the Council rejects the recommendations of the panel. It's going to, and because the Minister, not Parliament, it's going to our own Council-appointed independent hearing commissioners and then back to Council next year once they've considered the submissions. That's, that's Plan Change 78. So um, I think there's a lot of potential to, um, to work with the information we receive, put a very strong case before the independent hearings panel, um, but if there are matters that we simply can't address because of the limitations under the statute on 78, then we would have to pick that up and have it as a separate plan change. And I think just to clarify again, Councillor, this is 
why Councillor Dalton and I in consultation with the Mayor and Deputy Mayor a month ago, we were clear that Plan Change 78 needed to be a slice of this whole program, but it needed to be far broader, far wider, all regulatory look at our the, the full plan, unitary plan, and discussions, potentially emergency powers and things with government, because Plan Change 78 can only is only one tiny piece of the issue here that we need to deal with. If we need dramatic changes to where we are allowing housing or wider floodplains and all those sorts of things, that is not addressed through Plan Change 28, uh, 78. Now I'm saying 28. <laughs> That's not addressed through Plan Change 78 at all, and we can't require or even cons the independent hearing commissioners cannot consider downzoning or expanding qualifying matters that didn't exist before Plan Change 78. So that's, that's the issue here, is that I think a lot of people think it's going to crack all of the nuts, but actually we need to look at this, protect our qualifying matters, and then use other tools through this process very quickly, far quicker than maybe we've ever done before, um, in response to the floods. And that's why I, I guess we've got a bit distracted on Plan Change 78 because it's so front of mind, but it's actually got to be far broader and we'll probably need government help um, if we're wanting to do any sort of drastic moves around manage retreat or, or, or those sort of things. We just can't do that on our own very or very quickly. Um, did you have more questions? I'll, I'll reserve the right to speak. I think that it's probably more appropriate. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Darby. And then Councillor Newman. Uh, thanks. Um, question, maybe two. Um, and um, Chair, you've sort of just led into um, what I was... What, what, wanting to ask uh, Megan about was here we're responding slash reacting to plan change 78 but I'm mindful that we've got other council led plan changes particularly say 79 and 80 uh, 79 is on transport infrastructure probably doesn't touch this area but 80 is on resilience to climate change um, 82 and 83 aren't rele relevant but no doubt there's going to be some others that are already underway, council-led, there's private plan changes, there's uh, fast-track consent applications, gateway tests, all of that. So, Megan, for you, uh, of course it's natural that 78 is top of mind, but there are others. And are we... Is there merit in tweaking this so that we actually capture, if we can, the other plan changes or other processes which are underway because there's a lot more than just 78. Through the Chair, you're, yes, you're right. Uh, and that was referenced in the, uh, uh, the previous planning committee resolution that you made, which has resulted um, in the scope. So, for example, it was 78 to... 80-something, five, three, three yes, um, the numbers. Um, we also, I know, had a discussion about what does this mean for consents in the process or, or plan changes in the process. Uh, and so part of this in both phase one and two will cover that, but ultimately it is really until the council makes any decisions to change its policy settings, so to change the... Um, intensity or reduce intensity or somehow change the patterns or expectations of building, can that really then lead to changes in, you know, regulatory documents, um, consents, plan changes, all that kind of thing. So it's a little, it's not quite rock and a hard place, but it's, it's a little bit trying to understand what we can do now versus what we need changes in policy to occur, which would then obviously impact you know, everything, or it would result in a process like a plan change that would have um, a much broader impact. I, I get that. Uh, it's just, I, I just can't recall the detail of, say, plan change, I think it's 80, which is resilience to climate change. Maybe that's a, one that um, uh, is important to th think about here. We're, we're not actually asking the commissioners that have probably been appointed to that one to put things on hold until such time as we have this information come in. Now, there may be others. I mean, are we thinking that through? I understand that we will do things later once we've examined the situation, 
but I'm just wanting to have some assurance that we're not letting things out of the gate um, because we haven't mentioned it other than 78 yet. We're not mentioning Plan James 80, for example. I understand that. Um, John, do you think there would be any particular benefit in referencing, oh, sorry, benefit clarity in representing the other plan changes? Uh, clearly, when we when we write to the Independent Hearings Panel and the Minister, it would be for the work that the Independent Hearings Panel has been asked to do, which is all of those plan changes. But, John, do you think that would be seek clarification? Um, thanks, Megan. Thanks, Councillor Darby. Yep, just thinking that one through. So it really is of the of the package of plan changes um, Council notified um, in August, September last year. Um, plan change 78 is probably the one that it's probably the only one that really picks up on this issue of um, natural houses, climate change. And it's, it's a change to the regional policy statement. It's just really beefing up some of our policies around climate that sit in the regional policy statement at the moment. I'm, certainly in terms of going to the minister, that's not relevant because it's, it's not under the same streamlined um, process. It's a, it's a standard council plan change. It is being heard by the same commissioners, so I'm just wondering whether maybe in C there might be some wording that... Um, you know, we would want to consider an opportunity to have the benefit of the information that we're getting from the recent storm events feeding into the plan change 70, uh, 80 as well. So I can, I can see 80 potentially um, a discussion with the panel around the timing of hearings on 80. Um, there would be some benefit to that. Um, so is it just 80 or are there other things like... Are there private plan changes or are there other council-led plan changes that... I mean, look, I don't have them all in my head, John. I'm sure you don't either. But so there's, I guess there's the, a lot underway. I guess the issue is, and, and it was really about highlighting Plan Change 78 because there had been some concern that we were not dealing with that. We were always, even before you put these three up there, dealing with this on every single plan change we are, we are doing. What this says is that we're just asking the overall part of the hearings around natural hazards and stormwater management to be sort of at the end or, or, or pushed as far out as possible through the myriad of hearing dates, um, which will be, I think, decided next week. That, 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 so there's enough time for evidence to be presented. We're not asking for a full halt. No, I know that. Look, plan change 80 is relevant here in, in my eyes. Um, and we're not referring to it. If, and John, if we could just follow through with maybe your suggested words. Okay. Right. Yep. And, and can I just say, in terms of private plan change or any other plan change, absolutely. As um, you know, as officers, we will be looking very carefully at whether um, the recent events have any bearing on the evidence that council puts to the hearings on those plan changes. So um, I think. Hopefully you can take that as a given that, um, as professionals, we'll be looking very carefully at whether there's anything new we might need to say. Yep. Thank you. Um, could does that leave uh, Plan Change 80? You said you were going to... No, no, no. Um, Me Megan said that she was putting okay. it in. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Newman. Um, a little bit wider of this, but... Um, John, I just... Oh, friend Andrew McKenzie and, and the team from Kainga Ora, um, they were one of the submitters that has been quite radical in terms of seeing no place for the single house precinct. So can I ask, I mean, operation, you might not know this, but in light of the Auckland anniversary flooding events, have we, have, have they sought to, have they given notice of their intention to revise or withdraw that particular submission um, given what has happened, and including what has happened to their portfolio? Uh, no, we haven't received any advice of that sort and not aware of them doing that. I'd be quite surprised if they did, but... Um, it's... Yep. Um, Councillor Fletcher, last, last question. <laughs> thank, thank you. Um, my question is to Megan. Um, uh, I just want to understand, within the 
the delegation that we've given to the independent hearings uh, panel and the amendments that are up or the, the motion that is up there today, um, what input will you have into the um, pre-hearing conference that's scheduled for the 6th of March and what briefing will you give those commissioners and can you advise whether any of those commissioners have an engineering background? Through the chair, John, I'll just put you on notice about the engineering background question. Um, so look, in terms of the pre-hearing conference, uh, council will be um, uh, represented uh, and so we will put together our uh, positions based on this conversation, clearly uh, on the timing matters, so we will reflect that directly to the Commissioner, uh, to the Independent Hearings Panel. Um, so we are um, directly represented and we will directly speak to them. Um, we are also happy to answer any questions that they might have in terms of clarification or, or, a, or even a representation of this conversation because there is more that has been discussed here today than is just written down, obviously, in four recommendations. So we'll ensure that that's an accurate representation of this conversation. Um, Will John, you be present yourself? Uh, I wasn't going to be, um, but I'm happy for any feedback on that from the committee, if, that would, if you wish to give that to me. John, did you have a question? Uh, sorry, an answer to the engineering question? Yeah, in terms of the uh, commissioners, um, none of them have a, an engineering qualification, as far as, as I'm aware. Um, one of the commissioners, Julianne Chetton, um, has a um, environmental science and geography background with some expertise in coastal geomorphology. So that will certainly be of relevance to. Um, Houses and severe weather events as they relate to the coast. Um, the panel can certainly commission um, engineering advice and will be receiving engineering advice from Auckland Council <laughs> ourselves and um, no doubt other submitters, but they're not qualified in engineering themselves. Thank, thank you for that response. And um, I, I'm happy to give some personal feedback at the appropriate time. Um, I just want the assurance that the difficulty for submitters will be made clear to the independent hearings panel because this is not business as usual. Through the chair, happy to ensure that happens and also happy to talk with you further, Councillor Fletcher. Apologies, sorry, we were just working on that plan change 80. Was there a question to me then? No. Okay, sorry. <laughs> right, um, we will move to uh, the Speaking on this, so anyone, ha uh, Councillor Turner. Sorry, um, I'm lost in all this technicality. I could not explain it to the public if they asked me to, but they are very clear with me. They see building happening everywhere. They see building out, build, outstripping infrastructure everywhere. And it is not just the flood prone areas that uh, they're concerned about, it's the effect that all the areas have on the flood prone areas and maybe even increase the flood, the, the areas which become flood prone. So to a man out there, I'm being told, please, please just um, stop this. Now we can't stop it, although if I could join Christchurch, I would. I have heard um, um, Councillor Baker state a couple of days ago in another meeting that we can engineer our way out of floodplains. I believe we can too. Whether it's appropriate or not, in all cases or in some is, is another question. There's a whole bunch of just basic down-to-earth stuff here. The public want to be able to see take place. They want some visibility. We need some time. I'd like that to be as strong as possible to give us that time, please. Thank you. Good councillor. Um, councillor Watson. Yeah, thank you, Mr Chair, and I um, certainly agree with the sentiments expressed uh, by Councillor Turner there. I guess what's become really clear for me today is uh, the, the, the restrictions, actually, uh, the restrictive nature of, of this and, and this technical and... Um, difficult to access from a public point of view, this, this whole um, plan change 78 actually is. And whereas after the recent events in particular, people really have a, 
have an expectation that the, the council will now step up to the plate on, on their behalf. And I, and I guess um, we are restricted through this sort of um, amendments and additions in this process, but what hasn't really been put on the table today, and it's maybe not appropriate, but it, but it needs to be um, at least recognised, there must be a, a corresponding political response to to what has happened, because I, and what I've heard today, you know, I, I can see a prospect where we engage in the usual good faith and come up with all the, the right evidence, and perhaps things don't change too much at the end of it. Uh, and we know at the end of it, if we disagree with the the, the findings of the hearing commissioner, uh, it goes to the minister for the decision. So I guess this kind of assault on on the on what. You know, previously we would have regarded as a democratic planning process is one that uh, we are restricted on in, in our deliberations today. I can see uh, in my ward, you know, it's, sure, there's Plan Change 78, there's the MDRS that's already operative. Uh, just recently we were aware of this, the full effects of this COVID Recovery Fast Tracking Consenting Act, so uh, which again all to do with increasing the intensification down in Oree, where the community there faces the prospect of the intensity and a big development is going to be doubled, just doubled, just like that. If it was the council's unitary plan, um, that would be at half, half the intensity of what's being proposed. The input of the public into that is, a, is, is doesn't exist. It's actually just a commentary by adjacent people of judge adjacent. So the real um, public concern that has been amplified, and people are joining the dots now. So in the latest floods, I went down to Browns Bay, the business area was flooded right out, businesses there, uh, Teslas, new Teslas written off expensive equipment to service the Teslas, water up, you know, a metre high, like all over other parts of Auckland. But what really struck me was that people are drawing, joining the dots now. Panel beaters are saying, you've got to stop this intensification. That's the existing status quo. They pointed to where the water came down and there was a big intensified fab type development up there. So people are now realising what's happening as a consequence of planning decisions. Plan Change 78 proposes to rack that right up again, you know, as if the unitary plan wasn't enough. So obviously through this process, we're trying to do what we can, but I guess what today signals uh, is that as a group, we have to do a lot more politically to make it clear to this government and, and their supporters, because it was cross-party, that these events have showed that this is a, a disaster in waiting, that we, we have seen the effects of now, and that if we don't respond uh, in the way that's required, and that is to, to, to rethink the whole push of this unbridled ad hoc intensification across Auckland, there are going to be serious repercussions for Aucklanders, more so than they've already had going forward. So it's the people on the receiving end of the water that are the ones that uh, are suffering now and will go on suffering for so, quite some time. That's come about as a consequence of existing shortcomings. What we're proposing here um, uh, or, or responding to um, stands to make that, that even worse. So I just say, Mr Chair, thanks for the ability to, to, to examine the Plan Change 78, but really what's going to be required is a far more robust political response that really gives voice to what many people in Auckland are now saying after this flood. Uh, Councillor Leone, and one more. Kia ora. Um, look, I just wanted to make a few comments around intensification, because I know the corridors around Plain Change 78, but I mean, I know one of the major concerns around this corridor is, is the amount of intensification in Tamaki Makoto, and there are actually some areas that have done really well where there's been a um, significant amount of intensification. I hope that um, when we're looking at this investigation that that would be highlighted, or um, obviously, Megan, those things will be looked at because 
you know, I'm really interested to also understand the difference between the fact that you've got areas, um, I mean, most of the homes that I'm aware of that were affected in the floods. And when we talk about the floods, we're talking about a once in 100 year amount of rain that's coming down. So um, I just want to, you know, I, I know that we need to plan to make sure that we have um, the right um, plans in place for our city, but realising that this flood is, you know, one in 100 years, and also that intensification has been done really well internationally. There's lots of research on it, um, as long as it has actually got all the research behind it. So I just wanted to make that comment. Thank you. Councillor, uh, Councillor Walker. So um, I'm supportive of this, but... It really goes nowhere near far enough. Mm -hmm. It's plan change 78 in its entirety that needs to be rejected. Yeah. There's urgency. I'm going through all the catchment plans across my ward systematically. I've got one in my hand, which is Stanmore Bay. This is just one. It's out of date. It doesn't reflect the current development, let alone the development that's occurring from Plan Change 78. What we see on the ground, driven by developers, is every stick of vegetation on every property being developed removed. Every stick, bulldozed, flat site, wall-to-wall -wall retaining, sometimes substantial retaining. No provision for, over, for on site parking, so effectively you've got more development on the site against the background where the stormwater doesn't cope because the existing pipe network doesn't cope, the overland flow paths are being culverted or filled in, and they're not being identified in where they are, they're not adequately responding. The roading network is often poorly designed. A road in a storm event where the catchments do not cope, and the catchments do not cope, because the pipes from the catch pits in this catchment are undersized. They were undersized years ago, and they are undersized now. So when the catch pits don't cope, the roads become the overland flow paths, but the water then diverts to the path of least resistance, which is over often private properties. So the private properties get flooded out, and that is what is happening throughout the ward I represent. In addition to that, in parts of the ward, particularly the semi-rural parts of the ward, there are massive cleanfill landfills, some illegal, some not, generally inadequately monitored and consented. And they are without exception almost all slipping, sometimes onto private property, but also onto council streams. And immense amounts, and I mean immense amount, amounts of sediment, and there's an environmental cost to this that needs to be assessed in terms of the study, are flowing into our coastal environment. And the quantum of death across marine life and our aquatic life is, I am sure, phenomenal. And this is accumulating on an ongoing basis. So we have a problem here of a significant scale, and this council, at many meetings when I've raised this issue, on a decision-by-decision -decision basis, has not questioned and has allowed developments to occur. Through the unitary plan process, we were deficient. So the unitary plan process already allows development where it should not be happening. And almost without exception, and again, the Stanmore Bay catchment is an example. All of the outfalls are below mean high water springs. Mean high water springs. So if we have had, had, have had a worse event coinciding with a spring tide or a king tide, the stormwater literally cannot escape. It backs up. It backs up in the overland flow paths, it backs up in the culverts, it backs up in the pipes, and it ends up in people's property, properties. And sea level rise is locked in to the extent of tens of metres. 
It is simply a matter of time. We know that. The International Panel on Climate Change knows that. And that whole process is accelerating at a rapid rate. So on a week on a week by week basis, all the data that is arriving to us, and I constantly raise this with our people in stormwater, is informing us of that. So that is the reality that we face. When I go to a meeting on Friday around this particular catchment, I will be trying to work with this community to work on surface water management plans to try and get the community to assist, to bring matters to the attention of the officers, which matters should be captured through this process, but aren't. So what I put to you is there is urgency, and we should have, together with this, a full-on on campaign against the government, against the parties, and I continue to ask for this, in the Herald, in papers, so that Aucklanders are familiar with the reality that confronts them. Thank you, because Councilor. essentially, this is what we can do, but it is political. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you. Councillor Fearing. Thank you. Um, I feel like we're straying a bit from the actual uh, topic at hand, and, and I'm probably going to indulge in that a little bit too. Um, in regard to what our people are telling us they want and need, um, I just don't want people to lose sight of the fact that we do need to enable housing. Uh, we do need to make sure everybody has a warm, dry, safe home. Uh, and I say warm and dry deliberately uh, in the context of flooding. You know, we do not want to create a city where it is cheaper to live in places that flood all the time. Um, and I see this work as, as assisting with that. Um, it does also mean, though, that we do need to seriously look at other parts of our city where, where they did not flood uh, or where the infrastructure did cope and look at enabling more housing there. So, um, you know, I told uh, my colleague from um, Waitakere over the other side uh, and his comments on that. that. Recent events have showed us a problem that actually we already knew we had. We already knew that we have underinvested in uh, both the infrastructure, uh, hard and soft, and also the maintenance of that infrastructure over many years. That's not the fault of Plan Change 78. That's about past decisions, some of which were made by people around this table. Uh, and I note that in some of the areas that I'm looking at flooding uh, in my community, I was at a house yesterday, the people there had been there 38 years, uh, and the house was there before that. Uh, some of the areas I'm looking at, the housing goes back to the 50s and the 60s. So this is not a new issue. It's new that we had a, a particularly disastrous event, but in a lot of cases these areas have been flooding for some time uh, and they've been trying to get assistance and they've not been able to get it because we as a governing body have actually under-resourced this area for years. And so I just ask my colleagues to reflect on that, that um, we need to, around this table not just um, rail against uh, some of the symptoms, we actually need to get to the causes, and we are responsible for voting for the work to happen and for the work to be funded. And that's a long-term thing that we all need to commit to, and I would remind us of our obligations. Uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Fletcher. Well, thank you. Um, I... Um in speaking to this, I, I, I don't want to relitigate what has gone on in the past. I, I want to be able to respond to the collective anxiety we're seeing from so many in our community. I think that there's a level of depression about the immediacy of the flood is over and done with, and now people are trying to live with the consequences of those floods. And they're fearful that the rain is going to come down and there's going to be more that will impact on them. And what we're seeing today, I, I really welcome, and that is a collegiality in the way that we are trying to move forward on this. Yes, we are bound by legislative constraints, but I feel from today that whether it's Mr Ian Wright, who's the property manager for Queen's Arcade, who is complaining about stormwater being pumped from development downtown to the residents of Margot Street that had to 
swim to escape the floods, that we are going to, in addition to this work, we are going to monitor those contracts that we have. What they're wanting to hear from us is the practical stuff. That if we have a contract with Fulton Hogan, who is actually going to be monitoring? Who is ensuring that this work is being done? What we've got to do in terms of leadership is not just respond um, piece by piece. This is an overall jigsaw, and we need to put all of the pieces of that jigsaw together. I, I want to say that Plan Change 78 has been challenging for me because there was, I think, well-intentioned, um, perhaps, desires by the National and the Labour Party to respond to the housing crisis. But no matter how much and we had some very eloquent submissions, and the, there were good submissions that were put by Auckland Council. Individuals amongst us went and took the time to go and make submissions on it. And we tried to highlight the fact this is not a land supply problem. What Auckland has is an affordability problem. And we still haven't had any formal response from either of those two parties on how we're going to address the affordability issues. So um, I just want to thank my colleagues for the way in which we've responded today. I hope that this can be passed unanimously because it sets us on a pathway that could have a bit more common sense than what we've seen in the past. And I have confidence uh, that with the leadership of the elected members um, led by the mayor and all of us working together, that we'll be able to go back to those Aucklanders that are just full of grief, they're full of anxiety, to say, hey, we're going to work on this together and we're going to try and put a stop to those things that we feel are not going to be workable. We're going to talk in far more detail, with far more authority perhaps, than we have in the past about from Wellington what we need for this infrastructure in order to roll out the sort of housing that we need for the future. So um, thank you, uh, Mr Chair, thank you to the officers. And may I just close on a sincere thanks to all of the volunteers, all of the, the people, you know, amongst our staff that weren't just doing their jobs, but they were also helping out at welfare stations and the like as we tried to work our way through this. So. We owe it to them that this step today is the first step in trying to get it right and in trying to work together. And so thank you all very much. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Councillor Stewart. Thank you for that. Um, a lot's actually been said, but I just want to pick up on something that Councillor Turner was talking about, um, and that, that's what, that some, some areas can work and... Uh, the Greenfield area of Stonefields, that's one area that has worked, and I think Councillor Baker has, has also talked about what's happening out at Jury, that, that's a Greenfields area that could work. But my, my concern is um, back in, like a broken record, back in 2000, 2004, um, had a moratorium in a big part of Hauk and Pakaranga, and one of, the, one of the streets where there's been 17 apartments being built where there's, um, there's only two houses, that was an area that was really, really flooded. Um, we, were, we were very, Howick was very, very lucky this time round. We didn't get flooded, we didn't get the intense um, rainfall. Um, just picking up on what um, Councillor Ferry was saying about councillors around the table, um, a lot of us around the table had supported the unitary plan and the Plan Change 78. Well, I can certainly um, promise that it's something that I, I haven't supported and we've got people out in our communities, as Councillor Fletch was saying, that are really, really struggling at the moment and they're really concerned that we're allowing all this intensification to happen. The government has to really think long and hard and they, they have to put a stop to this because a lot of these properties will end up being flooded. 
the picking up on what um, Councillor Leone was saying about a uh, hundred year flood um, floods well they're, they're really becoming like every every year or every second year or even some in some instances over in Australia they're they're happening monthly and so things have changed and I think we have to be really really careful and I think the government needs to really 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 put a hold on this plan change 78 because we, we, we're going to all suffer the consequences later on. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. And just briefly from me, um, this is a, a wide scope to deal with what was a catastrophic climate disaster for our city. It was the potentially the worst disaster we've had as a city and as a country until two weeks later when we had the horrendous impacts of the cyclone, which then superseded the size of, of what we experienced. So we're seeing uh, that we need to act, we need to act quickly. This is not just about Plan Change 78, it's about a broad look at all the tools, all the decisions we've made and can made around what, what we can do in these situations. Um, but it is important to recognise in places where it didn't flood, say Northcote, there was a lot of opposition to intensification there. The only reason we could get flood mitigation in that area um, working with Mana Whenua, opening up the old streams was because of the intensification. It paid for that new infrastructure. So there has got to be a balance here on how we address this. In 2006, Tokyo started, uh, Tokyo opened their flood mitigation um, underground. If you've seen the city rail link, it's about 15 times the size of that. That cost $2 billion in 2006, and they still flood. So our stormwater systems, by all councils, over many years, were only built for one in 10 year floods. So we're getting one in 150, one in 200 year floods. Our stormwater systems are not funded for this. So if we are wanting to fund infrastructure at the level of risk of, of a catastrophic event we had, we're gonna to have to increase the rates, increase um, funding, increase debt, all those things that people talk about not liking. Well, that's what these councils have done for 30 years and that's why our infrastructure has gone backwards. The only way you can get more money um, focused on one place or more infrastructure is more intensification. So we're going to have to look at where the best places are to intensify because people are still coming. Uh, three houses next to each other take up a lot more impervious space than three on top of each other. So we're going to look at our, our, our discussions around car parking. People want more car parking. We've got Hurstmere Road in Takapuna, which didn't flood. We had pushbacks. We removed car parks to put rain gardens in. Those rain gardens saved all those shops and those residences, but we had to remove some car parks to provide those spaces. So it's always going to be a trade-off. It is not a just about yes or no. This is what this will do. We'll look at the wide-reaching, the fact this... We had five or six times a normal month in January's rainfall within about six hours. This is not normal, but unfortunately we are going to see more of this with climate change. And we've all been saying this, many of us have been saying this, uh, people have scoffed at our action on climate change. We have to play our part in both mitigation and adaptation. This will do this. We will need help from community. We will need help from government. I've spoken to ministers about manager retreat, how that could work. That won't be a fast process, and we can't afford to be buying entire streets clift areas um, and buying people out because the areas in my ward that flooded terribly were built in the 80s and 90s and built hard up against concrete culverts, which we wouldn't do now. But what do we do in the meantime to give people the confidence to reduce the anxiety and deal with that? So I don't want the focus to just be on Plan Change 78. It has to be far broader. What we will do on Plan Change 78 is ensure we have all the evidence that we saw that has affected our communities to back up our qualifying matters on floodplains and, and everything else. But Mana Whenua and others have been saying this to us for decades. Why are you building there? Bring back our streams. Stop removing trees. Uh, and make sure the water can go where it was supposed to go. But no, for decades we've paved over everything for car parks, for roads, for highways, for and all those things flooded. I think on that night, about 4 or 5 p.m., every single motorway was closed. Um, because they all used to be beachfronts and they also, all used to be rivers. We cannot control um, water in those levels. So we need to know how we can adapt our city while also reducing our emissions, both of which we've not done. And we're not funding that in this budget. We're actually cutting back a lot of that. So we're all going to have to step up and do this. We can't just keep pointing the finger at others. But um, this is a significant piece of work, but it needs to be quick because we need those answers for our communities. But it won't be easy and it will be expensive. So all those in favour? Anyone opposed? 
No, perfect. So, so sorry, everyone, that this has taken us way over lunchtime, especially um, for our staff. We will take 40-minute break for lunch, um, and we will come back. Well, you ha everyone has to leave the room for, um, to find some lunch. Thank you. Okay. So we come back at 15... I'm not very good at 2.25. Who decided there's no lunch? Discretion is being given away. You're a neighbour. Come on, man, you're getting paid enough to have lunch.
for being back here on time. Um, the question was before around lunch. That was the decision made last week around discretionary spending. I decided that lunch is discretionary. So at least my committee, there will be no Kai. Um, so I decided today other chairs can make that. Other and was there a reason that you didn't tell us? I emailed you yesterday. Yesterday? Yes. Last night. Last can night. I just say that I congratulate you, well done. But what would be really good when we're in a building that doesn't have a cafeteria, I'm happy to pay, delighted to pay. Parliament used to have a tab and you didn't even pay, you just walked up and grabbed something and they put it on your tab and then once a month you got the bill and you paid it. Uh, what I'd really like is somehow be able to place an order where we could get a filled roll. I mean, only three things, a filled roll, a pie or a sandwich. And I'll pay, happily pay. I'll pay for others. But at least that we could have it here. The problem with this building, because it's just so awful. You cross the road. I cross the road to a food court thinking, wow, and it's just nothing but Chinese food. There is nothing like a roll or a pie or a sandwich you can get. So if we could have an ability to get the food in, but I'm for, food. but I don't want, I don't want it for free. I do, I'm, I'm a big fan. Congratulations on your austerity drive. Cool. Kia ora, thank you. And uh, yeah, good point. We'll look into that, Councillor Williamson. Um, I guess my only advice until that might happen is that people just drop into level three on the way from the office to here and grab a, grab a sandwich or a sandwich. In addition, Mr Chair, can we ensure that we have real cups and not the throwaway stuff? I'm very supportive of that. Happy to wash it myself. Thank you, Councillor. Um, we are not going to go to item nine. We are going to, as we have mana, mana whenua representatives here um, who've been waiting, we're going to move um, item 14, our Kaha Wairahi Ki Whakatiwai um, Beachlands and East Pilot Report on the Shoreline Adaptation Plan. We'll bring um, our officers and members of our mana whenua forward. That's all right. Do I need to move the precedence of business? Okay. Cool. That's supported anyway by Councillor Baker. And Councillor Ferry and everyone else. Good. So I think we have Lara, Natasha, Paul, Zaylene, and Gavin. If you want to introduce yourselves um, one by one. Good. Thank you for being here. And just um, tap on your microphones. Thank you. Good. 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 Nga karanga maha kei wainu a koutou, a te nei a te reo mihi atu ki a koutou katoa, nō reira te nga tatou. Gavin Anderson representing Ngāti Whanaunga te rei. Kia ora tatou. Te nga tatou te whare, ko Zaylin Maxwell Butler tēnei, e mihi kau atu ki a koutou katoa, nō ngai tai ki tāmaki, anu hoki a hau. Nō te wahi nei, ka hawairahi ki whakatiwai, tēnei te take on ki te tēpu i tēnei wā, nō reira, e mihi atu, kia koe, o te rā kia koutou. Kia ora. Kia ora, ko Paul Klanek, Taku Ingoa, General Manager of Resilient Landing Coast Department. Kia ora, Pauntou, ko ora Dr Natasha Elizabeth Carpenter, Taku Ingoa. I'm the Coastal Management Practice Lead in Resilient Land and Coast. Kia ora, ko Lara Clark Toko Ingoa. I am the Principal Coastal Adaptation Specialist in Resilient Land and Coasts. Um, pleased to be here today, thank you. Kia ora everyone, thank you for your time today. Um, I've prepared a brief presentation on the Kahawai Rahi Ki Whakatiwai Beachlands and East Shoreline Adaptation Plan, but through the chair, if I may, um, direct to, to Zaylene and Gavin to, to say a few words beforehand. Aye, please do. I suppose firstly to say that it's been an absolute privilege to work with this team. Uh, they've included uh, Ngāiwi Mana Whenua Tamaki Makaurau right from the outset of the project. Uh, coming into the uh, infrastructure and environmental services, uh, hui presenting to us through that manner and seeking buy-in. Um, there was the first pilot, Whangaparoa, um, and then carrying on down to this vulnerable coastline here. Uh, and we've worked together at every step of the way. It's been really an awesome experience. Um, they've come to my marae, Umupuya, 
and sat down with my cousin Laurie Beamish, who's one of our kaumatua, and he's also an expert in this matter in terms of tangaroa, the moana, coastal edges, etc., etc. Um, and we've done really, you know, good wānanga together that's resulted in this document. Uh, very proud of the work we've done together, um, and stand behind it every step of the way. Kilda. Uh, just reiterating what Zadine has spoken about in terms of the engagement, but what I'd like to speak particularly on is the um, the connection it has to other Auckland Council and the CTO's documents, uh, in particular uh, Te Tauriki mm. um, and the relevance that has to this kaupapa today. Uh, we have done um, three to date, um, including Whangapurua, um, also a more in-depth and um, hands-on look at uh, Waimanoa, uh, Little Shoal Bay, and the challenges that uh, the uh, local board there are, uh, are faced with, but also bring it to, to, uh, to Kawairahi, Kitsi uh, Whakatsiwai. And it's, um, it's work that's been brokered uh, long before we got to the table. Um, many of the faces around um, I, I recognise uh, at this table, and uh, there are iterations of the work that no doubt you have been part of, um, but it was really important um, for us to be here as the face uh, for our iwi who are involved in this kaupapa and to be able to uh, to ensure you that uh, we were engaged, um, we had a role to play and we want to be part of the next iteration. You know, we want to uh, ensure that the, the, the challenges and the, uh, the uh, the opportunities that are presented us with the current environment, that uh, we are part of the planning, we are part of the future, and uh, we have our own uh, values, we have our own beliefs, we have our own systems that we would like to share and to get the outcomes we're looking for across Tamaki Makaurau. Tēnā koutou. Kia ora, thank you for for your input throughout the shoreline adaptation plans. I'll just um, run for a brief presentation just to capture um, some of the, the key messages that, that you'll see within the memo and the report. So shoreline adaptation plans are, are our first tranche of documents for Tamaki Makoro to look at the sustainable management of council-owned land and assets, so all of our esplanade reserves, regional parks and the assets within our coast protection structures, our coastal um, recreation structures that we have over the next 100 years. So they take into effect the impacts of coastal hazards and climate change, including coastal erosion, coastal inundation and catchment flooding, and in particular sea level rise and seasonal rainfall changes. They are developed, as, as I hope you can see, um, with iwi throughout at both a regional and a local scale. And there's also a critical piece of engagement with communities to understand the values of the coast and to work with the infrastructure providers and asset managers um, around those assets that are present around the coast beyond Auckland Council, but also into Auckland Transport and Watercare. And overall, they recommend a series of high-level adaptation strategies over the short, medium and long term. So they're essentially a, a foundation of that dynamic adaptive pathways approach. You'll all be aware of the recent storm events and how those have really raised the awareness across Tamaki Makoro of natural hazards and climate change impacts and really heightened some of the importance of this work program. The shoreline adaptation plans align with best practice in that they adopt the Ministry for the Environment, Coastal Hazards and Climate Change guidance, in particular adopting that dynamic adaptive pathways approach. So, so knowing that we don't know everything about climate change, but what we can do is respond to some of those uncertainties and build that into our process. So essentially the shoreline adaptation plans are intended to be a living document in somewhat the same way that you would have seen with the UK shoreline management plan approach in that we can have further iterations of them and we can build in that flexibility as our understanding changes. They are part of a wider ecosystem of council projects. Um, so, so they were really for, for, for the shoreline adaptation plans. They sit under that umbrella of the legislative framework, um, but they were really driven for us through the, the coastal management framework, which was adopted in 2017, which is quite an operationally focused document, looking at how we need to um, create a more strategic approach to how we manage our council land and assets, and particularly in response to storm events such as we've just had. 
And then that was further strengthened through to Taru Kiatafri, where we became a key implementation outcome under the resilient communities and coasts under that adaptation work stream. And just like to acknowledge that there are other work programs and strategies that sit to complement the work within the shoreline adaptation plans, which are a non-statutory document, such as we have through the water strategy. And all these things work together across the council family to guide those statutory and non-statutory plans and operational tools that I'll talk about a bit more under implementation. For the shoreline adaptation plans in particular, just down the side there, you can see some of the range of different departments um, and the CCOs that we've been working with throughout the development of, of this shoreline adaptation plan and across the program. So in terms of implementation, as I've said, this is really our first generation of these documents. They are non-statutory and at the moment focused on that scope of council owned land and assets. Some of the ways that they can be implemented is through direct directing those operational post-storm responses. So where we haven't had these plans available in the past, the community expectation is typically a like-for-like -like replacement or a build back better. But we do know that when we have $900 million of coastal assets around, around our coastline, that we can't continue that approach forever. Um, so we need a more strategic mechanism to understand what our long-term plan is in response to some of those storm responses, uh, ongoing maintenance. In turn, also identifying those preferred options within the coastal renewals program. So, so within Resilient Land and Coast, we, we manage the, the coastal renewals work program, um, but there's a, a, a part in there to understand what the best practice response is. We're also working on coastal asset management planning to inform, inform that longer term capital investment piece. So how, what is funding going to look like for climate change in the longer term? And that also feeds into those future funding requirements and that longer term piece around how we take a more transformational approach to dynamic adaptive pathways. So just now to move on to focus on the Kahawarahi Ki Whakatiwai Shoreline Adaptation Plan. We've engaged with both local iwi and the regional infrastructure and environmental services Kaitiaki Forum throughout. So we've had 11, 11 hui with each EB grouping. So we've had Nati Fanonga, the Nati Power Trust Board, and um, Tiakitai Waiohua joining as an observer, and Naitaiki Tamaki working alongside us um, prior to the launch of the plans through the community engagement piece all the way to today. There's been a, over a four month community engagement period with a series of in-person, online and digital engagement events and stakeholder workshops with, with all of our asset managers and infrastructure providers at key milestones through the project development. The plan was endorsed by the Franklin Local Board at the end of last term in, in August 2022. And one thing to note is that after, after that endorsement came was when Nati Power Trust Board withdrew their support to the plan. So obviously, with recent storm events, we've undertaken a full review of the shoreline adaptation plan and we're confident that there's no change to the recommendations listed within the report and the high-level adaptation strategies that are recommended. I'm going to take the report as read, but just to sort of emphasise some of the principal work streams involved in the development of the shoreline adaptation plans. They are largely tailored around the Ministry for the Environment best practice guidance for that 10-step decision-making wheel. So we have our iwi engagement, as I've mentioned, that comes at, up front and continues on throughout the, the wheel. The technical work stream, which is where we have our coastal hazards and climate change risk assessment and our understanding of coastal, coastal assets and their condition and how the coast is functioning. Then working with the community to understand the values of the coast and develop some of those objectives to guide some of the high level adaptation strategies whilst we work with the stakeholders on, on fleshing that out over the short, medium and long term. And then upon sort of completion of the plan, that's really the most important part in some respects where we move into the implementation and continuing to monitor and review those plans. So for Beachlands and East, the coast has been broken down into 31 coastal stretches, which is predominantly dictated by the coastal geomorphology of this particular area. And we've been working to understand those four high-level adaptation strategies of no active intervention, so essentially you're, you're do nothing. The limited intervention, which is uh, do a little something to maintain the existing, which could be for dune planting, or it could be around consideration of your access to and along the coast. 
holding the line to defend the coastline against a particular hazard or a suite of hazards, and manage realignment where we recognise that the risk or the expenditure posed by certain coastal hazards or climate change impacts is too high, and there's a need to move that infrastructure outside of that area um, and naturalise the coast and make more space for a more resilient coastline. As a, as a sort of very brief summary, this, this encapsulates the adaptation strategies across Beachlands and East in the short term, and, and I'll step through with the, the medium and long term. But what you can see here is predominantly blue and blue hashed, uh, which signals no active intervention and limited intervention. And that really echoes through somewhat um, so that we have a lower risk around this coastline during that 20 year time horizon. The purple shows you the areas that are currently protected in some form through hold the line. As we move through into the medium and the longer term, you can see that we start to get some increasing areas of green, which is our mandatory alignment. So that's really recognising those areas where we need to start looking more strategically at how we're going to move some of those assets out of the coast. It doesn't signal a complete abandonment of the area. This is purely focused on the council-owned land and assets but it could potentially be a signal for something that we need to work into longer term across some the council family. So the Beachlands and East Shoreline Adaptation Plan is, is really our second full pilot, and as Gavin referenced, we've also completed a, a mini shoreline adaptation plan in the past for Little Shoal Bay. So this really closes out our pilot phase of the Shoreline Adaptation Plan program. We're now adopting all of the, the lessons learnt through the program in, into what is our now regional work program for the remainder of Auckland's 3,200 kilometres of coast. So you can see here the areas that we've had completed to date. And now we're, we're sort of um, near completion of our next two shoreline adaptation plans for our Fitu Peninsula and Manukau South. And we are in the process of launching our next three shoreline adaptation plans to cover the remainder of the Manukau Harbour. And we're in the active scoping phase of, of the following or the next tranche of three, um, which will cover the open west coast, Tamaki Estuary and Howick. So really here looking at, at covering off and accelerating that work programme now that we have a good process in front of us developed through the pilots. So just to close out and circle back to that implementation piece, is it really is critical. Um, so, so for local implementation, as each plan is completed, including the Beachlands and East plan, it really will direct some of those immediate operational responses post storms and with ongoing maintenance of those coastal structures. It's going to feed into those preferred options for the Coastal Renewals Work Program, where we have existing budgets already available through the regional fund. And then it's going to support that longer term piece for the coastal asset management planning. So understanding um, what that means for, for the specific assets and translating that more into a dynamic adaptive pathways approach with specific signals and triggers. So this also can be integrated into other plans that are in development, such as the local park management plans and the regional park management plans, so that we're all um, collaborative and speaking from the same song sheet. And in terms of regional implementation, this really needs to come once we have all the shoreline adaptation plans completed across the whole region. We have a regional coastal hazards and climate change risk assessment underway, which is informing some of our regional risk profile. And along with the completion of all of those site-specific shoreline adaptation plans, we're going to have an understanding of what some of our future funding requirements can be, recognising that hold the line and managed realignment are both typically at a reasonably high upfront cost, um, but with differences in terms of the ongoing maintenance. And so those two pieces of information together can work, we want to work with you on developing a more um, objective prioritisation schema for future works, which we know is well needed for how we're going to combat climate change and have a more strategic plan going forward. So thank you very much, and I will pass back to the Chair for questions. Thank you so much, and just, uh, I'll may speak a little bit at the end, but just thank you so much again for the phenomenal work, both from mana whenua and um, staff and community. It's just, I think we kind of... Uh, hoped or dreamed this would be the process um, as it's gone on and it seems to be building and building and strengthening um, each time. So with, I don't know, 17 more to go or whatever it is, um, it's really good heart for 
uh, and a good example for other things we can do across the council whānau um, on things like this. So thank you. We've got first, uh, first of all, just get um, Councillor Baker would like to move, Councillor Dalton would like to second, and then we'll go to questions. Uh, Councillor Walker. Uh, we've got a few questions. Um, I was involved with the uh, Whanga Proa, um pilot, and there are a number of issues that I raised there that, again, I'll just raise here. So it, is it the case that this shoreline adaptation plan is, is really just focused on council assets? It doesn't cover um, private assets. That's correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Uh, the reason I mention that is obviously you've got a high expectation on the part of the community that um, it does cover private assets, but clearly it doesn't. Um, the other issue that I raised with the Fonga Pro pilot was uh, my observation that the data was out of date. Uh, so the uh, stormwater, the, the catchment managed plans are out of date for Fonga Proa for the catchments. The um, climate change data um, on sea level rise and the like is out of date. Um, it tends to be based on IPCC reports that are historical and don't reflect current data around sea level rise and storm surges and, um, and the like. And there are many scientific papers that are occurring in the, in the interim. And I would suggest um, in Auckland, they're significantly out of, um, out of date. And the other question I've, I've got um, that I raised uh, for the Fong Pro study is the necessity of the impact on storm events and flooding concurrent with storm surge and sea level rise, king tides and the like, where you've got accelerated and exacerbated um, erosion and quite obviously, as far as storm events are concerned, the pattern that we're seeing currently, where Do the impact, you... where the impact on our, uh, I'm being a much much shorter than um, some speakers, Mr. Chair, where the impact of our wider matter series cliffs has probably experienced more erosion uh, in the last um, few weeks than they've experience for some time and if that continues what does that look like so I know you said that you've maybe generated an update over the recent storm effects but I really want to get more certainty around that so a few questions there Mr Chair thank you Thank you. Uh, through the chair, so, so if I maybe start us off with a discussion on some of the coastal hazard mapping that we have. So, so we're using Council's best available information that we have. So for coastal erosion, uh, our latest report was completed in 2020, and that's our areas susceptible to coastal erosion and inundation um, instability. And that covers all of our highest RCP 8.5 plus scenarios under the IPCC AR5. As I understand it, there is a, only a marginal change between that and what is presented in the more recent IPCC AR6. And within the shoreline adaptation plans, we, we do use that higher scenario out to 2130. So it is quite conservative. For coastal inundation, it isn't specifically linked to a specific sea level rise scenario, um, but we go up to the 1% or the present day 1% AEP um, coastal inundation storm surge events. So looking at both the storm surge component and the wave setup component, along with the addition of up to two metres of sea level rise. We do have some additional mapping currently underway, um, which should be making its way through onto the Auckland Council GMAPs within the next few months, where we've built in some additional set sea level rise scenarios, taking us up to three metres. Um, at the point that that is available, there will be the ability through the regional risk assessment to build those into the coastal hazards risk assessment across the region, which we suggest would be more prudent to do once we've completed all of the site-specific risk assessments across each of the individual shoreline adaptation plans. And just a further question. Do we forecast the sea level rise that's locked in? So, for example, we know that the formations in the Arctic, and particularly um, Antarctic, the Thwaites Glacier, Ross Ice Shelf and the like, are all going. Uh, Greenland and so on, and there's a specific amount of, of um, 
sea level height that uh, is generated as, as a cons consequence of that. And given that that's locked in, and I think that's scientifically um, accepted, do we actually convey that? So the, the sea level rise mapping that we have, and, and within that portfolio, we also have some, some current mean high water springs plus sea level rise mapping underway at the same time. And that looks at what our, what our updated current sea level is. Um, so our updated mean high water springs, which is, is you're right, different from, from what it would have been 10 years ago. Um, and yeah, a little bit further on when we were looking at the, the last round of coastal marine area mapping that was completed. So it's built in through that process. And then we add on for the future projections on top of that. So, so yes. So just to clarify, so the projections going out around ultimate sea level rise are identified in these coastline adaptation plans, which are, of course, far, far more than two metres. I mean, that's frankly, incidental in the scheme of things. Uh, so I've just got a question around that. Otherwise, my concern, Mr Chair, is, again, it, it lulls people into a huge sense of complacency. It doesn't drive decision-making around mitigation, which is critical. And people often don't realise that, I think, as the Mayor said, cliffside properties are going to go at some point, uh, whether people like it or not, at some point in time, and people in low-lying flood areas, frankly, are going to be far more exacerbated than the present circumstance. We're still in question. So, um, so I think the answer is very, very... I did ask very, a very specific very... question, and it looks like the answer is no. No, that's through, through not what I heard at all, but... Um... <clears throat> through the chair, if I may, I, I think Natasha's given, Natasha's given a very specific response to that question around the data that we use. I just want to step it up a level by reminding um, the elected members that uh, the shoreline adaptation plans are living documents. They are living documents that make provision, Councillor Walker, to include new science, new data that's made available. So the information that we're currently using, the data that's reflected within the plans currently is quite conservative, but as new information is made available, we can fold that into the plans. And I would also like to just reinforce the point that we made when we provided an update to committee a couple of weeks ago around some of the recent storm damage. There is quite a lot of um, tailored, specific data capture and work happening at the moment, LIDAR, um, satellite imagery um, being captured and analysed. All of that information is going to be, going to be collected, interpreted um, and made available for use in the plans as well. So, we're not we're not shying away from from climate change. It is real. That's accepted, and we're moving towards helping educate communities around the results of those changes. Um, we're using the best available information and data that we have available at the moment. But but we will, as new data is released, make that available as well. Thank you. And it's my understanding that the. What you've given people is quite a shock to many, um, but also uh, clarifying what you said post-flood in Cyclone was that the averages over time can sometimes happen with one event. So it might look three centimetres a year for 30 years, and, but it actually happens overnight. So I think that's in here, but that's the difference of what we need to get across to the community is that it's not always a perfect progressive linear thing. Through, through the chair, I, th I think that's a really good point. And I'd, I'd just like to add that what, what we've presented today is our approach with engaging with communities. Um, some of what we present and discuss is a bit of a shock um, to many. And, and the natural response often by members of our community is to challenge what we're saying. Um, show us evidence, show us the data, show us proof. So again, the ability to call upon um, the guidance as provided by the Ministry for the Environment um, the data is provided by IPCC is, is absolutely critical for these conversations so that it moves it away from a this is what council thinks and this is what staff feel to this is what the industry is directing. Thank you. Uh, member Ashby, then um, Tumora, and then Member Henare. Kia ora. First, um, just acknowledge you, Zaylin and um, Gavin, for on behalf of Mana Whenua um, to the table. and. Um, Thank you for the presentation. And uh, there is a question here, but first, just congratulations on um, getting uh, uh, support of mana whenua. You must have done something 
something right because uh, it doesn't doesn't happen too often. Uh, so um, kia ora for that. Uh, my question is um, really just around the implementation, and if you could just explain to me really um, briefly what that looks like for the uh, local iwi involved, um, how that partnership and the good work you've done to date can continue on into the future as you actually roll out this plan over the, the years to come. Kia ora. Absolutely. Um, I can actually give you a, quite a live example for that one. So we're, we're quite committed across resilient land and coast to continue working with local iwi on the implementation of all of our shoreline adaptation plan implementation. Um, we obviously own and manage the Coastal Renewals Work Programme, which is one of those key pieces of work. Um, so so a, a sort of live example of that would be looking at Sunkiss Bay, which is a current coastal renewal that we have, where we actually have a, a Wananga scheduled with, with saline at Umapoe Marae next week um, to continue working through on the implementation of not just those high-level adaptation strategies, but what does that physically mean when we get through into the implementation? How do we continue to adopt those values through into that physical work programme? Thank you. Um, Councillor Leone. Kia ora, um, namahi nui kia koutou. Acknowledge our mana whenua as well, Gavin and Saline, um, and the rest of the team. And my, my question was probably a little bit similar. I just wanted to know if there was um, a te ao Māori lens at all that's incorporated in, um, you know, the next steps that you're taking. Kia ora. Oh, I think I should answer this one. Uh, absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> Kahawairahi is Pine Harbour. Kahawairahi speaks to plentiful kahuai. That was what it was like back in the time of my ancient tūpuna. The waters were thick and green with kahuai. Te puru. Te puru used to be some, there were scallops, there were mussels, the little black ones, there were pipi, there was all sorts of kaimwana. Gone. All gone. So we have implemented, myself and uh, Laurie Beamish, we have sat with these guys and talked about the stories of old. We've shared through this document a lot of our matauranga, what we know, and um, working closely alongside them, uh, we'll get to hopefully realise, budget pending, um, what we really need to protect our, our shorelines going forward. We're currently under, <clears throat> we're losing a lot of our ancient pahutakawa. Those pahutakawa were markers. They were like GPS coordinates when you're out at sea. When you're looking back into land, that's how you knew where you were. A lot of those are falling. We're lo losing our caves. Our caves have been lost to coastal erosion. Um, whose idea it was to build big houses on top of, uh, you know, big three-story mansions on top of a sensitive cliff is just mind-boggling. Um, we've also got people living on those cliffs who now want to cover the entire cliff faces with their seawalls. That's an offence to us. They're covering the remnants of our burial caves. They're chopping out pahutakawa because they, they are fearful that the pahutakawa will pull the cliff down. And it may do. How do they think they got front row property? Look out in the shoreline and you'll see where the original whenua once was. So when people get a resource consent to put stairs down a cliff face, isn't that putting harm on that bit of cliff? People going up and down. So it's all of these things that using our matauranga, light touch. It has to be light touch to protect for future generations. And so it's not so offensive to the eye. You just come and have a look at my coastal line and look at, look at all the horrible seawalls that are going up there now. Well, you're not a, um, I think uh, Leone that, uh, Kira Leone, that might... Um, Answer your pātai. Uh, indeed, we want to always implement our karakia tuatahi, um, our mātou ranga tuarua. Kia ora. Hi, nā mihi nui ki a koe wahini tua. Kia ora. Kia ora. Thank you, councillor. Uh, member Henare. No, no, no. no. Uh, um, my brother asked the wrong question. <laughs> Kia ora. I was just checking. <laughs> good, good. So, so quiet today, uh, member Henare. Um, councillor Ferry. 
Kia ora, and I want to acknowledge our mana whenua partners at the table and also um, the sharing of, of your mātauranga, which is really significant. Um, my query is really around um, how those conversations are happening with some of our community, and, and you touched on that a bit, um, in terms of you know the initial response of sort of, you know, you're going through stages of grief, denial's one of those, right? Um, and getting people to acceptance of, of change. So, um, wondering if there's any lessons that perhaps have been learnt through these pilot processes that we could um, use that might be applicable in some of the other difficult conversations we're having with our communities as well. Uh, and acknowledging Mana Whenua for leading in that space. Thank you. Through, through the Chair, thank you for the question. I, th I think that's a very pertinent question at the moment. I, th I think I touched lightly on some of the lessons we've been learning from engagement with our communities is, I guess, being upfront and honest about what we know and what we need to prepare for. Um, I've talked about the reaction we often get from our local communities who want to challenge some of what we're saying. So again, reference to having good, robust evidence and data. I think, I think importantly as well, what I've learned over the last sort of two decades helping lead conversations with our communities in this space is it's always nice to show and um, take people to a successful case study. So this is what we're proposing, and people often find it hard to envisage um, what managed retreat or naturalisation of the coast might look like. You know, I'm, I'm used to seeing a seawall. You're talking about removing the seawall and, and, and helping nature um, or, or working with nature to restore what was there pre-modification. I can't quite see it. I can't quite envisage it. So, so the team's been working really hard, and Auckland Council's been doing some absolutely amazing work in certain areas around our coastline uh, to walk the talk in the space. So removal of seawalls, naturalisation, dune enhancement, and taking communities um, with us to those locations and to step them through how successful that's been has worked really well. Um, how might we apply some of those lessons to the current challenges that we face um, as a region, post um, flooding and Cyclone Gabrielle? Um, again, I think we're still in a, a part of the conversation where communities are asking lots of questions around the why and what's next. Um, we're working really hard to collect evidence and data to support um, some, of the, some of the more difficult conversations that we'll need to follow around what the future looks like. Again, I think it's a natural reaction to want to, if it doesn't, um, if it involves you, your property, your family, to challenge or resist. So it's but upon us to be able to respond with, again, good evidence, good data, good rationale, and the team's doing amazing work across the council family in that space at the moment, so. So how can we ensure that uh, you have the resources, by which I mean budget, uh, to um, continue to do that work effectively in terms of gathering evidence and, and communicating that with the community? So through the chair, another great question. Um, at present, we have the funding and the resources required to deliver what we've committed to. So under the coastal management framework and what Natasha's um, set out from a shoreline adaptation plan um, delivery program, um, we have that locked in and that's working well. I think there may in time need to be a discussion around possibly speeding up the work program to deliver more plans more quickly. And if that's the case, because of Auckland's appetite at the moment to have a better understanding of where to from here, how do we adapt and how do we become more resilient? there might be a conversation that we need to have around um, additional budget to support that work program. But for now, um, we have what we need. Thank you. Kia ora, thank you. I get, last question from me, um, and I guess it's specifically on the whole plan. So we do have three um, pretty phenomenal plans right now. What do we do in the, in the meantime? Because we're still going to have these ad hoc, especially if I look at the the carnage around our coast, that people, immediate expectation is that wharf, those stairs, those um, X, Y, Z, those dunes at Long Bay, there's all, all sorts of different things. You know, when are you going to get all that fixed? How will you be able to play into that sort of, uh, try and use these examples to extrapolate maybe what could be one of decisions right across the city that we keep making the same mistakes with? Are you able to use some of this to in the meantime? 
Um, yes, yes. So, so, I mean, we have some, some good examples at the moment that we can continue to build on both through the shoreline adaptation plans and our operational management. Um, so, so we have had previous examples of structures failing as a result of coastal storms and looking at the best practice that we have and the shoreline adaptation plans are really another piece of that. Um, we have the coastal management framework that sits there and sets out those principles alongside the Ministry for the Environment guidance. Um, so, so we can apply those more broadly outside of areas where a specific shoreline adaptation plan exists. Um, examples of that being areas such as Stanmore Bay and some of the past 2018 storms where we had a se series of rocks, illegal rocks on the beach and we were able to remove those and naturalise the coast um, and restore what, what's really a, a, a beautiful area now of dune planting. Um, so building in those, work, those works and how that aligns with the New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement and our other tools um, can be done outside of what we have within the sort of remits of the shoreline adaptation plan program. Um, that's all I have for questions. So if I could ask you to move away from the table so we can debate um, each other, not you. Um, but kia ora and thank you very much for all the work. Um, Councillor Baker, would you like to go first or last? Or both? Look, I'll hope it's both. Um, now, um, I just want to uh, first acknowledge that I'm Gavin and Zaylin and great to have you guys here, um, but I want to acknowledge the staff and, um, and the process obviously had a bit to do with this in, um, in the previous term and with the, uh, the Monaco uh, one that's underway and so just acknowledge the, the outstanding work and I guess just to something that um, um, Paul talked about is it's the communication with, uh, whilst we're talking about council land um, ostensibly, it's the knowledge that is passed on to the community during those public sessions that is so valuable to them. And uh, we've seen that, um, you know, time and time again, where the people just, they, they look at what we're doing and, uh, and how can they apply that to their land as they really sit there and can't really figure out in their own mind what the changing shoreline means to them. So um, I just want to commend this for, uh, for for the vote. I don't want to carry on too long, but just really, really want to acknowledge the team. Um, fantastic effort. And, you know, these areas don't usually make it onto the maps that appear in this room because they're too big. Um, and, uh, and so it's great to see this is a huge area, 31 different sectors, um, and the Manukau's no smaller um, potentially bigger because it goes right down the coast and up and around the peninsula. So um, really huge, huge pieces of work. So thank you very much. Kia ora, Councillor. And yeah, just for me briefly and um, for those uh, who don't understand where this came from, um, Paul's team and others had been kind of proposing this work for a very long time, but it was never maybe prioritised or funded. Um, and through the Climate Action initiatives in the 2021 long-term plan, this this body of work was funded and locked in. Quite is quite a big part of those climate initiative, that climate initiative funding, but um, I was shocked, I think, when Paul said, we have the great plans for all the coast, but we have about the budget for one plan out of 20. And I said, what, this year? And he said, over 10 years. Um, so I think to see the speed, but also the careful, meticulous way of extended timeframes and worked with community, worked with mana whenua to ensure that we're getting the process right um, for the three we have so far. And I think what has shown, and I've seen the conversations in Waimanua already change for the people who said, you know, we, everything must be kept as is all the time. The conversation's already changed because unfortunately they've seen some of those, what could happen in 10 or 20 years happen over one weekend and people sort of see and understand, okay, we can protect and enhance this area. This might have to change. This may, um, this may be a different, more exciting plan for the, for the area. And this is happening in this process too because we did and we are still unfortunately making those ad hoc decisions, spending quite a lot of money on, um, I can think of assets on the North Shore that, that were fixed up after the 2018 storms and now they've gone again. So we just, unfortunately, there isn't spare money to continue to do that. And as Zaylene said, we shouldn't be bashing the whenua um, every time because the storms do it and then we try and add hard uh, structures in place uh, for our own enjoyment, but then they get... Um, 
the nature knocks them out again and further uh, ruins that place and that um, land or trees or coast. So it's a very, very important work and this is a phenomenal piece of work and I know many of you have been working on this a long time um, but I think it's come at the right time and um, will be everlasting. So thanks a lot. Do have one last comment from Councillor Walker. Sure. Um, so um, through you, Mr Chair, my recommendation is increasingly that we be more upfront with Aucklanders and that includes um, forecasting out um, long-term scenarios uh, which are just a function of time, especially when they're accelerating and sea level rise and climate change, storm surges, all those correlated things are a moving feast and it's moving very rapidly. The other concern that I've got that I think that should be reflected in the uh, shoreline adaptation plans follows the the concept of you know dynamic adaptive pathways. That's the approach that we're taking here, and that is to recognise increasingly that we need structures that are flexible, that certainly in terms of coastline protection are adaptable and almost Lego-like, and that increasingly is the uh, move that's occurring overseas. So it's expected that you put something in place. It may suffer some damage, but you can reconstitute it. And especially in many countries, arguably overseas far more than here, you can actually buy these um, uh, products and they can be put in place quickly and speedily. They're much better than just dumping a pile of rocks and, um, and so on. So I'd like to see a lot more than that. Uh, the other thing that we are still doing is building permanent structures on our own reserves and the like on the coastline when they should and could be portable, particularly surf life-saving clubs who are currently investing significant sums of money in structures in the millions that will succumb to coastal erosion when they could be portable and, and shifted and again. I would refer you to many locations overseas and I could generate a list where this is what is happening, especially in the Netherlands and other places that are ahead of us. So as much and all as this is a useful plan, what I see on the ground is we are not adequately factoring the risk and responding to it, Mr Chair. So that, that's all I've got to say. Thank you. Kia ora, thank you. Right, all those in favour? Aye. Any opposed? Awesome, thank you. That is moved, and now we are on to item nine. Kia ora, thank you very much. the presentation and Kia ora. we've got Lisa and Denise if you want to introduce yourselves and your roles and then jump into the presentation the one that says talk <laughs> As it turns out. Uh, kia ora everyone, I'm Lisa Erickson, I'm in the Strategic Advice Unit and I'm here to present the three yearly progress report and Denise is here alongside for some support and to help with any questions we might get. Um, the three yearly progress report uh, supplements the annual scorecard on the Auckland plan by taking a much more detailed look at the measures of progress across the plan. Um, it's important to note that the Auckland plan is a plan for Auckland and not just for the council. This report was put together at the end of last year using data up to and including 2022 as available. And in some cases, as you would have seen, the data is much older. Um, the last and first three yearly progress report was brought to the committee in March 2020, just at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, we are reporting progress over what has been a very challenging time. Um, 
uh, with the pandemic and accelerating impacts of climate change, which is what the cartoon is uh, referring to. And we don't have all the data um, to reveal the impacts of the pandemic and other events, but the data does reveal some major impacts. The report does not account for the impacts of the re recent flooding events, but as you will see in some of the opportunities for greater progress, there's some relevant observations um, in there in light of those events. This slide that you see now and the next slide um, will show some of the opportunities for greater progress identified in the report. I'll talk to some of the mixed progress that we've seen um, across the outcomes that help with the understanding of how we have arrived at these 17 areas and that the specific and the full data can be found in the, in the report. Um, on belonging and participation, we, we see that many Aucklanders report that their quality of life has declined in the past year as a result of the pandemic and the cost of living pressures. Social cohesion has weakened and some of the measures on which we were doing well in 2020, um, such as trust in people and neighbourhood safety, are declining. More Aucklanders report feeling lonely and mental health is of particular concern. Um, we're also seeing growing inactivity, contributing to rising levels of obesity and negative impacts on health overall. Um, and the disparities in health, income and employment that we've seen for a long time still persist and continue to be, have a distinct ethnic and spatial component. On Māori identity and wellbeing, we look at that Māori outcomes across all of the outcomes, but specific to this uh, outcome, Māori identity and wellbeing, We've seen COVID-19 having had a really negative impact on Māori in areas of health, um, education and employment. Um, these have now largely recovered to previous levels, but more data is needed to assess the full impact. Um, Māori continue to experience poor outcomes and with respect to um, the transition and response to climate change, their concerns is that this will exacerbate um, existing disparities that Māori are already experiencing. Um, in the Homes and Places outcome, you would already receive the Development Strategy Monitoring Report, so I won't get, go into the detail on that, um, but so we can move on to some observations about housing affordability, which at the time of the last progress report in 2020, we were seeing some improvements in housing affordability, but that's all gone with the housing boom that we've seen dur during the pandemic. Um, how it will play out long term, um, we don't know. And we know that prices have dropped significantly in the last year, um, but the outlook is still very much uncertain. Um, a growing percentage of Auckland respond respondents to the Quality of Life survey think that their area has become a worse place to live in the past year, um, with the top three reasons given being increased crime, more housing development, high density housing, and a greater presence of people that people don't feel comfortable around. We know that urban green spaces are important to health and well-being um, and have a very important role to play in climate change mitigation and adaptation. Um, unfortunately, we have little data to report on the quantity and quality of our urban green spaces. Moving on to transport and access. Um, as you'll probably be aware, public transport boardings are down significantly um, since the beginning of the pandemic, reverting what was otherwise a very positive upward trend. Cycling counts are also down, but much less so. Um, mode share of public transport remains low and far below the levels needed to achieve our emissions targets. Um, and with respect to death and serious injuries on the roads, there are so, some indications of a decline, with the exception of cyclists, which should be a real concern as its growing number. The presence uh, or the prevalence of cancellations and delays across the network um, has in significantly increased because of staff shortages, sickness, rail maintenance projects, um, and so forth. And as a result, Aucklanders report being much less happy with public transport. Um, transport continues to be the largest contributor to our emissions, um, but the transport emissions reduction pathways adopted in 2022 provides the way forward to achieve those emission reductions. In the environment and cultural heritage outcome, there is some mixed, project, uh, mixed progress to report. 
Um, positive progress um, includes increased tree planting in some public places, including the Hunua Ranges, and decreasing waste, fill to, waste to landfill. Um, we would have really liked to report on the extent to which we are future-proofing our infrastructure and the uptake of green infrastructure, such as urban green spaces, constructed wetlands, green roofs, vertical greening, that kind of stuff, but it has proven really difficult to obtain data on that. Um, although we are aware of some good examples of this in Auckland, but data is hard to come by. Um, on opportunity and prosperity, obviously Auckland's economic performance was interrupted by the pandemic. We seem to recover quite well in the late 21, 2022 or early 2022 um, in some key economic sectors such as employment, um, but tourism and international migration will take a long time to return to pre-pandemic levels. Uh, disparities remain in prosperity across Auckland communities and with housing affordability and the rising cost of living continuing to impact some communities really, really strongly. Businesses are reporting difficulties finding skilled labour and business confidence is, is low. Moving on to some of the dominant themes that we've seen across the outcomes and also in the opportunities for greater progress. Um, these centre mainly on the critical need to address equity issues and on the societal transformation required in response to climate change. These themes are very much aligned with the key challenges in the Auckland plan um, and reinforces the need to keep focusing on those. So responding to population growth, reducing our environmental degradation and ensuring shared prosperity for all Aucklanders. Equity runs through as a key theme in relation to socioeconomic outcomes such as education, health, employment, income and housing, all of it play out spatially and ethnically. Um, the societal transition required in response to climate change has far implications across all outcomes, as you will see. This is seen in, for example, uh, the focus on reducing transport emissions, increasing the uptake of more sustainable housing, um, and the need for a much greener urban environment for enhanced climate resilience and well-being. These key themes and opportunities for greater progress are largely continuations of those that were identified in the previous three yearly progress report, and indeed they are just focused on long-standing challenges for Auckland, um, challenges that have proven really difficult to address, um, and meanwhile are just becoming ever more pressing. Many of the opportunities for greater progress don't fall directly within the control of Auckland Council. It's understandable given, as we said, that the plan is not focused on Auckland Council only, but it's a plan for Auckland and Aucklanders. Um, but they do point to the need, these opportunities of greater progress, to advocate more strongly to government on behalf of our communities. And to wrap it up, you, you already moved it, yeah. Um, the next step is that we will finalise the report and get it published and also um, use these opportunities for greater progress to inform the long-term or the 10-year budget process and other decision-making. And that's it for us. Thank you. Kia ora. Thank you both. Um, significant piece of work again right across Tamaki Makoto and I know this is not um, just about what's related to the council so it's quite a broad piece of work and challenging time so thank you. Um, uh, Member Hinare, did you have a question? Your uh, team, um, thank you for that report and in, in, in other times it would have been you know we'll all stand up and clap and, um, but given um, uh, what uh, Auckland faces in terms of budget restraints, um, the mayor's wish to um, not 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 um, slash and burn, but um, certainly take the clippers to um, some spending. Um, and given what's in the report, like housing, more housing, climate change, culture and heritage, and how. Um, who do you reckon is going to come off come off worse in that environment? Through the chair, I'm happy to to take that, uh, Member Henare. I think uh, you have an unenviable task, although the governing body does, and and uh, MSB members through committees like this 
to make decisions each year around trade-offs and where, where money goes and where investment goes. Um, so in, in some cases, some of the answer lies in your hands in terms of decisions that you make. Uh, there are other things, and as Lisa said, this, this Auckland plan is a plan for Auckland. It's not just council, council doesn't have the only level levers or controls on some of this. And so it's up to other organisations, central government, uh, and all sorts of others to play their part as well. But of course, we can see the trends, and Lisa raised it uh, briefly as well, um, is that particularly with inequity, uh, those who are least able um, to afford matters or help themselves are often the most affected, and that also includes Māori and Pacifica in the Auckland um, uh, context. Given, given um, uh, all of what, what, what faces Tāmaki, um, and, and in particular the uh, Mātāwaka, um, do do you think that it's uh, that what you have put to us uh, informs uh, the council about how um, future Maori impact statements uh, are, are developed? Through the chair, look, I think that's a really um, important challenge and reminder to us as staff and, and obviously committees as decision makers about how we assess the impacts of policy or decisions uh, on, on others, and in, and in this case, particularly Māori. Uh, this is exactly why we do this work, is to inform things like that and ultimately to inform our advice, which, which assists you in making decisions. So I'm going to take that firstly as a challenge um, to improve that at our end uh, and also to ensure that these issues are brought up, um, whether it's in budget conversations or continued committee work um, where policy decisions are being made and what the effects might be on particular peoples. Good Megan. Through the Chair, could I just also add that um, in particular that the data that's going to come through in the next census um, and take a pinger. Um, you'll note that there's a lot of data which is from 2018, so I think we'll be continuing to monitor that and get more data which will also help to inform those Māori impact statements. Considering that uh, there's, there's been quite a jump uh, in the Māori population in Tāmaki since 2018 or in, eight, in, in, in regards to what it was in 2013, um, something like 26, 27% I, I, off, off the top of my head. Um, so it'll, it just makes it, um, um, and we've got all the data, and we continue to get data, um, and, and, and I, know, I know that council on its own ain't going to solve the issues of uh, disparity between Māori and non-Māori, um, but, but having the, the wheels of, of council at your back helps tremendously. So, so, so when you hear me um, rail against um, uh, what we're not getting, it's not, it's not actually a, 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 an attack on council. It's most probably um, comes from a, a position of, oh, here we go again. And, and I suppose what, what worries me is that, and I know that for most Aucklanders, um, we, we, are, we are fronting not only what happened in COVID, but also what happened in anniversary weekend, but also in Gabriel. And who knows what's coming next? And, and so, you know, our priorities are the wider tamaki. But if I was to go back to 1950, my priorities, if I was alive, my priorities would have been Māori, housing, employment, education, the same things over and over again because we're, we're always behind the eight ball. And it's why I asked that initial question, who do you think is going to suffer? And, I, and that was a bit of a, a naughty question, but well, thank you very much. And, and uh, very fair uh, questions, Member Hanaday, and I know it is... And that's why, obviously, Megan stepped in, because it is hard for staff to comment on 
our decisions on the budget, um, which are political, not structural, I guess. But I think there is a discussion that I think Councillor Darby and Councillor Dalton have brought up and others around what, how was the Auckland plan? Was that a lens that was put on the budget process? How was it decided? Why wasn't it included? And I think maybe, and I'm not speaking for IMSB, but maybe uh, 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 IMSB could, or the directorate could ask in the next couple of months for a response to um, how the potential cuts and reductions will affect Māori communities specifically, but maybe others as well. And we could do... I think there is a, a case for us to try and get more information on the impacts and who it impacts, but yes. So um, definitely a good point. Uh, Councillor Walker. Just got a couple of questions, and um, I don't pretend to be familiar with the, you know, the criteria, but um, I look at tree planting and it mentions, you know, there's increasing biodiversity and in native forest cover. Um, uh, my concern is that's against the background where we know that there's an overall loss of canopy cover across Auckland every year. You've only got to listen to the chainsaws um, going. Um, uh, so my understanding is that we can measure that. Um, you, know, you can measure it from satellite analysis and uh, the like, and we've had previous studies. So just got a question about that. Um, the other thing that is, is occurring within environment is I'd suggest um, significant increases in sedimentation that are entering our coastal marine uh, areas, which is of uh, huge, con huge concern. They're being exacerbated by the storm events and um, uh, land use that's occurring everywhere in virtually every catchment, particularly driven by plan change 78 and intensification. Uh, it's self-evident everywhere. You, you know, observe a storm event. So I've just got a question around how we're reporting against that. The other thing that um, I took an interest in because I was on the heritage panel, obviously we don't have a heritage panel anymore, we've downgraded our uh, built heritage, but the observation that people bring to my attention is that we're suffering a loss of, um, a loss of our built heritage. Um, conceivably that could be accelerating through plan change um, 78. I'd expect us to have some reporting on that. And I know that they're not... Um, desirable things to happen, but they're realities. And unless we actually report on realities, we don't get the feedback loop and the public awareness and the political drivers that drive us to affect change because the public is ignorant and we are ignorant. So just ask your response on those four um, topics I've, um, I've raised that are certainly observations, myself and others, and especially environmental and heritage groups are observing. Thanks. I can, yeah, um, through the chair, I can answer definitely on the tree cover that I'm aware that, well, I know we have only got tree cover data up to 2018, 2019, um, which showed overall there was actually no not much change from 13 to 18, um, but in some local board areas there was definitely a loss and in others um, unchanged and in others actually there had been an improvement in tree cover. Um, overall there was a loss of tree cover on private land, which won't surprise anyone. Um, with, like you are saying, you can hear the chainsaws and we do have an estimate that we're quoting a report from the Tree Council that estimates about a thousand trees a week mature trees a week. Um, mature trees, I mean, yes, uh, yes, and um, yeah, on public land we've seen an increase in planting, but that's not a mature tree, and we know that it takes three decades to realise the real benefits of trees. So um, as far as your question on the heritage and the loss of built heritage, um, it's not something that's included in the report, but it's something that we can go away and, and look at and come back on. Um, sedimentation, also not something that's included in here, but something that's that's a good, it's a good, it's, it's measurable, and yeah. it's something that may well be captured in the state of the environment court uh, report, um, and we could in look to include that in in here. Yes, it's in the state of environment report for sediment. Yeah. It was three questions, and I think you just said you had four, and I can't remember what the fourth was. And just on the trees, I know the last 
The last study we... Thank you. The report from the last study, I think, showed Councillor Walker a 0.5% increase in canopy cover across Auckland up to 183 or 4% coverage. And so that's about 60 hectares of increased tree cover, but that was mostly on public, public. land. Yeah. And we and were... And small, we were, real small stuff, Mr Chair. Yeah. <laughs> and, but we were getting a significant drop in the the significant trees on private land. Yeah. So mm. it is, we are pulling our weight on the public, but we know there's an issue with the private. Yeah. And we presented, again, uh, Councillor Dalton and um, myself and Megan and John to the RMA Select Committee on Monday, Tuesday, um, further pushing for urban tree protection. Yeah. And we got a good hearing, and I'm also hearing both sides of Parliament mm. thinking that there may be possibilities for that in the future. They've, they are hearing us, which is good. My, uh, my commendations on your response. Thank you very much. Thank you. Member Ashby. Kia ora. Thank you for your uh, report. Um, I uh, just wanted to focus in on the um, Māori heritage findings just for a moment. Um, and in terms of uh, you've got three, I guess, rooms for improvement um, under the Māori outcomes. Um, which is which is good that those are marked. I'm very interested in, in how you get there and any advice um, that you might give us. I know that's a big loaded question, but um, just to narrow in on the heritage, uh, Māori heritage sites, we're currently scheduling at a rate of about 32 sites every five years. There's about 2,800 historic heritage sites in the unitary plan. So if my math's correct, and might, I'm not a mathematician, so I might be wrong, but um, at that rate, I'll be 450 years old by the time the Māori heritage catches up to the um, non-Māori heritage in terms of scheduling. So um, there's something very wrong with that picture. Um, so what could be done to, um, given, given the... Uh, we've spent many hours today talking about, um, you know, growth and things like that, which is which has a number of, of um, positive and negatives on, on our communities. But one of the negatives is often the erasure or subdivision and, and um, dislocation or separation of of, of um, kaitiaki from the wahi tapu. So, what could be done to increase that that rate? I'm really interested. I know it's been a bit of a struggle for a long time. So. Um, We've, we've got to up, up, up that rate quite quickly and also um, know that previous plan change has been focused on public land, which um, I just wonder what, how this council might be a bit bolder um, and a bit faster. So uh, any thinking and that would be much appreciated. Through the chair, kia ora, Member Ashby, maybe if I could just respond initially anyway. Uh, we do have a team, uh, as you know, we uh, and it's funded through the Māori Outcomes uh, fund uh, to work uh, directly with iwi uh, on Wahitapu and to schedule those under the unitary plan. Uh, and yes, we focused on public land first in the sense that that is easiest because uh, council owns the land and controls it. Uh, and, and you will know uh, that in many instances it is much harder than when there is heritage um, uh, to be um, scheduled on private land. Um, Yes, it takes a long time. Uh, so whether that's working with iwi and, and ensuring that uh, they are uh, feel comfortable in giving us information and ensuring that the location is correct and, and all of the elements around that site uh, and the history of it is important. And then, of course, when you add in our private uh, owners, that can also add time. So um, have, it might be something we might want to take offline in the sense of if you have any ideas as well or the IMSB have any views about how we can speed it up, apart from putting a whole lot more people or budget on it, there's, it will still take a lot of time because it's um, pe people heavy quite appropriately too, particularly we're working with iwi and their capacity in order to work too. So a semi-answer for you. Um. A supplementary to that would be um, why not put off trying to schedule on private land and go um, hammer and nails at what you do own in terms of the, what, what, what the council's ownership is. 
Can I can I take that back and come back to you? Yeah. Thanks. Kia ora. Um, thank you. Councillor Ferry. Thank you. Um, it, uh, just also noting um, further to uh, my IMSV colleagues, um, the queries about um, the data for Māori, I'm very aware the last census did not do a great job uh, in terms of collecting data for Māori. There are some concerns that that might happen again. So I just wanted to highlight um, that. The point you made right at the start about this being um, a plan for all of Auckland, not just for council, what are we doing to actually connect this plan to those other parts of Auckland that we need to um, work on implementation that, that we may be a partner in or we may play a small role in or we may play no role in? Um, what are we doing to, to have those conversations? Because it's great that it comes here and there's some accountability to us and some oversight, but we really need to um, start getting some of the stuff happening out there in the other parts that we don't control that we can then leverage. Because um, as To said, a lot of this is outside our immediate mm. control. So what are we doing there You know, with central government, with other agencies, with our communities? Sorry, it's a very big question for you. Thank you, Councillor Ferry. Through the Chair, I think it's a really good question and I don't think I've got anything um, very concrete I can say in response. I guess there's some obvious areas with that the plan drive where we're working very closely with government and things like ATAP um, and some of those big program areas um, and some areas around homelessness um, strategies working working together. Um, and obviously we are working um, with the community um, through various initiatives that the council has and all of those things are helping to contribute to, to the outcomes that we're seeking with the plan. Uh, Councillor Watson. Thanks, Councillor Theory. Yeah, just a, a general question. I mean, I mean, this makes for pretty grim reading. I mean, at the, the risk of stating the obvious, if I was reading this about a city, I'd be saying, jeepers creepers, these dudes have got a few problems. What, 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 happens, what happens with this now as far as it, you know, getting out in, into the public? You I mean, use it to convince yourself that there's no need to cut the budget. Well, I, I, to be to be fair, I think there's a lot more needing addressed here than the Auckland Council budget. So, so just a, a genuine question as to what happens with you know this this information that is really quite telling in a number of very fundamental ways. Uh, th thanks, Councillor Watson. Through the chair, um, the, one of the uh, we decided to do this report when we first adopted the Auckland plan. So we do an annual scorecard where we talk, um, use a, a smaller number of measures to report progress, and then every three years take this deeper look into the plan. And one of the reasons we do that is to um, is because the plan is supposed to provide the basis for alignment of our um, funding plans, and um, so we use we produce it at this point to help to inform the ten year budget. Um, but as, but as it has been commented on several times today, this isn't just a plan for Auckland Council, this is a plan for Auckland. It's a 30-year plan. Um, we are trying to show what progress has been made to date, and we are trying to demonstrate that there are particular areas based on the data where we think um, further progress could be made. So those are those 17 opportunities for greater progress. Okay, thank you. And just, just a couple of quick follow-up ones. I mean, uh, certainly in terms of the economic indicators that, you know, really go to the quality or lack thereof of people's lives, obviously, you know, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's one for the government and, and, and people th themselves, largely. I, I think of the, the areas that Council does have, you know, an immediate bearing on, and we, we, we have referred to them. But I guess the other thing that, that I just would ask in terms of you know, full capture, there are things there that Aucklanders themselves can step up to, aren't they? And, and we perhaps could maybe spell that out a little bit more. So I think of belonging and participation. We talked about COVID, the effects of COVID, but for a little while in COVID, people were actually closer together. There was more community feeling, there was more community resilience. There was a kind of a little bit of a throwback to the good old days, and that's gone. No. So as much as we can point a finger at government and 
councils. We, we, we've got a part to play in that. And, and I think even with some of the council ones, even like the transport, we talk about public transport here and um, you know how it's, it's on the back foot, and we, we know that to a certain extent. But there's also half-price fares there. So you'd think, OK, you know, what does it take to get someone to, to go and use a public transport? It's half-price. Uh, what, does it have to be free, or, or do you have to pay someone to get on the bus now? So it, it might be nice if, if, if there was a little bit of a balancing there as to, uh, you know, notwithstanding the very real divisions and equities that, that are outside the people's control, there are things there that Aucklanders could be doing too, and we, we should perhaps consider that in some ways. And one of the opportunities for greater progress in that belonging and participation area is about that supporting communities to be more resilient. And in many instances, communities are looking for practical support from council to help shape and influence different things that they're doing. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Bartley. Um, thank you. Thank you for the report. I am not surprised at all by it. Um, that's exactly what I'm seeing out there in the communities. Um, and I just, I, I didn't want to read this report, to be honest, because I don't know what we can do with it to actually affect some real change to address this, considering what is being cut in the, well, what is being proposed to be cut in the budget is all our community services. So, um... I suppose my question is, you know, what, what what can we do? Like, this is exactly what we're seeing, the inequities, the, um, there's no community resilience for some communities. You, you, you've you got, what, 7,000 that lost their homes, and how many of those had no other option but to live in their cars? Um, you know, they don't have a holiday home to go to or you know, money to go into a hotel, so they went into their cars. So there, there, there's major issues. Well, what can we do with it to really make some change happen? Even even if, because it's obvious things are going to be cut, what, what, a, what about a leadership role that we can take? Uh, through the chair, that might be slightly rhetorical, but I, uh, you're right. I think ultimately it comes to what is, what can council do and what can we do best uh, in some of these areas. We don't have to do everything. We can't do everything. And in fact, there are others. Sometimes it's community themselves it's, or it's other organisations that do it better than us. So in one, in one sense, the question was, what, can, what do we do well? What do we do best? And therefore, is that going to be a priority for investment, whether that's money or time or leadership, whatever that looks like? Um, is that going to be a priority for this council? Um, so that's the kind of reason why we put this together, because it can help as you think through, particularly into budgets, but into your general leadership as well, as to what this council uh, could focus on or should focus on and what it does really well versus getting out the way and letting others do some stuff. Yeah, a good point, Councillor. I think it is it is using some of this information for, I guess, your advocacy and our advocacy to community through the, the process of the budget and debating on the budget. But I guess it is hard for staff once again to react to our decisions, um, because when those decisions, if those decisions are made, they just have to, unfortunately or fortunately for them, um, have to, just follow what we've decided. Um, so I guess that's a question for all of us looking through some of this bleak data. I just had one question um, but on climate. So we have, um, it's pretty bleak on there around our emissions. Uh, we've got climate disclosure reporting, compulsory reporting, but we've already been doing it anyway, um, coming up. And we know that uh, services are being cut and Auckland Transport is not completing and they're delaying and cancelling walking and cycling projects um, and not completing, for all the years I've been here anyway, things like transit lane, cycle lanes, anything that they've sort of said they haven't really got to, especially in the emission space. What does this document, as it's a statutory docu document, not like Te Tarakia Tafari, despite we've all approved it, that's not statutory, does this have any legal obligations around 
emissions and sort of triggers that, you know, forcing us to make actual decisions that reduce our emissions or our CCOs to do that? Uh, no, I, it doesn't have that. Um, well, yeah, sorry, that's quite a hard question. Um, it doesn't have that um, statutory weight to do that. I think would be the clearest answer I could give. It sets direction. Um, that direction's picked up in other documents, such as Te Tāraki Atapere. Um, and through this um, report, reporting on that, we can identify where there are areas where we could be making improvements. Um, but the, the document itself, and certainly the monitoring report, doesn't have that um, statutory weight. Um, the, the, what the legislation talks about is providing the basis for alignment of our regulation, uh, regulatory plans, our funding plans, and our implementation plans. So um, we, we try and provide this information so that those can be aligned. Yeah. So if, maybe it is a legal question, not a question it, it, for... It might be. I'm not sure if I've answered that quite correctly, but that's my understanding. Yeah, I guess my concern, maybe it's to you, Megan, that if this doesn't trigger, if so we've support this, support Te Tāraki Atāwhiri, support transport emissions um, reduction pathway, but a organisation such as Auckland Transport or Waka Kotahi can still ignore those. Where does the, where does the line go? Yeah, so the Auckland plan is statutory, so it does sit in, in the Local Government Act kind of legislation for Auckland. Um, uh, and, and it does have climate woven through it, because of climate, yes, there's an, the environment or the natural environment type element to climate, but, but uh, a very large part is also, you know, a, a social and economic uh, and a cultural aspect to it as well. So it's woven through um, the, the whole Auckland plan and... and most of those six outcomes. As you know, central government kind of cascades a bunch of documents and things that we have to do, and particularly under the Resource Management Act, but not exclusively, but particularly under that, uh, we are required to deal with, uh, for example, to deal with climate change and, and point to direction. We've got um, emissions reductions we're required to do and things like that. So that's where you see some of those uh, uh, specific meaty kind of things coming through, not so much at the spatial plan, but the requirements are statutory and they come down through some of these other documents as well. So they do play together um, and come together under the Auckland plan, uh, but most of that specificity comes under these other documents and other pieces of legislation. Okay, thank you. Um, last question, Councillor Lee. Mr Chairman, I'd just like to... Um add um, a contribution here because I believe um, the Auckland plan um, properly interpreted um, can help or could help um, us guide us in the challenges we face in terms of the infrastructural deficit that has been underlined by the recent extreme weather events and just to remind members that the actual name the real name, the legal name of, of, of the Auckland plan is the Spatial Plan for Auckland and is set out in the Act, Local Government Act 2009 for the purposes of subsection two. The spatial, spatial Plan will set a strategic direction for Auckland and its communities that integrate social, economic, environmental and cultural objectives and outline a high level development strategy that will achieve that direction and those objectives and enable coherent and coordinated decision making by the Auckland Council as the spatial planning agency and other parties to determine the future location and timing of crucial critical infrastructure services and investment within Auckland in accordance with the strategy and provide a basis for aligning the implementation uh, of the plans, regulatory plans and funding programs for the Auckland Council. So I think we need to go back to basics and view this plan for what Parliament intended it to be. And I think if we look at it in that light, um, in terms of critical infrastructure services, um, the timing of development, 
and so on, it could be uh, helpful for us as we face as, if we face the immediate challenges ahead, in, including the long-term challenges. But I think we, we seem to be drifting away from what the Act requires us to do with this plan, and probably it's timely um, we went back to the Act to, to seek some guidance here and measure our success against what the Act requires us of us. Even mention of flood prone or unstable land is in here. It's, it's well worth a look at. Thank you. Thank you. That's um, correct reading of the legislation. Um, apologies, Chair. I think I misunderstood the question. So that's all correct. That, well, that's what's in the legislation. Thank you. Um, we just need to move an extension of time. Councillor Dalton, second. Comment. Would you like to no, move an extension of time? Oh, yes. And I'll second. Um, all those in favour? Aye. Okay, and uh, co uh, question, Member Ashby? No questions? Okay, so we've, uh, I've, I've moved and Councillor Dalton is second. Is there any comments on this item? Councillor Dalton, Deputy Chair. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, look, it is a sobering report, and thank you, officers, for the report. Um, notwithstanding that we can't do this alone, um, this is our Auckland plan. And the progress report um, is sobering in the context of the budget proposal that we have out at the morning. So everything that we're trying to achieve in this Auckland plan, uh, or in, this, in the progress report so far... Sorry, Angela. I'm getting quite frustrated by all these side conversations. I think it's quite rude to your colleagues. Thank you, Councillor. <clears throat> I think that that is what Councillor Ferry was commenting about. Thank you. Dalton. So in the context of the fact that the achievements that we're trying to reach uh, form the $20 million that is proposed to be cut out of the budget that's out for consultation is concerning. And those areas include belonging and participation, Māori identity and wellbeing, transport and access, opportunity and prosperity. So this does come down to leadership. And I have to wonder, if, you know, when I listen up to around the table with our chair, we need to bring back some of these strategies and policies and plans that we have because the leadership has changed. And what I'm seeing in the budget is not going to be supporting the role that I think that Auckland Council has a really big part to play, and that is in resilient communities, social cohesion, jobs and employment, economic success, and, and the investment we put into those outcomes. In the grand scheme of things, the $20 million and the, the cash flow that goes through this organisation is not a great deal. So... What we have seen, and, and the consultation documentation, and when, you know, referring back to the plans and policies, is really clear that the budget is suggesting, suggesting or telling us that we are not going to achieve the outcomes of thriving communities. We're not going to achieve the outcomes that are in Te, te Takere Otafuri. We're certainly not going to achieve the outcomes in the Transport Emission Reduction Plan. We're never going to achieve the outcomes of the Auckland plan, so who knows where we're going to be in three years' time if this is the progress at this point in time. So I think that at some point here we need to have a discussion as to whether before we start the 10-year plan we agree as a governing body on what our vision is for the future of our city because at this point in time, we're doing a complete pivot in the opposite direction as to what our policies currently hold for us. Um, thinking about partnerships, and one of the partnerships, for example, is our contribution to Housing First. Now, that is a part this is what we're good at. We are good at partnerships and we are good at leveraging. So we contribute half a million dollars to Housing First. We sit around that table with every other possible agency there is to address the issues of homelessness in our city. That's a good partnership. 
and that is good leadership, and that is caring for our people and our community and helping to build resilience. We need to agree if that's what we want or not. And if we don't, then let's have a debate about it. But let's not have a debate through budget cuts that are not going to help us reach our goals in the Auckland plan. Um, Chair, I think that the report, if it's not already, should be referred to the Minister of Auckland to have a read of. I'm sure he would like to have a read of that. But um, this is for Auckland. Uh, he is our minister, and he needs to have a good understanding of the challenges we have and the partnerships that we want and the responsibilities that central government have to us and our role in the advocacy with central government something the Southern Initiative, which is about to get wiped off the face of the earth, does well. $3 million in their budget, and they leverage $14 million from central government. And they get people into jobs. And they help build Pacifica and Māori business and other things that they do. So um, the concerns I have are around what we're going to do for the next year, but more importantly, what are we setting ourselves up for for the next 10-year plan for our city of Tamaki Makaurau? Thank you. Right on five minutes, exactly. Thank you, Councillor. Um, very, very um, pertinent points. Thank you for your contribution. Uh, Councillor Darby. Um, thank you, Councillor Dalton. Just following on that from that, so we've got the recommendation to the Minister. What worries me, and this is probably a, a but a question for the Chief of Strategy here is that a lot of this information, really important information, uh, that, you know, our policy settings, our strategic settings, don't often, you don't often hear them being mirrored back or discussed from finance when they come before us to discuss a budget. It feels like there's this little remote um, division that's in behind a moat of you know, impervious to to everything that Councillor Dalton has just outlined. You know, all the settings that we've made, it feels like it's impervious. So I'm just wondering, I haven't got the words in my head, Chair, but Chief of Strategy, maybe we need to actually refer this to the Finance Department too, and any quasi-cost accountant out there as well, because we're well endowed with cost accountants at the moment. We have very little uh, in the way of benefits accountants. Um, so not being too frivolous and light about it, but I, I do think we need to put this in front of the finance department. Through the chair, look, I know you're in debate, uh, so just block your ears for 10 seconds. Um, perhaps rather than uh, needing that as a recommendation, just know that Peter and I are talking already about the LTP, the process that will take you through for the budget, including this um, annual plan and how we can do it better and differently. So um, I absolutely will take that on and, um, and we will come back to you and, and talk you through that. I, I totally, Megan, you know I have absolute respect for you. I, I've sat around budget discussions for many years and I've found that um, when we get into the thick of it, um, the finance division puts a line through and I know that divisions don't get a look in. Um, they don't. And I hear it on the quiet, quite, you know, repeatedly. So um, if, if that's going to carry on, um, then we are going to really lose the course that Councillor Dalton is um, highlighting that is, a, you know, severe risk at the moment. So, look, I, Megan, you're going to have to do your damnedest um, to make sure that they really do understand the severity of the situation uh, the inequity in Auckland is just rife. It, it's just in such a bad state. And when we've been identifying this for many years now, and it's actually not improving. We, we're going backwards, and now we're going to put it into half a rocket backwards uh, with the proposed budget. Leave it there. Kia ora, Councillor. Um, thank you very much. And that will be definitely passed along um, loud and clear. Uh, Councillor Watson. Thanks, Mr Chair. Yeah, I'd um, certainly pass this on to the Minister for Auckland. I, I, I don't know if he's going to thank you for it in election year, though. 
persistent and deep-seated inequalities, inequitable progress against child poverty targets, rising cost of living, weakened community connection, health and well-being declining, Maori, you know, despite the biggest Maori presidents in the, the current cabinet, overall poorer outcomes in education, health, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, show that to the minister. I, I don't think um, that's going to be particularly welcome in, in terms of the clear governmental responsibility for, for virtually all of that. Um, certainly, um, in addition to the minister, we, we, we probably can pass it on to ourselves too. I mean, I look at maximising urban green spaces that improve the lives of people and planet. The last time a community came in here looking to hold on to their their green space, that was we, we, we sold it, yeah. voted to sell it. So um, certainly it needs to be passed round because it is deeply disturbing. It, it's, it's, it's quite depressing. Uh, to think that that's the lot for uh, many people in Auckland, and um, as it is, it seems to be getting worse. So I guess it it wouldn't be so bad if it could be written off as a consequence of, you know, a, a short period of time. But we know it's it's, it's a trend that's getting worse. Um, so it certainly does need to be passed around, um, and there does have to be some sort of response other than the the kind of usual hackneyed cliches that are trotted out um, time and time again uh, that really don't go any way to addressing how hard it is for many people now, many families, just to survive in this place. So um, as far as the recommendation goes, Mr Chair, um, and, and I guess you know people are quite right turning into the budget, but the budget isn't the consequence of just the last two or three months, it's a consequence of the last six years. Um, so certainly I'm all for the preserving the, the community outcomes and the, the things that I know people in my community value and the people across Auckland, but let's not just uh, tie that into the last little while. That's been building up for six years, if not ten. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Newman. Yeah, look, I think that this report um, is interesting, but it needs to be kept in context. Monday the 4th of October 2021 was the key date in my calendar. Uh, I was down at the James Cook High School Hall and we'd just finished a long day of vaccinations with the Marae Marae. And at 4 o'clock we had a presser from the former Prime Minister who announced the big step town change for us to get our lockdowns was picnics. And that's when social licence started to ebb, because with that came a slow but important change in the loss of licence in relation to lockdowns, um, the appalling rollout of vaccine vaccinations to achieve a really important outcome. But how do we get over the line with, you know, 90% double vaxxed? It was the annihilation of employment protections for thousands and thousands of workers. And, and, and we've never recovered from that. That, that's, that goes to the heart of the problem that we face. If you want to look at a declining confidence in, in governments, that is a significant moment, that event. Not saying I agree with all the decisions that took place, I certainly hadn't agreed with the protests, but that was important. Um, it's not so much important for the people in this room, we, you know, but it was important for people who were affected by decisions that they felt were being applied to them. It's an interesting report, Chair, because um, there's something for everyone. I poll my ward. 71% of constituents in my ward say that spending $300 million on cycleways is too much, 73% in Mararewa and 68% of response in Papakura. Now, that figure will cut no ice with it, some people in this room. I respect that. But people have their views and they have their values. <coughs> and unfortunately, sometimes you're going to get feedback that you don't like. But here's an idea. There are some things that we can control. 
most of my constituents would like to have confidence that the bus timetable uh, is one that is going to be upheld, that there will be a bus service for them, that there will be a train service for them. Um, but, you know, it, if you want to look at something here, it's actually, to me, the first priority ought to be about Auckland Transport providing public transport services. They're very focused on active transport. I get it. It's very, very important to some people. But it is not as important as other modes of transport to most people. And the reality is that we have policy after policy after policy. How many policies are funded? Talk about budget cuts. How many policy papers have we endorsed which are unfunded? Unfunded mandates. And then we set ourselves up year after year after year about this. I used to ask the former mayor, uh, Phil Goff, how are we going to fund these unfunded mandates? And there's never been any credible answer because I was talking about, well, it'll have to be a reprioritisation through the long-term plan. Well, when is anybody uh, who doesn't like a cut going to come up with a reprioritisation to fund all of these unfunded mandates uh, through that long-term plan refresh? It doesn't happen. It never happens. And the final thing I'll say, Mr Chair, and this is going to be difficult for some people, I'm sure, Building back Auckland is going to require a significant outlay of carbon. And the hard reality is, is that the time when we had probably the least emissions in Auckland was during the lockdown, and most people hated that. And what we're going to see with uh, the future build back is it is going to be very carbon intensive for a time. And I'm sorry if some people hate that feedback, but that's just the reality of building back. Because you know what? Most Aucklanders are going to want uh, a degree of convenience in their lives. I certainly will, and so will my constituents. This report needs to be read for what it is. It is a statement about how difficult it is to live in a very expensive city, and that there are lots of programs that we have which are unfunded, which undermines confidence in this council's ability to deliver. Thank you, Councillor. Um, yeah, so this is a, a look at what we've been doing as a city and what needs to happen. It is very clear. It is very bleak. It will. Um, it's clearly got speed bumps in in where we were heading due to COVID, due to the cost of living crisis, due to the Ukraine war, and now we'll have the floods and the cyclones that will affect this. But the underlying issue is is that as a city we have a lot of issues that we have not been addressing for decades. Um, and we've been trying to address those, and as Councillor Newman said, yes, we have looked to try and fund some of those things, things through water quality targeted rates, natural environment targeted rates, the climate action targeted rate, which is all about public transport and trying to get those services for our communities who do not have them and get them quickly. And for years, many people have said, too much, too fast, won't vote for that, won't vote for this. Um, and this is what happens, is that we get a cascade of problems that our city is facing because we haven't funded them correctly. And now this is happening again. Um, so yes, I, I, I do love, um, and I commented on it recently, around the fact that people seem to think that the cycling budget is going to fund everything. Cycling budget's 1% of our transport budget. Uh, our, our cycling budget is one of the smallest in the world. Every international city is building huge numbers of cycling and walking uh, related infrastructure because it keeps kids safe. It reduces our emissions. It helps with air quality. It means that younger people and older people and those who don't have cars can get around our city. It's not anything that's sort of some lycra-clad um, focus on... on, on random people in our city. This is what every school I go to, the kids go, I'd love to cycle to school, walk to school. I wish that my parents didn't have to drop me. We know during the school holidays that the traffic congestion is horrendous because everyone not in the school holidays is dropping their kids to school because it isn't safe. So I think that when I talk about um, cycling, when I talk about AT not following 
our um, plan after plan after plan, it is, it's bread and butter. It is, our, it is the things we should be doing as a city, planting trees, building um, transport systems that work for everyone, connecting up our city, making sure things are affordable and easy. And I think Councillor Watson might have talked about the half price public transport fares, but all the um, data out there says it isn't necessarily cheaper transport that attracts people, it's about making it easy, accessible, connected and frequent. And at the moment, we don't have that as a city as Councillor Watson had in his committee uh, last week or the week before, that we are losing confidence in almost every part of our public transport system. Um, when we talk about housing, we are getting there with the unitary plan. Some people might not like some of the intensification, and that is absolutely correct. There is massive issues. But the whole idea of a compact city is the areas where we are building, and Eki Panuku is focusing on, and Kainga Auto is focusing on, Places where we're doing it right, like Northcote and others in my ward, where you're able to build the infrastructure that's resilient, but also have a lot more housing connected to transport, connected to open spaces, that will all contribute to what, what we're focused on here in the Auckland plan. And I guess my question is, what legal constraints are we going to break by not doing these things? And I do want to have more information on that. So thank you for the report. It is bleak. There are some positives in there. Um, we've got to keep building on what we've been doing um, and it's up to us what we do in the budget. It's not an accident. What will happen through the budget, that's all up to us. Thank you. All those in favour? Anyone opposed? No. Thank you. Right, next up we have plan change... Where am I? Item 10. Item 10. Um, Councillor Baker would like to move this. And we have, I think, Tony. Yes, Tony's at the table already. Uh, Councillor Newman would like to second. Kia ora, Mr Chair, um, committee members, IMSB members. I'm happy for the report to be taken as read and answer any questions, or I can take you through it. Um, I'm conscious of the fact you're running out of time. Um, but happy either way, and also have some maps that may assist as well. Yeah. Just through the chair, maybe, Tony, if, if you need to show a map, that's great. Maybe just do a couple of minutes introduction about what the report's about. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Um, so, yeah, this is um, pr a proposed plan change we're looking at. It involves rezoning privately owned land. It's owned by the Kings Inc. Villages, Kings Inc. Village Limited. It's currently zoned as open space. Um, it's no longer required as open space. Community and social policy have advised us of that. And so we're seeking to rezone it to single house residential. Um, I'll just flick onto the maps. So it, it's, um, the um, zoning as open space stems from the Kingsley structure plan back in 2011, and the landowner was in an agreement to, um, for their land to be zoned as open space as a uh, future sports park. But in the subsequent years, the um, sports parks have been developed at Cracker, so it's no longer required there. So we're talking about 1039, 1023 Linwood Road. There's an existing reserve um, fronting Linwood Road that would remain there. So the item's been to the former planning committee um, on a couple of occasions, and last time it was deferred pending the release of uh, the NPS on highly productive land. Um, bottom line on that is the NPS doesn't affect um, the rezoning. It only relates to rural or rural productive land. Um, nevertheless, we do, the AUP does have an objective um, in terms of avoiding elite soils and avoiding where practical on prime soils. This is prime, um, an era of prime soils. Um, but however, as, as you've seen in the structure plan, the two properties were part of the structure plan area in which urban zonings were applied. Um, if they were not zoned as open space at that particular point in time, they would have had an um, alternative urban zoning, most likely single house residential and they are um, contiguous with that zone. Um, they're currently in pasture and have never been used for rural production. The second matter um, on which the item was deferred was really infrastructure, and my report provides an infrastructure update. Essentially, water care services, um, so there's no um, public water supply or wastewater reticulation in the area. 
water care services is working on that and also the um, developer Kingseat Villages Limited are working on their own private systems. That's quite well advanced. They've got a water right for water supply um, and they're working on a, a resource consent for wastewater. The local iwi have raised the infrastructure issues as a key issue to them. Um, but I'm confident they're being addressed via either Watercare's approach, which is a bit, take, will take a bit longer, or the private developer's approach. So they will be addressed. In any case, um, development can't occur, or it's a non-complying activity until um, services are in place. So they were the two key reasons the item was deferred last time, so it's just a report back on those two matters. There are other issues that have been raised, um, but they, they're addressed in the report. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Well, thank you, Tony. And just, I guess, for this was my, con you know, your con my concerns have been brought up through your uh, uh, presentation, but I guess the very simple way to put it is already zoned urban land, uh, urban zone, sorry, and also the reason why it was um, zoned open space, that reason is no longer needed because it was done somewhere else. That's correct. So that's largely the yep. simple. Yep. Um, any other questions? Councillor Darby and then Member Ashby. Uh, just in terms of um, the, the plan change that's required, um, is there a possibility of bundling this with another plan change to reduce costs rather than have it as a standalone plan change? Um, Councillor Darby was originally part of Plan Change 60, but it was pulled out because of these various issues. We could bundle it with this next um, plan change, the equivalent open space plan change, which is due to come before you in June, July, middle of this year. Um, so that would be a po could be a possibility. Um, so can, oh, sorry. Yep. No, that's my can, answer. Can you give us an idea of what the savings might be? Um, and I haven't asked you this prior, so maybe you've got an idea. What would the savings be if we bundled this with the open, splay, uh, open space plan change? The key savings would be in the end of the process of the hearing. Um, you'd only need one set of commissioners, um, one panel to consider the plan change. The notification costs are quite minimal in any case. Um, so it's really the hearing costs, um, which democracy services carry. So you'd be running a whole unique process for this plan change as opposed to bundling it with the next one, the open space, and there you are sharing the costs. And could that be a saving of of several tens or is it 10,000 or 20 or um, 50? So in the past the equivalent plan changes have taken, um, we'd had um, two to three commissioners and the hearings have taken one or two days. So I think you're looking at under ten thousand dollar costs, hearing costs, or around about that figure. Can I just take some guidance from the chief of strategy then, considering that we really are, we do need to be looking for every ten and twenty thousand dollar number. Uh, is there merit in the eyes of the chief of strategy to bundle this with the forthcoming plan change? Through the chair, I think it is a it is a really good idea to look at that. Uh, and it doesn't sound, Tony doesn't seem to have any particular reasons why that can't be done, so we're certainly happy to proceed on that basis if the committee um, chooses to agree to notify a, or to put together a plan change. Yeah, happy Thank to you. take a, my concern. I think it was bundled before and then it was unbundled under the last term, so I think as long as the timing is fine, we should if it's going to be pretty close time-wise. So how would we change that? On the... It'd be a, um, probably a three-month, three to four-month difference in notification. That, that's what you're looking at, really. Okay. I But that we believe that's fine. I just don't want to make a decision based on... Yeah, I believe that's acceptable. Um, as long as it's not unbundled <laughs> at a later stage, I suppose. I guess that's my concern, is that the last committee unbundled this from a... and then we've delayed it, and then bun trying to bundle it again. <laughs> sure, <laughs> I mean, through work. the chair, that is, that's the risk. Uh, 
felt so. But, I mean, we're, we're prepared to, on the basis that a another set of, of plan changes to just to effectively tidy up um, zone, open space zone changes. This is slightly more than a tidy up. So if the, de if the decision was made today to go, yep, go ahead, the, I think there's a pretty low risk of the, uh, of the tidy up plan change is going to come to you in a few months' time that that won't be approved through the process. So I think it's a pr pretty low risk. Um, so would we... I'm a, uh, I guess we need some advice on wording. Would it just say approve the preparation of the proposed plan change with a word that said that could be incorporate, incorporated into a wider plan change? I don't know. I don't want. I just don't want this to come back for another decision. Uh, yeah, I understand that. I mean, this this would clearly, if you agreed with us, this, this would clearly. Uh, give us the uh, the go-ahead to prepare and to notify. Uh, we could put in um, like a notification date or a um, or working it with a with an upcoming plan change, or we could just leave it and and just do it that way anyway, uh, as you've requested. So it really depends if you want that put into the resolution. We can, otherwise, that's just what we will do. We'll do it, and we'll just we'll we'll do it as part of um, the the future plan change. So nothing needs to be changed then. Doesn't have to. Okay, thank you, Member Ashby. Thank you. Thanks for the report, and I really appreciate the the background and the context. Um, I just have two questions, um, and uh, the first is um, they both relate to the the mana whenua, uh, engagement with this. So the first is just um, what work's been done since June to, um, I guess, address the concerns. You, you mentioned that you you felt that they'd be um, able to be addressed, but I, I just wonder, in terms of their specific concerns, how have they been communicated back to them, um, and are they sort of still in the loop as to where this is, is going? Um, so we've... Uh, Watercare Service and the developer for um, updates on where the infrastructure um, program is at. Um, and that's just come in in the last week or so. So we've yet to go back to iwi to advise them of that fact. We've um, talked to IMSB yourselves and provided an update there, um, but we've yet to go back to those individual iwi. Cool. Thank you. No other questions? We will thank you, Tony. <laughs> thank and we'll, you. And we'll move. Um, all those in favour? Aye. Any opposed? Uh, I'd just like to... oh. Thank you, Member Ashby. You'd like your abstention recorded? Yeah. Thank you. Right. We have... Where am I? Item 11, which... Here, Sorry. Uh, Tony, which is me again. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so this is the original open space plan change that um, the Kingsley properties were p originally part of. Um, this is now ready to be made um, operative in part. So it's been through the plan change process. There were no appeals against the decision of the commissioners. There's one important point to note of uh, mentioned in the report is that um, we use this plan change to rezone land that's subject of all council um, rationalisation right, rationalisation process. So that's open space land that's going to be sold off to raise funds. Um, and the commissioners actually declined 11 of those 26 land parcels to be rezoned. Um, there, was, there was significant community opposition and some local board opposition as well. They're primarily pocket parks um, across the region. Um, as a result of that, um, so they're not part of the, the, obviously the decision is to retain an open space zoning and that's in part of the decision. But the guiding documents that have been used to assess the disposals are now um, being reviewed. Um, so community investment have um, commissioned a review of the Parks and Open Space Acquisition Policy, that's 2013, and the Open Space Provision Policy, 2016, as a result of that decision, and um, a couple of other um, parks policy documents as well. Um, so the plan change can be made off or operative in part because 10, um, only in part, because 10 land parcels are subject to a variation 
and that's been brought about by Plan Change 78, so the IPI plan change. The surrounding zone is changing under the IPI plan change. So the original zone that we were going to rezone these parcels to is now out of date effectively. So we've got to catch up with the Plan Change 78. So that's why they've been pulled out of the, the um, pulled out of being made um, operative, and they will run the course of the variation process. Um, our, head, our legal team have suggested some amended wording, which I passed on to Sandra, just to reflect that more strongly, that it's um, been made operative in part, and that the, the lots that are subject to the variation aren't part of that decision. Cool. So you think that's sufficient? Yep, yep. I do, yes. Thank you. So um, I don't think there's any questions on this one. Thank you. Councillor Newman has moved. Who would like to second? Deputy Chair, Councillor Dalton. Anyone would like to speak to this one? Right, all those in favour? Aye. Aye. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Item 12, we have Joe Hart with John in the background. This is a similar. Thank you for patiently waiting for us. Um, jo? Um, yeah, good afternoon, Chair. Good afternoon, councillors and IM, IMSB members. Um, I'm happy to take it. the report as read, but I can give a short explanation if required. I think we can take it as read. Yeah. Councillor Newman, Councillor Morrison. Oh, so now I've done what the Mayor's done. Um, <laughs> Councillor Williamson, apologies. <laughs> um, and there are no, no one to speak, no questions? Cool, thank you, Joe. Sorry that you had to wait all the time for that, but we appreciate your work. Thank you. Um, it's been interesting listening in the rest of the conversation. <laughs> I bet it so, has been. <laughs> <laughs> Most of it. <laughs> yeah. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, all those in favour? Any opposed? No, thank you. Right, item 13. Cool. Um, did, um, oh. uh, Councillor Newman again. Yeah, Councillor Baker to second. Um, did you want to, I think this really, this is a really important one. I'd like to just, uh, I'd like you to go through um, the right. presentation or just a high level. Okay, great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mark, Mark Dendale from Plans and Places. So um, this report relates to um, making provisions operative for um, Crater Hill, Nakapua Kauora, and Pukaki Peninsula in Mangere. So those of you that know where it is, um, it's uh, right just northeast of the airport, Papatoitoi to the uh, east and Mangari residential to the north. It comprises essentially of Crater Hill, which is on the right-hand side of that, um, red, those red circles, and Pukaki Peninsula on the left. Oops, sorry. Looking a little bit closer, um, so we have uh, two bits of land here, Pukaki on the left. Uh, the council, in its proposed plan, um, proposed to rezone uh, open space conservation for the Pukaki Crater, which is uh, located over there, and um, rural production uh, along the remainder of Pukaki Peninsula with a, an outstanding natural feature over the uh, majority of the crater. And then moving on to the crater, to, um, to Crater Hill on the eastern side. Wait, look. So there's Crater Hill, also a rural production zone with the Crater Lake being a conservation, uh, open space conservation zone. So the, um, the appellants were looking to move the rub, which is this broken black line over here, uh, around, around, ah, come on, there we go. This broken black line, they wanted to shift the rural urban boundary to the coast and replace um, largely the rural production zone with a future urban zone. And then on the, um, on the Crater Hill side, 
they were, uh, the, app the appellants were seeking to move the rub, which is that broken black line there, and running along the southwestern motorway and then back to the coast. They were seeking to move that line to the coast as well, and then introduce some residential zones along the flanks of the volcano here, some residential zone. So that's what we went to the courts with. And um, there were numerous hearings. We had two environment court hearings and two high court hearings. Uh, the outcome of the legal process is that, um, well, the court decided in favor of the, um, in favor of the council. So the rug will remain where it is and the rural zones will remain as they are. Uh, and the precinct provisions, which were introduced as part of the proposed plan, uh, and which provide safeguards for development occurring on, these, on this land, are, 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 um, are safe, if you like. So effectively, the precinct will ensure that special qualities um, of the area are safeguarded, the cultural, spiritual, and values and relationship of uh, Te Akitai Waihua, who are Manafinua for this area, are also retained. And of course, importantly, the high quality soils are protected as well as the archaeological, geological, landscape and ecological values. I have a few very nice pictures which I'll run through very quickly. Um, and uh, there we go. So that's a picture of Crater Hill looking eastwards um, with Papa Toy Toy in the background. And you can see it's a large extent of land, 113 hectares, primarily pasture with a little bit of uh, oh, sorry. Can I? Can you just? Sorry about that. Thank you. So primarily pasture, um, and about 113 extent, uh, hectares in extent, turning 180 degrees, um, and you look at Pukaki Peninsula which is just over 100 hectares of um, rural production land. And um, with the Pukaki Crater, the outstanding natural feature on that side, um, the airport is just out of picture to the left, and the uh, Pukaki Marae here on the coastal edge with Maori purpose, special purpose zone uh, extending over here. So just going to the other side, so it's Pukaki Crater here, and uh, Pukaki Peninsula here, airport just to the left, uh, and Mangria in the distance there. So that's another picture looking northwards of Pukaki Peninsula. So effectively, um, the council um, got what it wanted, uh, what it was after. A significant amount of work went into this um, by the council. In, firstly, we put together the Puinui structure plan, which was largely a large piece of work looking at every aspect of this area. Um, Te Akita Waihua produced a cultural heritage assessment along with cultural landscape maps, which were, int which were introduced into the plan and are, are part of the, um, the, the unitary plan at the moment. And so the council concluded when it issued its decision that this area should remain outside the rural urban boundary the courts, after this long legal process, um, uh, was in favour, and essentially they felt that the council provisions for Crater Hill addressed and protected the values relating to outstanding natural features, uh, addressed the soils with high productive potential, archaeology and cultural matters, and also for Pukaki Peninsula, it, these provisions address the potential significant adverse effects of and risks associated with urban development, they protected the soils with high productive potential and cultural values. That's the end of my story. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mark. And just want to uh, acknowledge, I think this might have been the first uh, trip we did as a council when I first was elected to the governing body. Um, so that was just over six years ago. It's yeah. been a phenomenal amount of work from you all. Mm. Um, and it shows persistence on really important matters like this um, matters. So th thank you and all the team who worked on it. Uh, for, for a phenomenal result. Um, Member Ashby has a, a question. And just, I'm um, sorry, Councillor Newman, I forgot Councillor Filipina would like to move. Did you want to second or? Cool. Member Ashby. 
Thank you. Um, I just really want to commend the Council uh, for delivering this great outcome and the partnership approach with um, Te Akitoa and Waiahua. Um, I know a lot of effort and care and energy went into it, so I just think I don't actually have a question, I'm just being cheeky. Just, um, yeah, well done. So, kia ora. Kia ora. Councillor Baker went there as a many years ago on a school trip. Um, you didn't have your mic on. Councillor Darby. Well, at least Councillor Baker's uh, war story was very short. It was, it was good. Exactly. It was um, look, I just also do want to commend our team, and a few of them are here. Um, they have been successful uh, based on some really good evidence, but the partnership that... Um, uh, Edward, um, Member Ashby refers to, has been critical in this as well. Um, I do recall that field trip we went on there, but also recall growing up in the South Auckland and not knowing this place. And I, I used to cycle past this as a kid. I explored all that estuary because you couldn't see into it. And the day I went to see, had the field trip, I was absolutely stunned by that landscape, like blown away and thought, wow, how can anybody have the idea that it can be anything different than be improved in, in, its, in its naturalness? So um, I, I just want to reiterate the importance of um, the work that our staff have done uh, with mana whenua and others, but it's principally, it's our team, mana whenua and our experts have been successful here and this is a tremendous legacy. So I really do mean to please take this back to the various people um, that have worked on this. This is a terrific outcome, absolutely terrific outcome. Kia ora, thank you, Councillor. Right, all those in favour? Aye. Anyone opposed? Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mr Chair. Now, we cannot lose anyone else, otherwise we'll lose a quorum, so we can... Uh, we will go through these as quickly as... Yeah. So we have uh, item 15, priority submissions for the Auckland Council Group. Adam. Councillor Watson will move. Councillor Williamson will... <laughs> Williamson. We, we will just have you briefly um, speak to it at, at, and take... Thank you, Adam. Kia ora. Um, sorry, yeah, so Adam Morris, um, Strategic Advice Unit, and you've already met Denise, obviously. Um, so I'll just make some very brief points just to reiterate and emphasise some of the points that we've made in the report. Um, so our report is to seek approval from this committee for submissions on priority government pro proposals during the first half of this year, 2023. We're also recommending to delegate approval for staff to prepare Oh, sorry. Oh. Um, to prepare submissions to unexpected consultations due to changing government priorities um, to the chair and deputy chair uh, of this committee. Um, important, importantly, the rationale for this work has been that central government's significant reform programme has meant that there's a lot of submissions which require substantial resource from Auckland Council Group to respond to and need to be managed and prioritised. So staff have developed a process for assessing and prioritising submissions, and that's what we've done for the for submissions coming through the first half of this year, and that's what we've brought to you today through this report. Um, so, Garrett, thank you. Thank you very much, Adam. Are there any questions on this? No? Well, thank you very much. And, uh, yeah, just keep in mind, uh, members, that this is an uh, important piece of work because of the huge amount of pressure the teams are under to respond, but also the budget pressures that you're all under. So this is going to help triage some of the work that we are forced to respond to, and we cannot respond to everything. Um, so thanks for making that clear. Um, in favour? Aye. Any opposed? No? Thank you. Thank you both. Item 16, I had two, the two councillors who put themselves forward for this um, working group were Councillor Baker and Councillor Ferry. There were no other interested parties um, who put themselves forward.
and we'll just have a, a brief presentation. Thank you. Stuff. I feel bad that you've been waiting there so long patiently, but um, they've been working. Don't worry. Um, cool. It's all good, Mr. Chair. Okay, cool. Yeah, I think we've. Uh, unless anyone wants the presentation, I think it's clear what the the, the process is. And thank you very much for your work. <laughs> thank you. Um, so I'll move. Any seconders? Second. Second, Councillor Watson. Any debate? All those in favour? Thank you. Thank you. I should have put the first item at this end of the day. It would have been really, <laughs> really simple. Um, 17, uh, Rachel Kelleher asked if she needed to present this, and I said no. So the two members um, that have put them... Oh, Rachel's here. <laughs> oh, sorry, Rachel. Um, uh, Rachel is amazingly still awake after all she's been doing. Um, the, there's no question, if there's any questions for Rachel, she's here, but um, the two members that have put themselves forward were Councillor Turner and Councillor Henderson. Um, I know there was some questions from IMSB, Member Ashby. Did you have a question for me or for Rachel? Um, it's probably for you, Chair. Um, yeah. It has been in the past protocol for the, for the Western um, uh, members to take those positions, so that's no issue. Um, a question is, and, and I think I know the answer given my other hat that I wear, but um, is uh, I note the uh, role of Te Kaurau Maki in supporting uh, in the long term this, this kaupapa, but not having an actual governance seat uh, in the mix. So I guess it's a question of um, uh, whether there's room to uh, expand the arrangement to include it. Um, uh, a representative um, from from the local EV. Cool. Um, Rachel, do you have maybe a question of what where to from here on, Max? I think it's a good point. Thank you. Through the chair, it is a very good point. Um, and the current partnership agreement provides for two representatives uh, from the governing body on the governance group. Um, and, but that agreement is up for review next year. Uh, so there is the opportunity, I think, next year to review how that governance arrangement looks if we in fact indeed agree that it's appropriate to still have elected members sitting on, on that community project um, in that capacity. But I guess it, it is up to the governance group as to how they want to appoint those two members. Yeah, I think it's a it's a good point because I know that the Ark in the Park works in close partnership with Takoa Amaki, but whether it's more appropriate for them to be on the governance group because it only mentions governing body members at the moment. So I guess going forward with the review, that could be... If you were able to give that feedback back to them in the first place, is that right? Yeah, through the chair, I don't think it, it requires any... Any changes to the resolution? It's probably just an operational um, conversation to, um, at the timing of the review. But, uh, cool. Thank you. Thank you, Member Absolutely, Ashby. and happy to pick that up. Happy to pick that up. Thank you, Rachel. And Councillor Fletcher would like to move. Who would like to second? Councillor Darby. All those in favour? Aye. Anyone opposed? No. Perfect. Thank you. Um, we move now to the establishment of the open. Space Board and Recreation Joint Political Working Group. Where am I? Kia ora. Thank you. Kia ora. Good afternoon. I'm a senior policy advisor in the community investment team. I'm joined by Carol Conner, our senior policy manager in the community investment team. Uh, today we're seeking the appointment of two governing body reps for the Open Space, Sport and Recreation Joint Political Working Group and uh, approval of the working group's draft terms of reference. Um, in the interest of time, I'll take the report as read. Thank you, Aubrey and Carol. I've had interest from both... Um, Councillor Dalton and Councillor Fletcher, 
no others have put themselves forward um, to me. So, if there are any other questions, um, put those two members forward, Councillor Watson and Councillor Baker, moved and second. Councillor, is it just for, it's it's a uh, for two members only? Councillor Philippine is also interested, but is it? I can't remember what the situation says. Yes, Mr. Chair, it's two councillors. Two councillors, um, Councillor Philippine, could there be an alternate if one of the members cannot make it, or is it? It would be preferable if all members could be there. There's about seven uh, workshops planned over um, a two-year period. So if we could have consistency, that would be preferable. However, uh, we're happy to turn to entertain whatever arrangement you think would cool. be fit. Councillor Dalton has said that Councillor Filipina could take her spot if you if that's a if you're happy to do that, Councillor Filipina. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Dalton. That's just over the last few weeks, uh, like everybody else, being busy, I couldn't get back to uh, respond to your email, Chair. No worries, but you're happy to be um, the other member on that? Yeah, if uh, Councillor Dalton's okay with that. Yep, no, that's perfect. We'll call. Thank you, and Hilda. thank you, and Councillor Fletcher for putting yourselves forward. Thank you. Right. All those in favour? Aye. Thank you, and thank you for your work on the paper. The forward work program, I'll move. Through Council the chair, just second. thank you. Just really quickly, um, we know, so the idea is the all the forward work programs of the committee are going to go up through governing body uh, at the end of the month. So hence we're bringing it to you. We do know, however, that as we move through that scope of work that you, that you discussed in the first item today, this work program is going to have to move and change. So it's as it is at this point in time. Uh, but we'll continue to work with you um, and evolve that through. So hopefully that's all right. Thanks. Uh, Councillor Darby. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, just on this, uh, I've just got a few points here, actually. I've, I've reconciled the previous work program with this work program, and a few things have dropped off. But before I go to the things that I think should be included, just in terms of the helicopter options report coming, um, Megan, I did email you, and I know you've been pretty busy with flood response and everything else as well, but I am keen to see some serious um, options analysis that includes uh, constraining helicopter activity significantly to the point of prohibiting it in some locations that I mentioned to you, um, or making it a non-complying activity with some... Um, um, is it rules? Um, I won't go into that detail. I am keen to see that come forward. I, I don't want to find us in a position where we're, um, you know, just considering a lot of interesting information. Um, the coastal hazard plan change, um, that's in July, August. Um, is that going to, is that going to be informed by the body of work? Yeah, that, in fact, we had that confirmed earlier. So the other matters for me that are missing, uh, we've expressed, the previous council every, unanimously expressed a lot of concern uh, about the quality of urban design that is showing up in our housing stock. It, I can't see it there on the Ford Work Program, and John Duguid has started that work. How are we going to continue that? Now, if I'm wrong in that regard, Megan, let me know, but I can't see it there at the moment. Housing affordability, we've just taken our three-year um, Auckland plan update. It highlights housing affordability. It was on the previous work program. It's a body of work that um, Councillor Josephine Bartley was leading. It's not evident there. I think it needs to be there. There is some work that came to us um, via... Koi 2, the Centre for Informed Futures on Reimagining re -imagining Tāmaki, um, Harnessing the Reasons Potential. It fits the remit of this committee. I understand the next stage of that is, is being progressed, and it might be 
progressed with Tataki, but Chair, it's work that actually belongs to the remit of this committee, and I'd like to find out where that resides. Is it this committee or another committee? I would suggest with you, Chair and Deputy Chair. Um, there was also, the on the work programme previously, the Crown Council Joint Work Programme on Housing and Urban Development. Um, that is a critical relationship, and, and it's one for the Chair and Deputy, along with Mayor and a Deputy Mayor. Um, that's not there. Now, where did we get to with enabling rainwater tanks? We did put over the first changes, but there was further work to do. With floods in mind and the need for detention and retention, um, we cannot lose sight of that. It's not evident on the work program. National policy statement on highly productive land, our response to that, um, I can't see that. We're actually bound by the direction of the government to respond. It's the work of this committee. Uh, private plan change requests, we need to see summaries of private plan change requests where the, the staff have delegated authority. Um, and lastly, two externals that we need to hear from before uh, this committee chair is the Ministry of Education, we've been trying for years, uh, and also Kainga Ora. Um, now, thank you for making the notes, Megan, as I'm <laughs> putting that out. But, uh, 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 Chair, yeah. I just feel like they're really important bodies of work, and I know we're going to have to put that all into the mix and then go, well, we can't do that and that, yep. uh, and this is our priority. But I'd just like that to go into, into the consideration mix so that we can then distill what's going to be really important for this committee. Thank you, Councillor. Um, we, yeah, the, we have had some kind of uh, delay in getting all all that inputted. Councillor Dolson and I met with um, Megan and Vanessa for about a three or four hour meeting, I think the week before the floods, um, and we were working quite intentionally on on this and it have all been diverted uh, from that. So we've we've essentially got what we got to in that meeting and, and there's clearly a lot more to be added. Uh, Megan, do you have a response of how we, how we incorporate? <laughs> Through the Chair, I'm happy if you'd like us to, uh, to put those in with a bit of an explanation. Um, a number of those are co either coming back, helicopters for example, coming back at the end of the month. Uh, and uh, yes, of course, it might require further work depending on the decisions you make. Uh, Council um, and Crown Joint Working Party, uh, I think that is important as well, but again, with the change of, of council and mayoralty, uh, there is a need to uh, reset that and, and decide whether government and council still think that's important. And, so um, there have been... Sorry, sorry. Oh, sorry. and ca Councillor uh, Watson, myself, the mayor and deputy mayor have started, well, before the floods, met once with uh, four, was it the four ministers at this stage, and that was is supposed to continue, so we'll see now that the... That was supposed to be bi-monthly, I think, Councillor Watson. I can't remember, but that was part of that work, Housing Transport Auckland, and I'm sure the Minister for Auckland, uh, he was at that first meeting, but that will he'll probably be leading that work with us um, from now. But. And I also think just a couple of them, like the urban design work, is probably folded under something a little larger. So uh, we know we need to do a little bit more work on it. So if you're okay, um, Chair, we'll, we will do that. Um, uh, and hopefully show that in terms of the in terms of the governing body um, a version for the end of the month, uh, and continue to work on it. And um, Councillor Darby, happy to talk talk any of that through with you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other questions? No comments. No. All those in favour? Aye. Anyone opposed? No. And then I'm down to. <gasps> the done. The summary of planning, environment, and parks committee information, oh, members and briefings. Okay. Member Ashby, Councillor Baker. Oh, Councillor Baker. Uh, any questions? No. All those in favour? Aye. Anyone opposed? No. Uh, that is all. Thank you very much for today. That was a mammoth effort. Uh, very good. <laughs> and have a good uh, travel safe home. Thank you. Thank you to all the staff. Thank you.
Theology.